dear esteemed members of society my dear friends and colleagues myself dr archana khare welcome you all for the cme of infertility infertility issues in india have seen a rampant rise due to lifestyle modification may it be due to late marriages obesity junk food culture smoking or alcoholism the percentage of couple facing infertility have risen infertility affect the concerned couple emotionally and psychologically and indirectly also affect the social well-being of entire family the wow committee states that infertility is also a major contributory factor responsible for rising cases of domestic violence against women in a nutshell infertility can be called a social problem which has made this a topic of immense importance for the modern obgy i feel it is not only our medical duty but also a social duty as a responsible and empathetic member of the society to understand and help and tackle the infertility issue thank you everyone for coming here to attend this cme over to you supriya thank you arshana uh, we are starting the session first and i want i would like to invite dr sheela patwardhan madam and dr pratibha baldava to chair this session dr sheela patwardhan madam she is a senior and renowned gynecologist in solapur she did her specialization in fertility treatment and art dr pratibha baldava she is a young dynamic obstetrician and gynecologist working at ss baldava neurosciences and women's care hospital she did her specialization in infertility laparoscopy she is a past honorary press secretary of sogs 2018 and 19 thank you over to you without further delay may i call the first speaker for today dr sunny shringar pre words fall short to describe him he is a consultant urologist and andrologist attached at apollo hospitals navi mumbai borivli thane and sholapur he is a visiting andrologist also to progenesis ivf and also attached to dy patil ivf center nerul he specialized in micro t cell for non obstructive azoospermia and his achievements are he is he was the first andrologist to do micro t cell navi mumbai he has many Uh, papers uh, publications to his credit and he has written two books let's talk about sex and let's talk about kidney failure over to you sanish sir yeah thank you everybody and good morning to all of my colleagues it has been pleasure and i thank solapur gynec society for calling me to my home ground so, so after 12th i left solapur and after that i have been settled in bombay so thanks solapur gynec society uh jamma madam for giving me the opportunity to express my views in my home ground so i am feeling uh, very proud and pleasure i have the pleasure to present in my home ground thank you so without further delay i'll start my presentation so uh this is a common case that we come across now this married couple he is a 35 year old software engineer by profession and his wife is a 30 year old teacher so they have been referred by the gynecologist to me and his semen analysis shows azoospermia so not only one report there have been previous reports also which shows azoospermia so these are the common questions which are being asked by the couple wala ha mic da these are the common questions which have been asked by the couple how come that i am producing the semen but there are no sperms in the semen how come it is possible so this is the first question which is asked by the couple by the uh, husband second thing he asked me is that how come there are no sperms but still i am able to perform sexual intercourse and still i am go having good erections is there any treatment for this condition is it recoverable and the last question that is asked is will we will my wife be able to ever get pregnant from this condition so will you be able to treat my condition so they come with lot of hopes 
they think this is just like any like any other condition and just i will give him medicines and then i will treat then the sperm count will improve so we have to this azoospermia is such a condition it is different from oligospermia it is different from asthenozoospermia and you have to counsel the patient a lot okay so as we see further so azoospermia as defined by who is the absence of sperms in the ejaculate and this is at least two samples should be checked at least uh, 15 days apart or at least one month apart then only and then only and this sample should be centrifuged now i will come to the point why we need to centrifuge the sample so there is another condition which is called as cryptozoospermia so cryptozoospermia is a condition where the sperm count is very very less it is a severe severe form of oligospermia like the sperm count is less than 1000 so it requires the trained pathologist a very skilled highly skilled pathologist to find that one sperm in the high power field so this condition is called cryptozoospermia so basically the pathologist has to uh, centrifuge at a high power field uh, at a very high rate and then he has to examine the pellet and then he has to see for the presence of sperms in the pellet and if that pellet does not show sperms after uh, uh, in two samples which are one month apart then and then only we label that patient as azoospermia so this azoospermia affects 1 to 3% of the general population and 15% of the infertile population of the infertile men but let me tell you azoospermia does not equate with the word sterility so it does not mean that azoospermic men cannot produce child of their own now with the recent trends in the technology with the introduction of the microscope micro tsa icsi this definition has changed totally so let us see further so what are the types of azoospermia so one is obstructive second is non obstructive so as you know the testes they produce the sperms which are carried by the vas deferens these vas deferens they join the ejaculatory duct uh, they are joined by the seminal vesicles they form the ejaculatory duct and they open in the prostate at the verum montanum obstruction anywhere in the passage be it at the level of ejaculatory duct be it at the level of prostate because of chronic prostatitis any stones any infection in the prostate be it at the level of vas deferens at the level of epididymis be it because of previous injuries infections tumors or because of previous vasectomy previous surgeries radiation anything or be it in the testes at the level of rated testes any infections so any level of obstruction can cause obstructive azoospermia so obstructive the reasons are it can be because of blockage by infections by tumors by stones by trauma because of previous surgery or it can be a congenital such as we see in cbavd that is congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens which is a congenital condition now as coming to non obstructive non obstructive means the testes which are the factory which produces the sperm is at fault either the sperm production is totally absent or the sperm production is deficient because of which the sperms are not able to come out so this can be because of previous uh, infection in the childhood like mumps or gatis it can be because of torsion testes it can be because of patient has a history of undescended testes because of which he was operated late and testes were in the abdomen because of which the sperm production became very less because of high exposure inside the abdomen as a result the uh, testes suffered the sperm production this can be because of exposure to chemotherapy radiation cancers any ill health in the body gonadotoxins drugs lot of drugs can cause Uh, effect on the testes because testes is a very sensitive organ it can get affected by any illness in the body it can get affected by any drugs uh, drugs presence in the body so these are the two types obstructive and non obstructive broad classes now as i told you azoospermia can be transient so last week last month i had a patient he had a history of covid illness 
in the uh, one month before january his sperm count was 15 million and this last month he had covid infection and this month his sperm count was zero azuspermia so this can be the scenario so such patients what you have to do is that you have to wait again one more month uh, give him vitamin c vitamin b whatever let him recover from the illness and again you repeat the semen analysis properly after one month if that also shows azuspermia then you have to evaluate but this is a common scenario so any patient of azuspermia in the history please ask any history of surgical illness in recently a surgical history also ask any history of medical illness be it a simple viral infection a simple viral infection in the body can decrease the sperm count so it can be fluctuating fluctuating it depends on the hormonal levels in the body so depends on the hormonal level the level of stress it can be fluctuating also and third is as i told you cryptozoospermia so cryptozoospermia is a condition of severe severe oligozoospermia where the sperm count is less than 1000 per million so you can understand less than 1000 per million so it is very difficult to find the sperms and requires the very trained eyes of a highly skilled pathologist who is expert in seeing the semen specimens and not a pathologist who is seeing the pathology uh, semen samples once in a year so we require a highly trained pathologist to see the sperms so examine multiple reports over the time and most important thing is the sample should be centrifuged at 15 uh, revolutions per minute and uh, the pellet should be examined so this is the most important thing so this patient has come to your opd so how will you evaluate the patient so uh, many gynecologists they don't know like oligospermia we can give coq enzyme this then but when the patient comes with azuspermia and andrologist is not available or you don't know where to refer so how will you evaluate the patient at your gynecological clinic so that is the reason for taking this lecture so first is the history examination and basic lab test so we divide this into three parts one is the history basic examination and the basic lab test so history as i told you you ask the patient history of any previous surgeries either in the childhood or any recent surgeries so childhood uh, history of surgery would be history for undescended testes so if the patient has history of orchidopexy done be it at birth or be it at one year of age or sometimes if it detected late it can be operated late also at 10 years of age 15 years of age so please ask the patient you ask the patient if the patient does not know you ask the parents of the patient whether the patient has been operated in the past also history of any bilateral inguinal hernia congenital hernia surgery because in inguinal hernia we take the incision in the groin and sometimes if the patient had congenital hernia in the past in the childhood there can be an accidentally damage to the vas deferens during the surgery by the surgeon so this is iatrogenic azuspermia please remember that also history of any appendicectomy any inguinal surgery in the adulthood there can be accidental damage to the vas deferens by electrocauterization by tying up anything history of infections so most important is history of mumps or cutis in the childhood history of viral infections it can be a recent infection it can be a history of viral infection in the past so any infection causing epididymum orchitis can affect the sperm count past history of chemotherapy and irradiation any history of exposure to gonadotoxins any history of exposure to any other drugs then as i told you history of bilateral inguinal surgery so these are the uh, parameters these are the questions that you should ask to the couple on examination and also one more important thing uh, like you should ask how the patient has collected the sample so patient because i had a patient he had come to me from west bengal and he had come with a report of azuspermia so i did not believe the west bengal report so i told him you give a five days gap you give a sample here in bombay and then you show me you will not believe and i told him properly how he has to collect the sample many of this patient there is a spillage of the semen when they collect in the container because the container is a wide mouth container and they don't properly place the penis inside as a result there is spillage of the semen so you will not believe he repeated in bombay and his semen came count was less but it came to 5 million so that was the difference so 
any time in case of azoospermia, please repeat the semen sample from a good laboratory where you know the pathologist personally. On examination, you should see the general health of the patient. You should see the distribution of hair. You should see the body proportion. Now, why these things are important? These things are important in cases of genetic diseases, like in cases of Klinefelter syndrome, cases of Turner syndrome. Because if there is a cases of congenital hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, then there would be absence of hair in the body and uh, there would be a lot of abdominal uh, fat will be there, the fat distribution will be abnormal, there will be absence of uh, scrotal hair, pubic hair, axillary hair, facial hair would be absent. So these are the significant findings in case of congenital hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. So that is the reason general examination is very important in these patients. Then also you should see the voice of patient. Voice of patient is also very important in cases of congenital hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism because their voice won't be of a male quality. It will be like a female quality. On examination, you see and palpate the testicles. So in testicles, you should see for the size of the testis. Now, to exact size of the testis, we have this what is called as Prader's orchidometer. Now, this Prader's orchidometer is a set of uh, balls and these balls like they are from small size to large size from one size to 25 size and that is to uh, see how is the development of the testis especially like if I get patients from the pubertal age I get lot of boys parents coming with their boys in the pubertal age like 14 age 5, 15 age and they say that his testis is not growing can you please see so that is the reason we use this Prada's orchidometer it's a very excellent device you can get it on Amazon or anywhere and this contains a series of eggs, like a ball. Previously, there were eggs, rounded eggs, but now you get these uh, beaded strings like that. You can compare the size of the testis with these balls. So as you see here, so from 1 to 25. So this is early puberty, this is mid puberty, this is late puberty, and this is adolescence. So a normal adult, the size should be 25. So 25 size, is approximately around 15 cc. So 15 cc should be the normal adult size. So if you get on sonography of the testes, the size is 7 cc, 8 cc. So that is a very small size testes. So that is the reason once you examine the testes, you will see the what is the size of the testes. You see the consistency of the testes. So a case of uh, uh, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism testes or a case of testicular failure, the testes would be very flabby and it will be very soft. Second thing, you palpate for the vas deference. You see how is the vas. So sometimes there can be congenital absence of bilateral vas deference in that you will not be able to palpate the vas. Second thing, in patients who had got a history of TB, genitourinary TB, there may be beaded appearance of the vas. So that is the reason you have to palpate for the vas. Then epididymis is most important because if the epididymis the structure of the epididymis, whether it is normal, whether it is bulky. So bulky epididymis indicates it's a case of obstructive azoospermia. And last and most important thing that normal surgeons don't do is a per rectal examination. So per rectal examination, why it is important is I had a case, this patient, he came with a history of unejaculation. Now unejaculation means even on masturbation, even after sex, he just produced one drop of semen. So I did his all lab tests, all lab tests were normal. I did his semen test, of course he cannot produce the semen. Then I just a simple per rectal examination. On per rectal examination, I found that the seminal vesicles were very bulky. And this patient, later on I did a transrectal sonography. On transrectal sonography, you will not believe there was a huge prosthetic cyst, a congenital prosthetic cyst, which was blocking the opening of the ejaculatory duct, that is the reason the both the seminal vesicles on either side, they were very bulky and dilated. The size was approximately 2.5 to 3 centimeter across and they were containing fluid. So with the help of radiologists, we did a transrectal sonography and aspirated that fluid. There were a lot of moving sperms in that. So as the urologist, what I did, I just did a transrectal resection of the ejaculatory duct. So that cyst, I just did a deroofing and this patient conceived naturally. So you can see 
this simple step has solved all the problems of the patient. So that is why reason per rectal examination is very important in such a case. Now, if we see these various uh, causes of azuspermia and uh, why the examination is very important. So in a case of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, if you see for the testis and the epididymis, so testis size might be variable. It might be soft and flabby. The epididymis might be collapsed. In case of obstructive azuspermia, the testicular size might be normal, but epididymis, it might be bulky. Then testicular failure, the testis might be small and soft and epididymis might be collapsed. So based on just general examination and physical examination of the testis and the epididymis, you can differentiate what is the cause of the obstructive of the azuspermia, whether it's obstructive, non-obstructive, whether it's a hypogonadotrophic, hypogonadism. So it depends on the examination itself, you can come to a diagnosis. Now, these are the basic lab tests which you can do it at your center, no need to send to an IVF center. So which are the basic lab tests? One is the fructose content in the semen, then FSH, LH, testosterone, and genetic test, of course, that is a high-end test. So we'll come to each of the test. Now fructose in the semen. Now normally it has been taught, presence of fructose in the semen indicates, and patient has got azuspermia, indicates that it's a obstructive, it's a uh, non-obstructive azuspermia. While as absence of fructose in the semen, it indicates it's a obstructive azuspermia. This has what been taught in our books. But let me tell you, there can be variations. So how are the variations? So fructose negative semen, so there can be blockage here at the ejaculatory duct. So ejaculatory duct obstruction can have a fructose negative semen. Also, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. So this totally vas deferens are absent till here. Even the seminal vesicles are absent. In these patients also the fructose can be totally absent. So such patients, how will you differentiate? Then you have to do genetic tests. Then you have to do a transrectal sonography and then find out. Now, if the fructose is positive semen, and these patients can still have azuspermia. So uh, what are the variations? So primary testicular failure, if it is there, there can be fructose in the semen and that can patient can have azuspermia. Second is, if there is obstructive azuspermia, but the blockage is not here, the blockage is at the level of epididymis or the vas deferens, these patients can have a fructose positive semen and still they can have azuspermia. So you should keep in mind, it is not generally like fructose positive means uh, non-obstructive and fructose negative means obstructive, not like that. You have to keep these variations in the mind. Second is FSH. So we have been taught that a normal FSH, because FSH is a hormone which is secreted by pituitary gland and it is required for spermatogenesis. So a normal FSH means normal spermatogenesis. But let me tell you, that a normal FSH can be present even if there is a testicular failure and it can be present even if the, both the testes have failed. And also we have been taught that elevated FSH is present only in cases of testicular failure. It is not like that. So a testicular failure can have a normal FSH and many men with primary testicular failure, they have got a normal FSH. So a normal FSH is not conclusive. That's what I want to tell you. And also we have been taught that elevated FSH is present in cases of primary testicular failure. But as we see ahead, even in testicular failure, many, there are many focal areas of spermatogenesis which we can harvest by doing a microscopic testicular sperm extraction. Testosterone. So testosterone, uh, we collect an early morning sample, a normal total testosterone is enough. So normal value of total testosterone is from 300 nanogram per deciliter to 800, 900 nanogram per deciliter. Anything below this 300 is called uh, like testosterone is deficient. And genetic test, in genetic test we do a total karyotyping to see whether there are any variations like Klinefelter syndrome or uh, we do a Y chromosome deletion test. Now the significance of this Y chromosome deletion which most of the IVF centers don't do. I have, I will uh, speak upon it later. But this Y chromosome deletion test is very important if you are planning to do a microscopic testicular sperm extraction. The normal karyotyping test we do, 46XX, XY, this test that we do, these are important to rule out these conditions like Klinefelter syndrome, which is 47XXY. Then there is another syndrome called 46XX syndrome. 
Then there is Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome is abnormal motility of the sperms. Then congenital bilateral absence of valve deference for which we test for the CFTR gene mutation. So these are the genetic tests that are required. Now I will focus on the Y chromosome. So this is the structure of the Y chromosome. It has got a short arm, there is a centromere and this is the long arm or the Q arm. So this Q arm contains this azospermia factor or the azospermia region. In this azospermia region, there are three areas again, A, B and C. So this is the structure of the Y chromosome. Now, Y chromosome is the chromosome which determines the maleness factor and any deletion on the Y chromosome of this azospermia factor region can cause azospermia. So, as seen here, there can be deletion of this AZFA, there can be deletion of this AZFB or there can be deletion of this AZFC or it can be any of the permutation combination. Okay? So, if there is deletion of this AZFC region only, then these patients present with oligoazospermia and if you do a biopsy, there will be hypospermatogenesis. And this hypospermatogenesis, even if patients we have got AZFC deletion, if we do a micro TSA, microscopic testicular sperm extraction in this patient, in 50 to 70 percent of this patient, we can extract sperms for using for ICSI. Now, if suppose there is a AZFB deletion, these patients generally have what is called as a Sertoli cell only syndrome or a germ cell arrest. And in this patient, if you see here, the chances of recovering the sperm, they become very less. So in a case of AZFB deletion, chances of recovering sperms are hardly any 5 to 10 percent. If there is AZFA deletion, no chances to recover sperm. So you see why this Y chromosome deletion test is important before ICSI, because we come to know where, which cases you will be able to recover the sperm. And if there is no Y chromosome micro deletion, indicate that there is no genetic deformity, no genetic uh, abnormality and the chances of recovering sperm or by micro TSA, the chances go to around 80 to 90 percent. So that is the reason we do this Y chromosome micro deletion test. Slightly it is a costly test, it costs around 7000 rupees. It is done only in two laboratories, one is SRL and Metropolis because it is a speci special genetic test and the report takes 7 days to come. It is a simple blood test and the report takes 7 days to come, but it is a very good test. The other tests which are required is a transrectal sonography or called as TRUS and second is a diagnostic testicular biopsy. Now this is the patient that I told you. This patient we have done a transrectal sonography. This was the patient of unejaculation that I told you. So this is the prostatic cyst. This is the prostate and this is the prosthetic cyst which is sitting here and these are the dilated seminal vesicles. So this prosthetic cyst was causing ejaculatory duct obstruction and that is the reason the seminal vesicles were dilated which I felt on the rectal examination. So what I did for this patient is that by doing uh, cystoscopy I just enucleated, I just deroofing of the cyst so the blockage became clear and the semen started flowing out and this patient conceived naturally. So that is the reason if you are suspecting that there is ejaculatory duct obstruction, you have to do this transrectal sonography. Now what is the role of diagnostic testicular biopsy? Diagnostic testicular biopsy, I will tell you, it has got a role, why? But it should be done by the IVF specialist or the andrologist in an IVF lab only and it should be done where an embryologist is present. Now why this? Because if there is a case of non-obstructive azospermia, that might be the only sperm which is present which you are removing from the testicular biopsy. So if you just do a diagnostic and you send for a routine histopathology and that might be the only sperm, you are losing that sperm. So that is the reason diagnostic testicular biopsy, it is done under local anesthesia or a cord block. It should be done in an IVF lab and it should be done with the presence of an embryologist so that if you find a sperm, you can cryo-freeze that sperm and you can use it later on when your ovum pickup is there for the ICSI. So that is the role for a diagnostic testicular biopsy. Also in diagnostic testicular biopsy, uh, if you do not find a sperm, then you send for a routine histopath and you will able to know whether there is a Sertoli cell syndrome 
whether there is maturation arrest, whether there is atrophy of the testes. So, all this histopathology you can come to know on doing a diagnostic testicular biopsy. So, that is the role of a diagnostic testicular biopsy. Now, obstructive azospermia is potentially treatable. Be it obstruction anywhere, it is potentially treatable and 100 percent recovery of sperms. So, how? So, if there is blockage at the vas, we can do a surgery, microsurgery and we can do a vaso vasostomy or we can anastomose the epididymis to the vas, we can do a vaso epididymostomy. Of course, these are done by andrologists like me only, like because it requires a microscope. Uh, so, that is the reason and the training also you require. Second, as I told you, so this is the transurethral resection of ejaculatory duct or turate that I did on that patient. So, this is the picture from internet only, not mine. So, we put in a scope, there is a cyst over here and we deroof the cyst. So, if you see the improvement in cement parameters, in complete obstruction after the surgery 59 percent they recovered the sperms, in partial obstruction 94 percent there was recovery of sperms in the semen. So, you can see in case of ejaculated duct obstruction, this technique is very useful. And of course, uh, if you if the patient does not want surgery or any of these high-fi surgeries, then you can directly tell the patient, then we can do a sperm extraction. So, either you can extract sperms from the epididymis by doing a percutaneous uh, epididymal sperm aspiration using a tuberculin syringe or you can recover sperms from the testis under local anesthesia, this is called testicular sperm aspiration. So, either you do the surgery or simple you extract the sperms, give it for ICSI, that is all. So, or there is another technique where the epididymis is not that full, you can do put in a microscope and you can extract the sperms from the tubules of the epididymis, this is called MESA. MESA is microscopical, microsurgical extraction of sperm from the epididymis. So, the key message in cases of obstructive azospermia is that sperms are obtained in 100 percent all the cases, sperms are virtually obtained in all the cases, sperm extraction is independent of the source of obstruction, be the source of obstruction at the level of ejaculatory duct, be the source of obstruction at the level of vas, at the level of epidermis or be at the level of rated testis, you can extract sperm 100 percent in these cases. And if the gynecologist or the IVF specialist knows to do a TISA PISA, he can himself do the TISA PISA, he can record the sperm, no need to call urologist or endologist or a surgeon. Then it is independent of the etiology of obstruction, be it an infection which is causing the obstruction, be it a, a trauma, be it a surgery which is causing the obstruction, no problem, you can retrieve the sperm. Then it is the results are better than the ejaculated sperm in these cases. So, obstructive azospermia, nothing to worry, you tell the patient, we can remove the sperms from anywhere and 100 percent chances of ICSI depends on your uh, uh, quality of the eggs. Now, we go to the next, which is the most difficult one, that is non-obstructive azospermia. So, non-obstructive azospermia, the factory is at fault. So, the testes which are producing the sperm, they are at fault. So, in these cases, either the hormones are at fault or the testes they are they are at fault because of some cause. As a result, the testes they are very small and flabby, the FSH is normally elevated <coughs> and these patients are labeled as sterile. Now, please remember the testis has around 600 to 800 seminiferous tubules. Each seminiferous tubules produces millions of sperms. So, even if we are able to find one focus of seminiferous tubule which is producing the sperm and we can retrieve focus, we can retrieve sperms from that single focus of seminiferous tubules. So, how many sperms you can retrieve by doing a microsurgical testicular sperm extraction? So, the definition of a non obstructive azospermia patient being unsterile or not able to produce a child has changed with this advent of microsurgical testicular sperm extraction. So, many of them ask me a question, is there a role for PISA or micro surgical epidermal sperm aspiration in case of non obstructive azospermia? No, there is no role. Why? Because the testis is at fault and epidermis starts from here. So, if the testis is at fault and testis are producing less number of sperms, how can you retrieve sperms from the epidermis? So, there is no role for MISA or PISA in cases of non obstructive azospermia. So, these are the questions that we have to answer today which is the best technique for sperm retrieval in case of non-obstructive azospermia. 
what is the timing of sperm retrieval with respect to the ovum pickup what is the pre treatment that you give to the patients to improve the sperm retrieval what are the pro prognostic factors in cases of this non obstructive azoospermia and which is the best clinical approach so these questions we are going to answer so sperm retrieval in non obstructive azoospermia can be divided broadly into two classes one is the percutaneous technique and open technique so percutaneous you can do a testicular sperm extraction or previously what they used to do is a fine needle aspiration biopsy so fine needle aspiration biopsy has been outdated it was previously used to be performed by the gynecologist they used to use a small 22 gauge needle they used to do multiple passes in the both the testes so that used to cause lot of trauma and damage to the testes and also the extraction should be the that extraction was from the superficial layers of the testes which would not yield us bombs and this is technique is totally outdated what we do now is a needle aspiration biopsy or a needle testicular sperm extraction also called needle tesse in open techniques was the conventional techniques which was to previously done by the surgeons they used to open the testes and they used to remove a chunk of tissue from the testes so it was just like doing an orchidectomy you used to remove chunk of tissue from both the testes and give it for biopsy wherever sperms are found not found that is okay second is the recent technique which has called is called a micro dissection testicular sperm extraction which i am going to speak <coughs> so this so this is a video where i am demonstrating the testicular needle aspiration biopsy so for this i use a normally a 20 gauge needle scalp pin this is attached by a feeding tube this is attached to a 10 ml syringe i do multiple passes these multiple passes are done from the lateral aspect and the post posterior aspect of the testes don't go medially because medially the blood vessels of the testes don't go superiorly because superiorly there is the spermatic cord you can harm the blood vessels so this is done under a local anesthesia so you can see what a chunk of tissue i have removed okay these are the micro forceps that i used okay so with the help of two micro forceps you remove this chunk of tissue after finishing that you see for any other tissue which is still there stuck to the is stuck inside this scalp vein you again remove that tissue because let me tell you any simple any bit of tissue is very important in case of non obstructive azoospermia because the sperm production is very deficient so single tissue can give you lot of sperms okay so here i have removed the tissue which was stuck here so the tissue will come like a strand you keep on pulling 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 the tissue will come so you keep your media ready and immediately you give it to the embryologist who will tease the tissue and see for the presence of the sperms see any bit of tissue i am removing so this is all the tissue later on what you do is that you remove the clamp you remove this clamp and then you again flush the remaining solution which is there in your syringe so that any other remaining tube which is there seminiferous tubule which was there aspirated that will also come out so your main thing is that you have to give maximum tissue to the embryologist we don't know whether it contains sperm or not but we are doing a blind biopsy so we do normally we take three biopsies from right three biopsies from the left so this is the needle aspiration testicular sperm extraction so as i told you this is a normal case of obstructive azoospermia it is filled with sperms you put needle anywhere you will get sperms this is a case of primary testicular failure where anywhere you put a needle you will not get a sperms but now this definition has changed why this definition has changed is that they have found even in a patient of primary testicular failure there are some focal areas where spermatogenesis is still present and these areas you can locate with the help of a microscope high magnification microscope that is called micro dissection testicular sperm extraction and you can extract the sperms so normally this is the high definition microscope that we use in apollo hospital and this microscope is very costly it costs 20 20 to 25 lakhs and here you can see this microscope is electronically operated so this has got two viewing a one is for the operating surgeon second is for the assistant and there is also a tv which is attached so other people in the operation theater they can also see what is going inside 
So, this microscope is not portable, you cannot shift it anywhere outside the operation theatre. It is normally used in corporate hospitals. So, cost of this microscope is 25 lakhs. The normal IVF center would not be able to afford this microscope because this microscope is basically used in corporates for ENT surgery, neurosurgery, ophthalmic surgery, plastic microsurgery. And last is if there is a IVF center in that hospital, like in Apollo, we have got the IVF center. So, that is the reason we use this microscope as a because it is there, that is the reason we use this microscope. So, that is the and also high maintenance cost because so it is an electronic thing, high maintenance cost is required. So, that is the reason what I do is that any option is there. So, what I do is that I have used this cheaper option. So, I use this 6 x magnifying loops. Now, this 6 x magnifying loops they are a cheaper option than the microscope not that cheap they cost around me 1.5 lakhs. So, this is the cheaper option no maintenance is required learning curve is very less and you it is easily transportable I just carry them in my bag I take it anywhere. So, I go around all the IVF centers in Mumbai in Navi Mumbai where there is a micro TSA required and with this loops I extract the sperms. So, the IVF center does not has to invest in the microscope and does not has to collect patients for the micro TSA. So, normally what is the procedure is that we open the testis into two we see for the seminiferous tubules under the microscopic uh, magnification and our aim is to extract the seminiferous tubules which are full. Can you see the difference between this seminiferous tubule and this seminiferous tubule? So, these seminiferous tubules are very atrophic they are not containing sperms where this seminiferous tubule is full. So, this is what which is highlighted here. So, this seminiferous tubule is containing the sperm. So, this seminiferous tubule we extract by using micro instruments and we give it to the embryologist then she does the teasing part and then she sees for the presence of the sperms. So, I'll, so this is so if you see this test is so these are this fuller seminiferous tubules these are containing the sperms where there are this atrophic seminiferous tubules they are not containing the sperm. So, this fuller seminiferous tubules which are dilated likely to contain the sperms this is what we target using the microscope and we see it under high power magnification and these are the tubules that we extract and give it to the embryologist for look for the sperms. I will show uh, demonstrate. Uh, so, this is a micro TSA normally this uh, patient uh, we do it under saddle block saddle block is only that part anesthesia H234. So, patient goes in the home in the evening. So, here I have taken a vertical cut on one testis I am opening the skin ok we expose the testis we cut the tunica we bring the testis out just it is unlike the testicular sperm extraction or biopsy where we do it under local anesthesia this cannot be done under local anesthesia. So, here I am exposing the testis I am cutting the tunica layers of the testis. So, the testis is entirely in my hand. And also the cautery you keep is a bipolar cautery no need of monopolar cautery because monopolar cautery can cause fumes which are not uh, supposed to be there in the IVF setting. So, that is why reason I use a bipolar cautery. So, here that entire testis is in my hand now what I will be doing is that I will be bivalving the testis. So, I will be creating a midline incision in the testis and I will be opening like a book. So, I will show you here. So, in the microscope I am able to see the subtunical vessels. So, avoiding the subtunical vessels I make a cut in the tunica and I open the testis from one pole of the testis to another see from here to there horizontal incision on the tunica of the testis. So, can you see this minor blood vessels are there these are the subtunical vessels I will be avoiding those. So, I am taking a transverse incision on the testis minor bleeding will be there because that is the subtunical vessels will be there you cannot avoid those. So, these you control with the help of a bipolar cautery.
So we are taking a transverse incision like this. The assistant keeps putting saline through this uh, syringe so that the blood gets washed out. And we use a bipolar cautery to cauterize these minor blood vessels. Excess use of cautery should be avoided and only the mostly the bleeding point they are only cauterized. Okay, so I have taken the transverse incision from this end to that end. Now I am applying mosquitoes on each side. So each layer I am applying the mosquitoes. So this mi minor bleeding point you cauterize. Now I will be opening the testis like a book. So I am bivalving the testis. So you can see I am with my fingers I am just opening the testis like a book. Why we have to open the testis is because needle aspiration biopsy you only the needle will go into the superficial part of the testis while in this we are going to the deeper aspects of the testis and we are seeing for the seminiferous tubules in the middle of the testis inside the testis where there are likely to harbor the sperms. So this is how I do and then we extract the sperms this is the closure part I will show you the sperms later on. So now this is the closing part then we get in the microscope we search for the dilated seminiferous tubules we extract those and this procedure takes 45 minutes to 1 hour. So here you have to give instructions to the embryologist that she has to be there in the IVF lab for 45 minutes to 1 hour. Why you ask me because I will be removing this seminiferous tubules I will be giving to the embryologist she has to see under microscope sperms present not present again I will remove again I will give then sperms present not present again I will give. So this continues for period of 1 hour. So until I find sperms I will not stop. So until I find sperms from that testis I will keep on giving specimens and with the help of micro with the help of these micro instruments hardly the specimen is one tube. So you can see the difference between a conventional open biopsy where you remove a chunk of tissue and this micro tissue where you just remove one tubule. So here I am closing this tun uh, the tunica with the help of 5-0 proline and then we close the skin with the help of absorbable monocryl suture. Uh, patient waits for 4 hours after that and then patient goes home in the evening the same day. The skin suture they are absorbable we give him 5 days cover of antibiotics, painkillers, anti-inflammatory that is all. So this is the sperm can you see nice dancing sperm that we have extracted. This sperm we uh, aspirate for the ICSI. This is the sperm. Sorry for the picture quality. So, this is the sperm we have extracted. This is the sperms. This sperms we have extracted. And then we use it for. We use, use it for the ICSI. So, this is the sperm we have injected. So, that is for the ICSI. So, where should micro tissa? So, this is the micro tissa procedure. So, where should micro tissa be used? It should be used in those cases where the testis is small, it is very fibrotic, where you will not be able to do an uh, open uh, testicular sperm aspiration by using the needle. Second thing if the diagnostic biopsy has shown you that there is cases of hypospermatogenesis or Sertoli cell syndrome or if the patient has got Klinefelter syndrome these cases are the particular cases which are suitable for micro testicular sperm extraction and where if you do a biopsy you need a aspiration biopsy the seminiferous tubule just do not pop up and you, what you get is an atrophic seminiferous tubule or you get a gelatinous seminiferous tubule from the uh, testis these are the cases where micro TSA can give you uh, sperms for ICSI because there are only focal areas of spermatogenesis. 
Last five minutes, sir. Yeah. Now, timing of sperm retrieval with respect to ovum pickup. Now, some people, what they do is that they extract the sperm by testicular sperm extraction. They cryopreserve them and then they use it during the ovum pickup. And some people, they combine the ovum pickup with the testicular sperm extraction. Now, we are of the belief that we do the microtissa on the same day in case of non obstructive azeospermia. We don't cryopreserve them. Why? The reason is that the occasionally the sperms are very too few to freeze. Second thing, 20% of the sperms may not be recovered during thawing and in 20% repeat tissa, no sperms may be found. So that is the reason uh, we do micro tissa on the same day of ohm become. Now hormonal therapy prior to non obstructive to azuspermia. Now there are few papers like this is a paper by Hussein et al in BJ, British Journal of Urology where he has studied 612 men with non obstructive to azuspermia. Out of this 116 men, they underwent micro tissa without prior hormonal therapy and 496 men, they either received a combination of clomiphene citrate, clomiphene citrate with HCG or clomiphene citrate with HCG and HMG to increase the FSH to 1.5 times the normal and testosterone more than 600 to 800. And you can see 10.9 percent of the hormonal treated groups, they produce sperms in the ejaculate around an average 2.3 million. And micro tissa, the surgical rate, uh, sperm retrieval rate in hormonal treated patients was more than the untreated group. So it was 57% as compared to 33%. That shows hormonal treatment is very important before uh, sperm retrieval in case of non obstructive to azuspermia. This is another paper from Japan by Mr. Shirashi and he has uh, given HCG to these patients. Now what he done is that he has given HCG 5000 units thrice a week for these patients. And at the end of six weeks, uh, FSH was introduced because uh, an HCG was continued along with that and that time a second micro tissa was done and then they were able to recover the sperms. So here also those with therapy out of 28 patients, six, they were able to recover the sperms and those without therapy, no, they could not recover the sperms in anybody. So this is the table I have given for your information. We do four hormones, one is testosterone, estradiol, FSH and LH and testosterone. These are the four hormones that we do. So normally if the testosterone is normal or if it is higher normal, you don't give any hormonal therapy. If the testosterone is on the lower side, estradiol is on the higher side, normally we take a ratio of testosterone to estradiol, the ratio should be more than 10. If the ratio is less than 10, that means the estradiol proportion is higher, we give the patient a course of anastrozole or letrozole. If the testosterone is low, FSH is also low. LH is low. This is a typical case of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. In these patients, either we start then patient on clomiphene citrate, then we see whether the testosterone is increasing. If testosterone is not increasing after six weeks, you introduce an HCG injection, 5000 units, thrice a week. And again, you repeat the uh, FSH after uh, FSH and testosterone after six weeks. If still the testosterone is not increasing, then you add an HMG 150 units. Now, last case is when the testosterone is less and FSH and LH are more. This is the case of primary testicular failure. So, in this case, you give a course of HCG and HMG for six weeks and then only you do the sperm retrieval. So, which are the predictors for sperm retrieval? So, previously patient, uh, all the IVF specialists used to think that these are the predictors for sperm retrieval. No, these are not the predictors for sperm retrieval. Now, age, if you see, they say that after age of 40, the sperm count goes down that is true but still by micro tissue we can find the sperms if they are not retrieved by doing a testicular sperm extraction. Testicular volume no we can retrieve sperm by micro tissue even in a small fibrotic testis. FSH whatever the FSH level be it 32 be it 35 we can retrieve the sperm by doing micro tissue. Inhibin levels no whatever be the inhibin levels we can ret retrieve the sperms. Testosterone level, no. We can give a prior treatment with HCG, HMG, we can improve the testosterone, we can retrieve the sperms. So you can see all the beliefs have been shattered, all the beliefs have changed with the advent of micro -tissue. So these are the predictors of first sperm retrieval. So if there is an age head FC deletion, so Y chromosome testing is most important, genetic testing most important, diagnostic testicular biopsy most important. So if you see age head FC deletion, still we can retrieve sperm in 50 to 60 percent of this patient. If there is AZ FB deletion, which is a Sertoli cell syndrome, still 10 to 20 percent, you can tell the patient, there are 10 to 20 percent chances still there, I can retrieve the sperms. But that for that, the patient should be ready 
for that patient because it not only involves finance because patient has to pay for the micro TSA, he has to undergo the surgery and he, he has to be ready for that procedure. If there is an AIDS head FB deletion with atrophy, still 10% by micro TSA we can find a sperm. If there is maturation RS, still 40% we can retrieve the sperm by micro TSA. In Klein filters, 20 to 40% we can retrieve the sperm. So these are the predictors in new age for sperm retrieval. So these are some studies where they have compared testicular TSA, TSA and micro TSA. So highest sperm extraction was in micro TSA. Now these are some studies which are about needle and open biopsy. And this is the micro TSA versus TSA study. They, these are the various studies. The micro TSA sperm extraction is very highest, 53 percent as compared to a normal TSA. And this is the micro TSA versus single biopsy studies. So you can see whatever be the cause, be it a maturation error, the extraction is 64 percent using micro TSA. Be, if it is hypospermatogenesis, it is 93 percent as compared to 64 percent. If it is a Sertoli cell syndrome, it is 20 percent as compared to uh, the normal biopsy. And overall, if you see the, it is very high, 45 percent. So micro TSA is the technique of the age. And these are the sperm retrieval success rates in obstructive and non-obstructive. Of course, in obstructive, the sperm retrieval rates will be very high. You can retrieve the sperm. Sperms are good quality. Everything is good quality because everything is normal. Only it is obstruction. In non-obstructive, of course, the sperm retrieval rates will be less. But it is by my advent of micro TSA, the rates have improved to 55 to 60 percent. And live birth rates, they are comparable. So the key messages in non-obstructive azuspermia is that the sperm production is deficient or absent. Overall retrieval rates are 50 percent. Here the labor intensive lab processing is required for these retrieved sperms. The method used, it depends on the method. So micro TSA yields better sperm retrieval rates than the normal testicular sperm aspiration. Predictive factors now today are only Y chromosome and the testicular histology as shown by the diagnostic testicular biopsy and reproductive potential is less as compared to the obstructive azuspermia. So our uh, passion, my passion is as an endologist is to retrieve the sperm from wherever and my efforts are only to retrieve the sperms and so that these non-obstructive azuspermia patients should not be called as in unsterile sterile, or they should not be called as baj. So that is my efforts and let them have their own child of their own genes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Any questions? You are free to ask. Yes, sir. Uh, wonderful uh, Thank you, sir. presentation. See, I remember one uh, story. I don't know whether I read it in Low Belly or uh, uh, this Jeff Cotter. But there was a medical student and the lecture was being given uh, on uh, uh, azospermia. And then uh, the teacher said, I mean, it's a very long story, old story. So we, azospermics can never become uh, father. And that boy committed suicide. Okay. He jumped from the window and when the autopsy was done, there were sperms in his testes. So I just wanted to share this. You do micro TSA on both testes or uh, I mean you go to the other testes? So what we do is that we do micro TSA only on one testis. So if we are not able to find sperms in that testis, okay, then we stop the procedure there itself. We don't open the test, second testis. Why? Because already these sperms are deficient in sperm production. So we counsel the patient, mm. we give them uh, again a hormonal therapy for six weeks, we freeze the eggs and then after six weeks of hormonal therapy, we attempt on the other side. What hormonal therapy you give to him? Sir, uh, depends on the testosterone levels as I told you, LH, mm. FSH levels. Mm. So either we give a combination of clomiphene citrate or if the testosterone is but very then low. these patients, you, achha, obstructive, yeah, yeah non -obstructive. They, they have a normal non, I'm speaking of non-obstructively, mm. obstructive anyway you can find a sperm. Mm. So non-obstructive, if you're not able to find sperm, you uh, get, what if the patients. Is, what if uh, the FSH level is very high already? So that's what, so if the does testosterone. It, does it work, hormonal therapy in these patients? Huh? 
Uh, so if the testosterone is very less and the FSH is very elevated, more than 80 if it is elevated 2.5 to 3 times the normal. Hmm. So these patients are cases of primary testicular failure, that means the testis is at fault. So these patients, first you uh, start them with clomiphene cited 25 milligram OD for 6 weeks. Or you can, if the FSH is not, if the testosterone is not improving and the FSH level is not coming down, then you can add HCG uh, injection, 3000, 5000 unit thrice a week. And after 6 weeks, you repeat the FSH and the testosterone. And uh, if the testosterone is still less and the FSH has not come that much down, then you can add a uh, HMG injection, 150 unit thrice a week. So after that hormonal therapy, only then we go for the other testes because already the testes, the sperms are deficient. So no point in doing micro on both the sides. So we don't be aggressive at that same time. So after a period of six weeks, we counsel the family, we counsel the patient. And after six weeks only, we is the aim to bring down the, I mean, increase the testosterone or? Correct. The aim is to increase the testosterone. The intratesticular testosterone is the most important thing because this intratesticular testosterone is the one which is responsible drive for the sperm production in the testis. Mm -hmm. So our aim is mainly to increase the intratesticular testosterone levels. Once you do a, a micro TSA or NAB or whatever, I think there is a chance that the patient will develop anti-sperm antibodies. There is a chance. There is so, a chance. See, any, so the next uh, uh, procedure, uh, there will be a less... Uh, less chances of... So they, there is one study I have not quoted. So in that study, they have uh, correlated between the number of biopsies and the chances of sperm retrieval. So as the number of... Uh, it was done by Turek et al. So Turek, they have got a good andrology clinic. So uh, in that study, as the number of biopsies m went more than 10, be it a testicular sperm extraction, simple needle biopsy, or be it a micro tissa. So if the number of biopsies on any testis went more than 10, the sperm retrieval rates became flat. So it also depends because any testicular, any invasion of the blood testicular barrier, be it by doing a varicocele surgery, be it by torsion testis, any trauma to the testis also evades the blood testis barrier. Just by putting a needle, that also uh, evades the blood testicular barrier. That causes anti-sperm antibody formation. Because these sperms yeah. cannot be frozen. I mean, cryopreserved. No, yes. we can cryopreserved. Yeah, yeah, we can cryopreserved. Uh, well, Sanish, hearty congratulations. Thank you. Sir. Friends, uh, you may be knowing or not knowing, but Sanish is very bright strong from St. Joseph days and I have witnessed that. And really nice to listen to your presentation as well. Now see, in our ART practice, we always say that the role of hormonal treatment, we preserve it only for the hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, where we know that there is no actually the, that particular thing available in that particular body. Sure. Now when you said about this particular combination of clomiphene plus SCG plus HMG, are there any studies which support there is a some change in that so under that's what I, I, pro, I gave two studies sir. yes one was by Hussein et al and second study by uh, this Japanese correct uh, yes sir correct so in that they have compared the patients who have been hormonally treated and second group of patients who have not been hormonally treated and of course they did micro TSA only so one group of patients they did micro TSA without the hormonal treatment okay and another group of patients after six weeks uh, of the hormonal treatment they retrieved the sperm by uh, doing micro TSA so the sp uh, sperm retrieval rates were of course, higher in the hormonal treated groups. Great, yeah. And how it get translated in your practice, I'm going to say when you observe practically, how much it you found it useful in your practice while I, giving... I hormonal treat all my patients. Sir. Good. So yeah. it means I do this hormonal essay. I do the testosterone, estradiol, FSH, LH for all these patients. Yes. Then depends on the levels as I showed the chart. <coughs> Accordingly, I give them combination of either clomiphene, then HCG, HMG, or if the estradiol ratio is reversed, I just give them anastrozole or letrozole. Great. Good. Thank Only you. those patients where the testosterone levels are higher side and they don't require hormonal therapy. Yes. With the testosterone levels, they, not, they don't require hormonal therapy. But hormonal therapy is necessary yeah. before. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Sanish. Yeah, thank you. As an opening batsman, you have done a wonderful job with all your boundaries. But the message to be taken with a pinch of salt because the sperms which are not naturally developed by the natural process, you are retrieving it in a scientific way. And this 
fertilizing potential of these sperms is always compromised. You have such a low volume number of sperms that you cannot freeze, thawing will not give you good number of retrieval and moreover the fertilizing potential is always compromised. Even though you get maybe grade 1 or mostly grade 2 or grade 3 embryos after these procedures, it is very, very likely that the implantation potential and full term, that is carry home baby rates, is not that good as in a natural ejaculate sperm extreme. So, though this appears very lucrative to the affording, who can afford to go all through all these adrenaline surges through for the doctor and the patient, and who is willing to accept a negative pregnancy result, this can be definitely tried because this has come as a boon. Earlier, they were taking these testicular sperms through biopsies, multiple slices, and Paul Devroy, Dr. Paul Devroy has also mentioned that one patient visited him seven times and so many biopsies, ultimately no, seven times and no sperm was retrieved and the man came back with no testes. So we have to keep this in mind and only to a very selected affording patient you can try this who can afford to get no pregnancy even after these expenses okay. Okay. because there is always a compromise we cannot conquer nature. It's okay. all. Thank actually, you for actually, the wonderful nowadays, talk. If you see the ART laws have become very strict. Yes. So now the recent modifications in the ART laws uh, sperm donation also has become very strict yes. and sperm donated sperms are not available to all the gynecological hospitals if you see these donated sperms can be only be acquired by very hi-fi centers like apollo indira ivf yeah. only hi-fi centers can acquire these donated sperms also they have made some criteria that one person can donate sperm only once in a year like that criteria they have one made. child after one child then he is not supposed to correct, donate correct. Yes. so very strict criteria yeah. so that is the reason they are more and also in embryos donated embryos also they are uh, everywhere become, there are every, no roads, road now the laws have become very strict breakers everywhere it okay. is all the mafia that is functioning okay. we cannot say that that is always 100 percent true but we have to think from the patient's point of view correct, also correct. Because, because they sell so many this, things, they sell everything and ultimately they are left with no, not even two or two Because ultimately this, procedure, uh, yes. ultimately this procedure requires yes. uh, cost. Yes. See in Apollo also like we charge around 70 to 80,000 for the total procedure. Procedure. That includes the operative cost, everything. Yes including microscope and everything. And then the IVF and the ICSI ah, cost, that is, that the freeze thaw cost, yeah. and then adrenaline surges for the doctor so only the and offering, the patient. Ah, yes. So only the offering patients will be able yes. to do it, plus it involves the surgery yes. part. Excellent talk. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request our chairpersons, Anjali Jamma, madam, and Dr. Sandha Shangarpure, madam, to please felicitate Dr. Sanesh, sir. After the wonderful speech by Dr. Sanish, now the, in this one day match, the second batsman who is going to take over the podium is Dr. Milin Shah. He has a lot number of lot number of achievements, presentations. He has visited almost every country on the planet. And so it's such a big list of achievements that we know him in and out even during the day, 24 hours of the day we know him. Dr. Milin Shah, we present to you Dr. Milin Shah who is going to speak about all about ART referrals. 
which is equally important as we are doing ART procedures. So, Dr. Milin Shah. <clears throat> For your kind words, it's indeed a pleasure to have your own friends uh, as a chairperson and uh, to speak in front of you all. In fact, I'm doing locum today. Dr. Girish Kumtekar, because of some or other, actually the problem is unable to attend today. CME and then I received a call at 12 o'clock in the night by Monica saying that, sir, do you want to please help us with any, anything related to the infertility? And then I realized, yes, a lot of things we can always share because we are like family and we need to understand about what actually we should adopt in our practice. We just now heard about so many advances in the andrology. And it was really a fortune for all of us that our own children are doing such a wonderful and fabulous job in the field of infertility in other fields. So now, we need to understand at least when we should refer a case for ART and when not. That is very, very important. That was always the bodies also think about and that's why in ISR we form this TOG. TOG means where we sit together to churn about these particular facts because we realize that even this ART referral is not very unique. It is happening that some of the patients are getting deprived from actually the ART references and some of them they are pushed too much towards ART when it is not indicated. So all that thing need to come to one good level of practice as we always thrive for in any country, in same applicable to India and that's how the ISAR had decided to have this TOG where me and Dr. Pratap Kumar were told to take few actually the ART specialist and we form a guideline about the ART referral. So I thought this is a good chance for you to listen about that particular fact as well, how actually we can uh, think about the ART per se. And then we conducted one panel as well on the same topic whereby we invited all the people uh, across the nation to discuss about, to tell about their actually ideas about ART referral. Uh, you know that these procedures are very, very important they are very much uh, actually important per se as the gamete manipulation is concerned because we are uh, dealing with the oocytes, we are dealing with the sperms and we are also dealing with the embryos. And every day there is something new happens in this particular field. I remember in 1996 when I brought first time cryopreserved cement in Sholapur, people were still using neat cement because that was the practice in those days and that was routine but HIV started you know getting more prevalent and we realized no now that is not possible so same type of advances keep on happening and we just now heard so many new things as well so it's very important to establish whether these treatments are appropriate as such treatments are generally safer stress but uh, quite often they can create a lot of stress as well as Dr. Sheila said very correctly we need to think about the multiple way the economical their psychological their social circumstances and this affording thing is again very very important on the other hand the subjecting infertile couples to unnecessary delay is also not very good this happens quite often because we we get sometimes some poor patients and we feel ourselves afraid to give them the knowledge about what is available. But try to understand, for us, maybe probably having a car, having a TV may be important, but for any poor family, having a baby is also very important. So one need to at least give them the options. And those options, they want to choose, they can choose. If they cannot afford, they can very well go out of it, isn't it? So, uh, but it's our duty as a clinician to tell them all those options which are available. We know that almost 15% of the couple in developing countries are infertile. Uh, there's no major change in the prevalence because when we calculate it in one or other way, it becomes probably the same. And because of this many techniques, now many of them, they are able to get the babies with affordable cost. And that's, what, that's how we see in our practice as well. The factors which are responsible for the choice of infertility treatment are depends on plenty of things. The chance of pregnancy without treatment, the chance with simpler and safer but less successful and infertility treatments, and the chance with the more complex and costly but more effective ART treatments. 
but all these actually sentences are interchangeable i mean to say when we say more effective it is not necessarily so suppose the indication is not very correct and that's why one need to be very very careful vice versa if it is a case where even simpler major can make a change subjecting that particular couple for the rt will be sort of little you know economical damage to that particular family so one need to take into consideration age duration cause of infertility the availability the cost of alternative treatments and of course lastly the counseling is very very important the acceptability that is very important in fact girish was supposed to uh, deliver a talk on all the tips and tricks in the counseling which is again very important but that is most important i would say because unless and until you do that properly you don't uh, you document it properly there won't be actually the much actually outcome good outcome in your practice as far as the infertility is concerned is art is absolutely safe we all know that no there are of course any technology has certain problems as well <coughs> and science always wants to make a major change like ohss once upon the time i remember was a nightmare i remember so many patients used to get admitted to icu because of this hyper stimulation syndrome but with availability of antagonists and so many other new molecules now the chances have come down the multiple pregnancies you know quite often patient feel they got blessed by getting twin or triplet but for a clinician or art specialist it is complication and need to be thought as a complication itself you cannot credit at saying that you know you got twin and you should not celebrate it because our aim is always to have a single and pregnancy because we know outcomes of multiple pregnancy as well which is very commonly uh, known to every ob gyn and also there also fear that drugs that induce ovulation may increase the risk of ovarian cancer and there are n number of studies available for that the infertility treatment should therefore be individualized we cannot apply the rule of the thumb for any particular given case and one need to take into consideration all those actually the factors which are involved in that and we should not over treat that particular patient which is very very important so it's very important to refer proper patient at the proper time to art but i wanted to add one more actually word before that proper art because that is again very important part because quite often that also makes a major difference and manu or two cycles are gone that way let me share with you one very eye opening story of similar sort previous two abortions patient went to art center she was advised now you need to undergo ivf so she underwent two ivf cycles with no success patient came back and we came to our clinic when i saw ki any work up done for the two abortions zero then i said ki suppose you get pregnancy with this art you would have got pregnancy and again that pregnancy would have got aborted what is the answer the patient you know sometimes need to ask the leading questions and then they said yes we are to very to then he started doing work up she was apla positive then we induced her with time intercourse and she conceived and now see it creates lot negativity negativity about medical practice negativity about our actually own people and that should not happen and to avoid that one need to be very gentle in advocating this actually uh, advices to our own obgyns also and that's why i must say big thanks to our society also for this is a good platform whereby we can understand at least that the treatment need to be properly addressed to a given couple when and when it is indicated and one should not unnecessarily subject that particular patient for the uh, art treatment uh, the categories of the patients are those with single defect in one of the partners those with multiple defects in one or both the partners or no apparent defect what we call the unexplained infertility when we say unexplained infertility it is not necessarily unexplained infertility in every case your evaluation process makes a major difference it may be a unexplained infertility for a center a but when it goes to the center b probably he or she is able to find out the cause of that infertility or at least think about all the subtle defects in the process of ovulation in the process of fertilization in the process of implantation 
and that is the gimmick where you get the success and those success stories are because of your more thinking on those unexplained thing which get explained with that thinking and more diagnostic evaluation of those particular cases the tubal diseases we know that the microsurgical techniques for tubal and peritoneal diseases have failed or unlikely to benefit the patient i will not agree on this particular sentence because suppose a patient comes to me with a tubal disease especially when they come for quite open to the recanalization by doing that particular technique at least i am keeping the choice open for multiple cycles whereas suppose i subject her for art and suppose she conceives in that cycle that's good but doesn't conceive again she has come to the zero so one has to be very 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 choosy while selecting this debate of microsurgery versus art and one need to see that uh, the indication again the cause of the tubal disease need to be understood properly and then accordingly you can go further for example quite often very recently last week operated case in my center where the tubes were blocked and when we did actually the corneal implantation you can see how the dye spilled out of the tube because we were owing those old timer micro surgical uh, instruments but which always gives us a, you know sort of success actually stories which are again very very important same is applicable to the uterine factors the mullerian agenesis or the congenital uterine anomalies as actually we heard that yes there are a lot of answers which are coming up even in the cases of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in uh, a female as well we are able to nowadays do a wonders in those cases as well we have seen recently even in the cases where this uterus is absent the transplantation of the uterus is also becoming possible slowly so one need to think about lot of those actually options and need to explore that possibility to your patients as well before giving your own judgmental decision in that particular given case the women with severe intrauterine adhesions refractory to surgical lysis of the adhesions the hysterectomized patients can do ivf transfer their embryos to a surrogate mother as well now while doing that you know there were certain malpractices which are all the time happening i won't say malpractices i would say ignorant practices because when we start a center naturally we become too stressed as well because of all those investments and then naturally we indulge in doing the things which 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 we are not supposed to do and then the entire world gets affected with that we recently heard the story of that tamil nadu a center where the girl young girl was stimulated and she was uh, the ovaries were retrieved from her repeatedly but that created all those restrictions and we know that now we all are need to face all those actually problems which are related with new regulations as well but there is no actually answer to this particular problem which i would call as a social problem rather than the medical problem the ovarian factors again very very important the hypogonadotropic anovulation oligoovulation luteal phase deficiency or luf in the severe pcos the cervical factors again very important because quite often the cervix which is stenosed can actually be a cause of infertility and we need to put little more actually the efforts in that particular patient to uh, dilate that particular cervix which is possible nowadays with variety of drugs and variety of means available and that that can result in the pregnancy i remember a story of 1996 when i was very new in my practice very young like you all and we got a case of infertility uh, married since 15 years and previous all attempts to dilate her cervix were unsuccessful because they were they were thinking of doing some uterine surgery uh, the cervical surgery to make a tract and all those things but only the one history which was clinching and was promising to me was she was having normal menses so i was very sure that the uh, there is some good track from the menses are coming so i called her on day 1 of the cycle to understand whether she is lying or whether it is correct and on day 1 when i saw yes she was menstruating and when we tried to you know do dilatation in those days even prostaglandins were not available but we did a very patiently slow dilatation of the cervix we could dilate the cervix effectively and after 2 months she came with spontaneous conception see what it tells that again we have to think a lot in those particular cases 
a simple interventions which are not very very uh, you can say the different but can make a major difference as well similar is the story with the endometriosis quite often there is a tendency in saying that this endometriotic women are infertile or they are subfertile and immediately they are put for the arity but we know that with medical management of endometriosis and if the tubes are patent they can even conceive without arity as well that one need to think about the use of donor oocytes donor sperms and the embryos is again a good actually options for many of those unfortunate couples as well but now you have to be very careful <coughs> because of this new regulations there are a lot of changes which are happening in the arity practice and suppose you don't follow the law of that particular land naturally you are going to get in the trouble so one has to be very careful i am not going to give more thrust on the male factor because just now we heard a lot about uh, the male factor as well but there are a lot of immunological things as well and there are a lot of therapies which are coming alight in all other things we are going to listen a wonderful talk by dr mohan raut which has which will be little quite uh, new actual dish for you because yes there are a lot of changes happening in the immunotherapy as well in various diseases in the medical science same is applicable to infertility as well the uh, unexplained infertility i told you already that one need to be more more actually uh, careful in your evaluation process whereby you can do that and this is the list of all those actually procedures in the art which you should know please take the pictures picture of this particular uh, uh, slide which I always tell my students as well to take because they will understand in what condition what you need to do and suppose you do that definitely your practice will be more satisfying as well and more clean as well when it comes to the art referral quite often the iui again people say that suppose everything is quite okay tubes are open and they tried the six cycles of iui and patient has failed to conceive what to do immediately put her on the art and this was a wonderful study which was done where they tried unstimulated actually six more cycles in those particular subjects now why it is so i'm going to tell you but over 50% of women under 40 years will conceive within six cycles of iui of those who don't conceive within six cycles of iui about half will do so in the next six cycles and the cumulative pregnancy rate is over 75% provided the iui are done with utmost actually the uh, uh, care and as well as all those things which need to be observed in the iui need to be done why i am saying so everyone wants to start the iui center in their actually clinic and they don't realize that even the laminar flow the proper microscope proper incubation all those things are at most important as far as success is concerned i remember in early days people used to send the sample to the pathologist and used to do it on the his open table that preparation used to send the sample which is not a correct practice so friends this was the conclusion of our meeting whereby we gave a flow chart to all our obichwines probably it must have reached to you through isr if you are isr member not so please again avail well, this is from me you can take picture but suppose you follow this particular flow chart which has been churn with lot of efforts by all those consultants who were present there and group decided to give this chart to all our obigwine friends to understand how we can come to the art referral when a woman comes to you with infertility thank you very much and thank you uh, sobg for this wonderful opportunity thank you very much thank you very much milin shah sir for that lucid talk it has indeed put forth points in front of us when and how should we refer the infertile patients thank you, thank you so much sir thank you now i would like to call upon a third batsman for the day dr amul lunkat sir uh, excuse me pratibha a friend in need is a friend indeed and it's true thank you shah sir for accepting and save us at the last moment whole sjs team is always happy to listen to you sir I request our chairpersons and Dr. Anjali Jamma, ma'am, please felicitate Dr. Milind Shah, sir.
Now we would like to call the third batsman for the day, Dr. Amol Lunkat sir. He has done his MD, DNB and uh, diploma in uh, ART from USA. He has received multiple awards. The most prestigious of them is Indumati Zaveri Prize for his best research paper in 2010. The Suli Rudra Sinha Prize for his advanced endoscopic surgery in uh, 2010. He was awarded the best oral paper presentation in the Gynecology Endocrinology Conference 2011. He has removed a 7 kg ovarian tumor laparoscopically in April 2012. He has been awarded the most inspiring gynecologist of Western India 2018 by Economic Type, Times and awarded the, uh, he, under his leadership, Indira IVF Pune team won the most best integrated IVF team of India award at the National Fertility in February 2020. We welcome you, sir. Yeah, good afternoon all at the, uh, and thank you Dr. Pratibha for your kind words. At the outset, uh, I would li like to thank uh, Solapur Ops Gaini Society for giving me this uh, chance to interact with you all and making me part of this academic uh, feast. Thank you Dr. Anjali, Dr. Archana, uh, uh, respected chairperson and my dear friends and colleagues. I would be speaking on clinical use of pre-genetic testing. And I will like to cover this topic uh, under these headings, uh, the pregenetic testing. Of course, we know the newer terminologies, pregenetic testing for aneuploidy, for structural rearrangement, and pregenetic testing for monogenic disorders. Indications of pregenetic testing, the evolution of the pregenetic testing, the new kid on the block, the non-invasive chromosomal screening, case-based discussion of uh, pregenetic testing, and some uh, take-home messages. We know that one of the revolution in ART uh, practice was embryo biopsy, and it started with uh, cellular stage biopsy. We were doing the day three biopsies. Then we shifted to the blastocyst uh, fluid uh, removal and uh, looking for the uh, aneuploidies in the blastocyst fluid. And then finally, we shifted to the trophoectodermal biopsy. And nowadays, the trophoectodermal biopsy is the more or less the gold standard which we follow. Here you can see a day five blastocyst and using the laser, uh, bore has been made in the outer zona and after making a small bore, some cells are aspirated uh, by using the uh, blastocyst biopsy kit. And after aspirating these cells using the laser again, few these cells are detached. And these cells will then be cultured in the genetic lab to understand the genetic makeup of the embryo from which these cells have been extracted. And this is how uh, pre-genetic testing is done uh, routinely nowadays. <coughs> uh, as I was saying, the older terminology of pre-genetic screening and pre-genetic diagnosis have been replaced by pre-genetic testing for aneuploidy and pre-genetic testing for monogenic disorders and structural rearrangements appropriately by American Society of Reproductive Medicine. Uh, previously, of course, uh, PGD was the used terminology uh, for PGTM and PGTSR and PGS for uh, PGTA. PGD is usually performed in couples who are high, at high risk of transmitting genetic disorders or who are having familial genetic disorders or who are carrier of various genetic disorders like maybe autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant disorders or X-linked disorders. While uh, pre-genetic screening is, or uh, the newer terminology pre-genetic testing for aneuploidies, mainly to find out the presence of aneuploidies in the embryos and especially associated with advanced maternal age or repeated IVF failures or couples who are experiencing repeated abortions with normal karyotypes, of course. 
and uh, as we were looking at that pre-genetic uh, testing for monogenic disorders and structural rearrangements, so the uh, can be done for basically translocations, inversions, or autosomal recessive dis dis diseases like cystic fibrosis, beta thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, spinal muscular atrophy, autosomal dominant monotonic uh, dystrophies, Huntington disease. So there are thousands of such genetic diseases which uh, we know about, which if our, the previous child is affected, or if the, one of the parent or both the parents are carriers, or uh, if uh, there is a family history of such genetic disease, then definitely we can do uh, testing in the embryos and transfer a genetically healthy embryo to achieve a healthy pregnancy. Pre-genetic testing for aneuploidy basically will not only improve the implantation rates because if you are transferring a euploid embryo, then we know that the implantation rates are going to be better. It will decrease the miscarriage rate, it will definitely decrease the time to pregnancy ra rate and of course decrease the risk of abnormal offspring and the emotional burden of having a miscarriage after IVF. Especially it is indicated when the female is having an advanced maternal age more than 35 years of age or there is a previous history of recurrent pregnancy loss or recurrent implantation failure or there is severe male factor infertility, severe oligoasthenoteratozoospermia because we know that uh, when there is severe oligoasthenoteratozoospermia again the aneuploidy rates increase. Or if you are planning a single embryo transfer which is the gold standard uh, thing to do then uh, of course we should know that the embryo is euploid that will again uh, improve the success rate. So in all these cases pregenetic testing for aneuploidy would be indicated or would be advised. We also know that as the age increases the aneuploidy rates increase and uh, we also know that just morphology is not sufficient enough to say that the embryo is euploid or not. Even in the best possible uh, blastocyst would not be euploid and the poorest of the blastocyst will also be euploid. So just only morphological criteria fails to select the best embryo. So good morphology does not always mean uh, that the embryo is euploid. Here you can see though it is a double A grade good excellent blastocyst still only 56 percent of them in this study came out to be euploid while even the poorest of the blastocysts 25 percent of them were euploid so just uh, morphology cannot ensure that uh, whether we are transferring euploid embryos or not now there was a lot of concern whether trophectodermal biopsy or removing these few cells is going to cause any harm and of course this concern remains even today but there have been uh, several studies which have clearly shown that in good hands with a good learning curve in a properly skilled embryologist, if he is doing a uh, trophectodermal biopsy, then there is, uh, does not affect the embryo's reproductive potential, nor it causes any harm to the embryo. Of course, we do not know the long-term effects uh, in the future of this trophectodermal biopsies, say uh, 25 years, 30 years down the line, whether it is going to affect uh, to certain extent. Those long studies still would be uh, of course, better uh, we look at them also later on. Uh, but of course, we have the new kid on the block where the trophoectodermal biopsy can, of course, be uh, prevented. So, if we see various studies of pregenetic testing for aneuploidy, then uh, there are several good uh, meta analysis, also randomized control trial, which clearly showed, shows that, especially in patients with advanced maternal age. Pre-genetic testing for aneuploidy is definitely going to improve the implantation rate, decrease the uh, abortion rate or the miscarriage rate and improve the, uh, reduce the time to pregnancy. Similarly, in this uh, study where it was a randomized control trial uh, of uh, patients with advanced maternal age, uh, where pre-genetic pre testing uh, versus non-PGTA non group were compared. So two groups were there, uh, 100, patient, 100 cycles were performed uh, with PGTA group and 105 cycles in the non-PGTA group. And clearly you can see the uh, overall take-home baby rate were far uh, better in the PGTA group versus the non-PGTA group. And the most important thing to see is the miscarriage rate were also significantly different because here we are ensuring that we are transferring a euploid blastocyst.
similarly again the time to pregnancy and time to live birth were again significantly better and the number of transfers required to achieve a live birth were significantly less in the pgta group so uh, basically if we look at pregenetic testing in advanced maternal age definitely pregenetic testing is going to add on to the value or add on to the uh, success overall to summarize regarding pregenetic testing for aneuploidy it uh, Im it helps us improve the implantation rate per embryo transfer decreases the miscarriage rate decreases abnormal pregnancies decreases the use of invasive prenatal diagnosis later on during pregnancy and decreases the time to pregnancy uh, of course it adds on to the cost it uh, requires expertise and there is a potential uh, damage to the embryo which can occur and there is uh, apprehension about that in many of them and so it can be overcome by the non-invasive pgta which we have now if you see the evolution of technique or technology which has happened over uh, decades uh, initially it started with use of uh, fluorescence in hybrid uh, in situ hybridization fish fish was used later on uh, basically Uh, genomic hybridization was started to be used then single nucleotide polymorphism snps came in and uh, of course uh, qpcr was then used so the technology went on changing and with the advent of next generation sequencing in 2013 the overall picture changed because uh, we could uh, overall see the whole genome if required and uh, we had a lot of data regarding the genome uh, even um, single gene mutations could be easily studied uh, studied and uh, with the use of next generation sequencing uh, also came the next generation sequencing in the spent culture media so we can just know whether the embryo is euploid or not by studying the spent media or the culture media in which the embryo has grown so no need of taking biopsies similar to or you can contemplate similarly with what we are doing with nipt that is non invasive prenatal screen uh, testing or screening same year non invasive pregenetic testing for aneuploidy so in 2012 uh, it was first observed that there is genome dna contents in the embryo culture media in which the embryo grows and multiple studies there on Uh, have been done to find out the cell free dna in the embryonic spent media for detection of chromosomal aneuploidy that is what is known as non invasive chromosomal screening so non invasive chromosomal screening it uh, basically uh, we know that trophoectodermal biopsy is invasive uh, it may hamper the clinical outcomes it may have some unknown health effects in the long term on the embryos Uh, trophy trophy ectodermal biopsy requires specialized equipments extensive expertise it is difficult to standardize and adds to the cost so the non invasive chromosomal screening or non invasive pregenetic testing for aneuploidy is uh, nowadays more and more being used and last 6 uh, months or so i can say that my own center the rate or the percentage of trophy ectodermal biopsy has now gone down by almost uh, you can say 60 to 65% so non invasive chromosomal screening is non invasive it is easy to perform it is a good screening tool and uh, we do not require the additional biopsy kits so cost is uh, less and it can be performed widespread perform uh, we can perform it on widespread number of embryos for chromosomal screening before embryo transfer and thus might help to improve the success rate the initial studies of nics or non invasive chromosomal screening came around 2015 16 this was one of the initial studies wherein uh, basically for uh, 42 human blastocyst of seven patients were uh, studied and uh, they were validated later on with a trophoectodermal biopsy also so they did non invasive chromosomal screening of these 42 blastocyst and also confirmed them with a trophoectodermal biopsy and they had a very good concordance rate and six of them also achieved successful pregnancies and live birth this is one of the very recent very uh, large study again in august 2021 uh, from the chinese group uh, with almost 265 uh, 
uh, human uh, embryos and basically uh, what they did in this study is uh, the, they studied the whole embryo they also validated the NICS versus trophoectodermal biopsy versus the whole embryo so three groups non-invasive chromosomal screening also took the trophoectodermal biopsy and also did the whole embryo karyotype which is the gold standard so and they uh, compared all the three in these 265 donated embryos and the NICS assay or the non-invasive chromosomal screening showed promising performance with a comparable you can say sensitivity specificity and uh, negative predictive value so uh, compared to the trophoectodermal biopsy when they saw the sensitivity was 87 percent versus 89 percent so the uh, non-invasive chromosomal screening had a sensitivity of 87.36% while the trophoectodermal biopsy group had a sensitivity of 89.6%. The specificity in the NICS group was 80.2% and it was 82.3% in the trophoectodermal biopsy group. And the negative predictive value was again very close. So overall, if we see that NICS, uh, again the advantage of NICS uh, was that it could not only give us regarding the aneuploidy or the ploidy uh, percentage or the rates, uh, but it also gives a, gave us a scoring system for prioritizing the embryos. So which of the euploid embryos are best to be transferred? That again we can understand uh, by non-invasive chromosomal screening. So when the report comes, they give us a transfer priority also. So that was one advantage of non-invasive chromosomal screening. So in conclusion, this uh, study clearly concluded it was one of the first large-scale validation of NICS. And uh, basically, the results uh, clearly suggested that uh, non-invasive chromosomal screening is a, a very good assay for identifying chromosomally normal embryos for transfer and might serve as a non-invasive approach prior to invasive pregenetic testing for prioritizing embryos for transfer. So basically, of course, larger studies would come and uh, it would be more validated but definitely this is one of the technique and uh, the advantage is as I said the uh, overall learning curve is not there you do not require that skilled embryologist because we know as such embryologists are scare, scarce and uh, with the new ART law uh, again the scarcity would increase and again those of the embryologists those performing embryo biopsy with a good success rate and good you can say uh, uh, freeze thaw rate after doing a biopsy are very less so uh, non-invasive chromosomal screening would definitely be one of the uh, technologies which is going to stay here for a long time <clears throat> let me take you through few cases these are uh, all uh, uh, practical cases which have come in our day-to-day -day practice or my day-to-day -day practice and uh, uh, these are th uh, I think four cases or so we'll discuss wherein pregenetic testing uh, was used and it has changed the overall outcome. This is a 32 year old female presented to us in 2021 with secondary infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss previous to abortions she had uh, in both the uh, uh, pregnancies she had uh, missed abortion at seven and eight weeks and uh, overall secondary infertility since four years and she had tried ovulation induction thrice and IUI two cycles were failed. We did the initial workup of RPL and uh, infertility and uh, overall the base, basic tests were all okay. B positive blood group, GTT was normal, thyroid, prolactin were normal. She was having PCOS, so AMH was on higher side. Her hysteroscopy was within normal limits, but the cervix looked patchulous maybe because of the previous two DNCs. The rubella was immune, thrombophilia screen was normal, husband had a normal uh, semen analysis with a normal uh, DNA fragmentation index. Her sonography showed normal uterus with uh, bilateral AFC of 26, so she was PCOD. So these were her initial uh, screening reports. And uh, because of RPL, we did her karyotype. And on karyotype, basically, uh, husband's karyotype showed translocation. So this, there was a translocation of uh, chromosome 5 and 17. I don't know whether you can appreciate because this is a direct picture of the report which I have taken. 
but the break points of the translocation were not given in the first report so there was a uh, question mark put and the proband uh, indicate a possible translocation between chromosome 5 and 17 but it has not been possible to determine the break points why the break points are important because when you are going to check in the embryo their exact break points have to be noted so uh, that uh, uh, they again uh, uh, did the sampling again before checking in the embryo and find, found out the breakpoints to um, check the embryos. Again, her, he, uh, the wife's karyotype was also not normal. It had a polymorphic variation on 21 chromosome. So wife's karyotype was tw uh, 46XX, 21 PS plus. Again, though these polymorphic variations are normal variations, but in our practice, if you see, they do cause an increase in aneuploidy rates. So, uh, basically, we had counseled that even these polymorphic variations uh, need to be looked at because they increase the risk of aneuploidy, and so the, uh, simultaneously doing a PGTA was necessary. So, this patient under who had secondary infertility with uh, RPL and with husband having translocation, wife having 46XX, 21PS plus. So, a uh, routine antagonist cycle was done and uh, recombinant FSH was used along with cetrorelix she, uh, she, as she was having uh, PCOS, uh, GNRH agonist trigger was given and uh, she retrieved, uh, we retrieved uh, basically 30 mature oocytes and four blastocysts were formed. Again, you see the blastulation rate is less. Uh, these patients with 21PS plus with translocation the blastulation rate is usually on a lower side. Uh, of these four blastocysts, all were exposed to pregenetic testing for structural rearrangement and pregenetic testing for aneuploidy. And two of the embryos came euploid. These were the. So here you can see the breakpoints were identified. Breakpoints were on P15 and P13. And uh, two embryos were euploid and balanced. So, they were transferred to achieve a pregnancy. This was the beta HCG report. So, uh, this uh, shows that basically in patients with uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, karyotype is one of the most important tests to do. If the basic baseline simple karyotype does not show any abnormality and there is no other reason of RPL which you are finding, then these couples, it is better to go for chromosomal microarray and uh, of course if you find any genetic cause then pregenetic testing is the way out let us go to our next case again this is a uh, interesting case a overseas patient from yemen with premature ovarian aging with irregular menstrual cycle she had taken various treatments of infertility in yemen and dubai for 7 years her amh was just 0 0.07 afc used to vary between 0 to 1 so uh, again, the wife had abnormal karyotype, you can see the reports here. So wife, you can see, had multiple polymorphic variation, 9QH+, 15PS+, 21PS+, AMH of just 0 0.07, and being uh, from Yemen, where uh, oocyte donation is absolutely not uh, acceptable, she wanted to try only with self eggs, and husband was HBSAG reactive, but the envelope antigen and liver function tests were normal. And she was uh, on the, uh, you can say, obese side. So these were her initial uh, sonography reports. Uh, Antral follicle count almost uh, zero in one ovary, one in uh, other ovary. So we had to use all various techniques. So minimal stimulation, accumulation, vitrification strategy, along with ICSI, with blastosis culture, along with pregenetic testing with laser assisted etching. So all was used to basically, we did her pickup twice achieved one one blastocyst each time and of the two blastocyst one which came euploid achieved her pregnancy so this you can see uh, dual stimulation or a double stimulation was done each time it was a minimal stimulation with rfsh 150 and clomiphene citrate 100 mg and uh, of course cetrorelix and uh, deca trigger was given uh, 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 on her first uh, uh, you can say pickup and a dual trigger was given on her second pickup and uh, one plus one two blastocysts were formed and one euploid blastocyst achieved a beta hcg of 2743 so again this is uh, the video where i am explaining the case actually 
So let us go to our next case. And uh, prime, this is a 31-year-old female, primary infertility for five years. She had ovulation cycle uh, for three times, IUI one cycle was failed, but the, uh, in, nobody had checked for HB electrophoresis. So the uh, one take home message is any infertile couple who comes to us, we should undergo, we should uh, uh, basically see for the preconceptional, uh, you can say screening, and it uh, includes HB electrophoresis for both husband and wife. It is better to rule out uh, uh, rubella immune or non-immune so that you can vaccinate the uh, female before she undergoes any uh, infertility treatment. So the uh, basic screening of an uh, infertile couple is very important because many times we might miss uh, uh, carrier in husband and wife. So in her infertility workup which was done with us, both husband and wife were diagnosed with beta thalassemia trait and HB electrophoresis showed HBA2 of 5.5 and 5.7 respectively. So these were her initial investigations. AMH was 4.7, uh, blood group O positive, husband had uh, mild teratozoospermia and uh, good count and motility. And uh, then the next important step is to identify the gene for uh, beta thalassemia carrier. Uh, in husband and wife because it is important to identify the gene again because we have to pre prepare the probes and study the embryos. So the pre-PGD workup was done, testing was done for uh, mutations and the mutations were identified. Uh, the identification of mutation is done in the pre-PGD workup. Once the pre-PGD workup was done, then the uh, after doing uh, IVF and uh, doing her formation of blastocyst, again here if you see antagonist cycle was used, RFSH with uh, 150 IU along with uh, HMG 75 IU and later on the dose was increased of HMG to 150, ovitril trigger was given and 20 oocytes, 4 blastocysts were formed and these 4 blastocysts were then checked for uh, presence of the thalassemia and uh, basically uh, overall these four embryos were checked and two of them were heterozygous embryos so two carrier embryos were got and uh, these two were transferred to achieve pregnancy so husband wife both beta thalassemia similarly many times we get a couple where the husband and wife are both carrier for sickle cell anemia Again, this patient, uh, very low AMH, antral follicle count just four. She was a Japanese patient who came to us. Uh, she had done various IVF cycles in Pune and abroad. Uh, diffuse adenomyosis, thin endometrium, poor ovarian reserve, husband having asthenoteratozoospermia. This was, these were her initial uh, reports entered on the file. So you can see uh, when she came to us, already had three IVF cycle failed. 41 year old uh, but wanted only self egg and uh, so again low AMH willing only for self eggs uh, higher age so we did again minimal stimulation soft stimulation accumulation uh, each time one one blastocyst genetically checked the blastocyst PGTA was done and one euploid blastocyst was again transferred to achieve pregnancy this was her 16 week scan report uh, when she flew back to Japan to uh, delivered in Japan. This is the couple giving their uh, overall feedback. This is again a very interesting case. 34-year-old uh, wife and 39-year-old husband with recurrent pregnancy loss with uh, previous two oocyte donation done outside. So they had already come to us where they had done two cycles of oocyte donation and both had failed and uh, nobody had checked the husband karyotype. So uh, in my practice, it is a dictum. If uh, there is a previous failed IVF cycle at a good center, we go into the genetics of the couple. Uh, similarly, here with oocyte donation failed at Bangalore in a good IVF center, we did the husband karyotype and husband had polymorphic variation in the 21 chromosome, 21 PS plus. And uh, she had both her IVFs, she had missed abortion. So again, here, uh, <coughs> oocyte donation ke saath we had to do, we, this time we used the NICS or non-invasive chromosomal screening. You can see the report. 
So instead of doing the biopsies, a non-invasive chromosomal screening, uh, I think Milin sir was also wanted to uh, was share thoughts on this surety. So same thing was used uh, from, so at present non-invasive chromosomal screening is available uh, by two or three good genetic labs. Lilac has the surety, then you have iGenomics providing it and you have the MedGenome providing it. So, uh, so three of the embryos were checked, two were euploid, one was low mosaic and uh, basically you can see this is what the report we get. This is basically what is known as the copy number variation chart. So when uh, non-invasive chromosomal screening is done and NGS is used, you get a lot of data and bioinformatics is used to know the copy of the uh, chromosome, uh, means the number of geno genes at every chromosome is, uh, you can say, calculated. And if you can see addition or deletion of certain genes on a chromosome, that gives you an idea whether it is monosomy or trisomy or some uh, loss of genes. So here you can see on chromosome 20, there is uh, loss uh, and there is some gain. So you can see monosomy of chromosome 20 and 21 detected, mosaic trisomy of chromosome 11 detected. So on 11 again you can see there were some extra genes which were got. So this is how it is studied and uh, uh, so the, this embryo was not recommended to be transferred because of these multiple genetic abnormalities which were found. And so the euploid blastosis, so one blastosis which was low mosaic was discarded and the two blastosis which were euploid were transferred. So, and they achieved a pregnancy. So, in, to conclude my talk, of course, uh, as uh, Dr. Milind also said rightly, that ART is not only to give pregnancy, but it should be a single healthy pregnancy that is we want. So we should not uh, aim at maximizing our short-term treatment efficacy, uh, irrespective of the adverse events. Our uh, aim should be to have a long-term efficacious treatment that is a single healthy baby at home. Thank you, thank you all for patient listening and I would be open for your questions or And definitely pre-genetic testing will, is one of the, this thing wherein we can shift our practice to single embryo transfer, a single euploid blastosis transfer and try to achieve a single healthy pregnancy. Dr. Lunkert, excellent talk. Thank you. But one quest, query in my mind, you have done the test, uh, pre-genetic testing on the embryo, transferred the embryo, the patient gets pregnant. Considering the false positive and the false negative rates, do you advise reconfirming the normalcy of the chromosomal or genetic status by CVS or amniocentesis? No, nowadays with non-invasive prenatal screening, if, but it for, has if to it be is for aneuploidy, okay. but if it is for a, a thalassemia or a sickle cell anemia, then better to confirm with amniocentesis. Okay. We, means but still confirmation we 100% do during pregnancy again. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hello. Because there are allele dropouts, then as you rightly said, some uh, false negative, false positive, and allele dropout, though it is very rare, but it should be ruled out. Yes, sir. Hello, Dr. Amal. It was a very enlightening talk. Thank you so much. Uh, how do you interpret the results of tri STAR trial with your data here now? I did not get your question. The STAR trial where it was conducted across all patient age groups. Yes. Right from 25 So to basically, 30. if we consider for all age group patients, then definitely it will not show a clinically significant, you can say, uh, relevance. Then uh, you, we will find out that PGTA is just adding to the cost but not adding to the success. That is why I uh, preferentially uh, spoke more on advanced maternal age patients. So with uh, that, that is why if you see the overall recommendations by ASRM or even ISHRE, they will say that uh, pre-genetic testing is not adding to your success or adding to your uh, benefit if you consider the cost versus benefit ratio. But then if we individualize according to the patients, if we individualize according to the history, age or previous pregnancy losses, then definitely it adds on to the value. 
I would like to add that I have seen many patients who have had reproductive, uh, repeated pregnancy loss, especially cases of bad obstetric history. In, the, in those patients, especially if we implant such healthy embryos after doing PGT, definitely their chance of having a healthy baby is much higher. I have had personal experience where I have referred such patients and I have had patients coming back with a healthy baby. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It was indeed a very enlightening lecture where you have explained the application of genetics to IVFXC. You have properly explained the journey of embryo biopsy from invasive to non-invasive. You have indeed given many childless couples their bundle of joy and given them a reason to smile. It is indeed a new innovative technique which has helped many patients with reproductive pre repeated pregnancy loss to have a healthy baby. I would like to summarize this session by saying, Dr. Sanish ne aaj azospermia ki guthi ko kar diya asan. Dr. Sanish ne aaj azospermia ki guthi ko kar diya asan. जिससे हो रहे थे बहुत इनफर्टाइल पेशेंट्स परेशान अब कर देंगे उन पेशेंट्स को हम सनी सर के पास रेफर अब कर देंगे उन सब पेशेंट को हम सनी सर के पास रेफर ताकि बेबी पाकर उनकी जिंदगी जाएगी सुधर डॉक्टर मिलिंद शाह सर ने बताया इनफर्टाइल पेशेंट्स को कब और कहाँ करना है रेफर डॉक्टर मिलिंद शाह सर ने बताया इनफर्टाइल पेशेंट्स को कब और कहाँ करना है रेफर सभी ए आर टी लॉज और रेगुलेशन का ध्यान रखना है नहीं करना इधर उधर डॉक्टर अमोल लुनकर सर ने हमें प्री जेनेटिक टेस्टिंग से अवगत कराया डॉक्टर अमोल लुनकर सर ने हमें प्री जेनेटिक टेस्टिंग से अवगत कराया आई वी एफ के एडवांसिस के बारे में हमें सब बताया इन शॉर्ट इट हैज़ बीन अ वेरी इन्फॉर्मेटिव सेशन जिसने बढ़ा दिया आई वी एफ करने का हमारा अब पैशन Thank you so much. Thank you so much, SOGS, for allowing us and giving us an opportunity to chair the session. Thank you. Thank you. I request our chairpersons and Dr. Anjali, ma'am, to please felicitate Dr. Amol Lunkar, sir. Thank you. Uh, without a delay, we are starting our second session. For this session, I request uh, Bahubali Doshi sir and Dr. Priya Kademan. to please chair this session dr bahubali doshi sir he is one of the senior gynecologist and obstetrician in solapur he is art consultant and director at navjeevan fertility center dr priya kade madam she is a leading gynecologist and obstetrician working at sunrise hospital over to you thank you hello Uh, i welcome one and all to this session and uh, i the first speaker for today is dr milin patil and uh, we all know him he is one of the best ivf consultant of solapur and i request him to give a talk on everything about iui dr milin patil Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the SOGS organizing team and the sponsors for such a wonderful CME. Today, I'll be talking on everything about IUI. I see a lot of residents here, so I'll be slightly modifying my talk accordingly. Uh, the slides I have there, of course, but they are very busy slides, so you can more concentrate on what I'm seeing. And if there's anything you need to ask or question anything, you can do it. No problem. So 
So IUI, as we all know, has been going on since many decades. It's a fairly old procedure, but of course, as the gonadotropins developed, the semen preparation techniques developed, so the success rate of IUI also went on increasing. Of course, with the monitoring with the ultrasound. <coughs> Now, uh, assisted reproductive technologies, they are considered an established therapy for the treatment of infertility in a multitude of clinical conditions. It embraces a wide scope of techniques, which of course includes IUI, IVF and ICSI. Now, intrauterine insemination is a common approach for many women presenting for fertility treatments. The rationale behind intrauterine insemination is increasing the gamete density at the site of fertilization. Now, contrary to IVF and ICSIs, uh, IOI is a fairly easy to perform, inexpensive and offers several advantages. So, it is like an assisted conception technique that involves the deposition of processed semen sample in the upper uterine cavity, overcoming the natural barriers to sperm ascent in the female reproductive tract. It is cost effective, non-invasive, first line of therapy for selected patients with functionally normal tubes and infertility due to cervical factor, uh, unovulation, ovulatory dysfunctions, mild to moderate, male factor, unexplained factors, immunological and of course ejaculated disorders or male sexual dysfunctions. With clinical pregnancy rates per cycle ranging from approximately 10 to 20 percent. It however has limited use in patients with moderate to severe endometriosis where we have, we have severe male factor infertility, tubal factor infertility and of course advanced maternal age more than 35 years of age. IO may be performed with or without ovarian stimulation. So coming to the indications of IO, I think many of people know it, I will be just brushing through this all. So the male factor infertility that includes disorders of semen density that is count, motility, morphology that is when the patient has mild oligo, asteno and teratozoospermia. Then you have immunological factors, eject, sorry, you have immunological factors. Can I go back? One slide. Okay. Yes. The immunological factors, ejaculative failures, mechanical factors like malform, urethra, hypospadia, sex, so these are all under the male factor. In the female factor, you have the cervical factor. Of course, cervical factors or the vaginismus, these are the, a little bit factors which we nowadays don't see because initially we used to do post tests, now which are outdated now. So these all maybe can be categorized roughly into the unexplained infertility. Then mild endometriosis and ovulatory dysfunction. Contraindications relative when uh, absolute RH blood factor incompatibility, medical conditions which may endanger a partner with heredity debate, dis disease, blocked tubes, active genital tract infection, relative contraindications which include severely abnormal semen parameters, multiple failures at inseminations, recent chemotherapy, radiotherapy, coexisting, multiple other factors leading to infertility, and of course, the older age of the woman. So, once we select the patient according to the indication, the next step is you do a baseline scan. You see that the endometrium is 4 mm or less and both the ovaries are at baseline. They don't have any cyst, they don't have any active corpus luteum. So, we can start with the stimulation and you have a better prognosis of IUI getting a pregnancy in that cycle. And then now, of course, then IUS can be done with or without ovarian stimulation, but obviously, Logically, if you stimulate and do an IUI, you have a better chance of pregnancy. So, natural ovarian cycle leads to significantly low pregnancy rates. The number of oocytes obtained following stimulation correlates positively with the ongoing pregnancy rate. One size fits all policy cannot be adopted. We all know that we cannot blanket, we cannot have a blanket therapy protocol, stimulation protocols for all. We have to individualize it and accordingly we have to do. So, the ovarian response is not same. To all, it depends upon the factors like age, BMI, ovarian reserve, PCOS, presence of endometriosis, demographic characteristics and of course, there are many times we have receptor polymorphisms where apparently normal young patient fails to respond and we don't know why it is happening. This is because of the receptor FSH or LH receptor polymorphism. Inherently, they are resistant to the FSH and LH drugs or the gonadotropins which we use. The use of the most suitable protocol brings out the best results, avoiding complications like OHSS or multiple pregnancy. So, IUI plus ovarian stimulation is effective in subfertile couples. 
So what are the drugs which we use for ovarian stimulations in IUI? Multiple drugs, you all are well accustomed to it. We use anti-estrogens like clomiphene, we use aromatase inhibitors like letrozole, we use tamoxifen, again an anti-estrogen. You can use adjuvants, lot of adjuvants that are according to the patient's condition, if you have PCOS, metformin, thyroid, etc. Then you have the different gonadotropins, you have the um, HMGs, purified, highly purified urinary, then you have recombinant FSH, recombinant LH. Of course, now we have a combination of recombinant FSH, LH in a single preparation also. Then you can add on agonist. Agonists are generally not used in IUS, we use more of antagonists if at all we want to use. And of course, the trigger will be an HCG which can be urinary or a recombinant one and bromocryptine. So this is a graph roughly predict, uh, depicting the success rate according to the stimulation the agents use. So it's roughly 8% when use only CC was used, CC with gonadotropins was 18% and only gonadotropins when it was used was 22%. So when you drop out CC from the gonadotropin regimen, what happens is the anti-estrogenic effect you all know is negated. So that has come out and so you will have a little bit of a better pregnancy rate. The rational being adding CC or letrozole to gonadotropins is to reduce the number of total doses of gonadotropin so it will be more economical to the patient. Not many patients do conceive with this protocol also but if they don't then you can always go on to gonadotropin only stimulation protocol. So these are the various studies which compared uh, different different um, protocols etc. In conclusion gonadotropin either alone or in combination with CC gives a higher pregnancy rates and a lower miscarriage rate following IUS and of course but then you ha always have the side effect of having multiple pregnancy or OHSs if you are not careful with the stimulation protocol. So GNRH antagonists also can significantly increase the clinical pregnancy rates, appear and decrease the premature luteinization. As we all know, when we start with gonadotropins or when we do a COS, so sometimes we have multiple follicles. The more the E2 levels you have, every individual woman has their own thresholds for the premature LH cells. So once the E2 level goes beyond a th certain threshold, then it may trigger a premature LH surge which may bring down either it lead to can cycle cancellation or will bring down your chances of pregnancy in that IUS cycle. So then once the follicles are formed, so in IUI the stimulation protocols should, they should be designed in such a way that we get two to three dominant follicles, not more than three at any cost, so that we have a better pregnancy rate but keeping down the multiple pregnancy rates. So uh, once that is achieved then uh, HCG will be administered when the dominant follicles are reached. So 2 to 3 dominant follicles between 18 to 20 mm is an ideal size to give the trigger and when the endometrial thickness is 7 mm at least. So you can give 5000, you can get 6.5 thousand or 10,000 units of uh, HCG which is sufficient enough. You can also use recombinant HCG but of course it doesn't have any different, um, it doesn't improve your pregnancy rates, only it increases your cost to it. So urinary HCG I think in a setup for IUI is good enough. Now the IUI is generally scheduled between 32 to 36 hours afterwards. Uh, there are many studies which say you do IUI at 32 hours, same say 36, 40 hours, 42 hours. But more or less, I'll tell you one thing: once you have, uh, you should define your that criteria for triggering it. The criteria for trigger, if it is fixed, you give HCG and try to do it between that window period because every woman responds to this HCG in a different way. Some may ovulate at 31 hours also. It happens with IVF also. We give a trigger and by the time we take for pickup, some have ovulated and some have delayed ovulation also. So by and large, we have to see that the in a current data set, uh, the maximum patient should fall in that right. So I think 32 to 36 hours should be reasonable enough to do a single sitting IUI. So the timing of IUI, 32 to 36 hours, I have already said, like, mm, then of course there are many small studies have come up saying that you can see the follicle rupture and do it and then it will increase your chances. Of course we do see the follicle monitoring, suppose the follicle is ruptured, we do IUI, even if it is not ruptured, we still go ahead with IUI, call the patient for the second day and see for the rupture. Sometimes in the late evening or night she may rupture, but then your sperms have to be deposited before the rupture because oocytes, once ovulation has occurred, we cannot not exactly predict how much time the oocyte is going to be viable in the body in vivo. So it is considered to be between 12 to 24 hours. So the safer side if we take 12 hours we have to time our IUI 
more accurately so you have a better chance of fertilization. Then coming to the preparation, uh, sperm preparations for you. Now semen contains all uh, prostaglandins, uh, leukocytes, round cells from the semen and vesicles, dead cell, dead sperms, which of course generate a lot of ROS, which may be detrimental to the existing sperms. So then the capacitation reduces, the motility goes down, and the overall potency of the semen sample to be inseminated will also go down. So we need to process the semen before inseminating. And of course, when you are inseminating directly in the uterus, with all these prostaglandins, cramping pain, vagal reactions may occur. So we have to process it. So there are various different methods for sperm preparation like we have a simple swim up, we have a simple wash also, swim up, swim down, single density, double density gradients, magnetic sorting, cotton wool filtration, etc. Practically we use two uh, semen wash processes. If it's a normal zoospermic sample, we go in for a simple swim up method or you can go for a density gradient. Evidence shows that a density gradient method, double layer I'm talking about, not a single layer is more better because it filters, the, sp the sperms vary in the specific gravity according to the DNA maturity or the DNA fragmentation or their motility. So good quality sperms with least possible DNA damage are filtered through the density gradient methods and you have a better cohort of sperms sitting down at the bottom of the tube which you can inseminate and have a better probability of pregnancy. So I feel density gradient is a better way to do it. Of course, swim up is also good in normal zoospermic patients. One thing we have to remember that the lesser the mechanical damage induced using less forces of G, using lesser minutes of a sperm separation, the better it is. It's a general dictum and accordingly to the media we are using, the manufacturer instructions that are you have to process the sample. So the mode of insemination, then IO is the most common method done using um, uh, by uh, using a 0.5 to 0.2 to 0.5 ml because we all know that uterine cavity is very small. It is hardly 0 0.2, 0 0.3 ml. The cavities are even if you put in more, either it will be you are perfusing the fallopian tubes or it will lead to a backflow of the semen. So 0.5, 2 to 0.5 sperm suspension into the uterus in, with a small flexible uh, soft catheter. Usually it is done without imaging guidance, but of course it's your choice. You can always use an ultrasound on guidance, it is not going to harm it. In fact, maybe if you feel more confident, if you feel you are negotiating the cervical canal, the anti-flexion, retroflexion, right-left deviations, more better with it. In, you are reducing the trauma, the, reducing the occurrence of blood on the tip of the catheter, the better it is. So you can always use an ultrasound guidance also for that. Because anyways, we are going to fill the bladder. We are making the bladder partially full so that we will be able to, we are straightening the uterine axis because acute antiflexion, acute retroflexion is going to hamper your chances of doing a non-traumatic IUR technique. So then it's attached, the IO catheter, which should be soft enough, it is attached to a simple 1 ml syringe, tuberculin syringe, insurance syringe. And in a fully awake patient in dorsal lithotomy position, you can use any cuscos, you can use pedestrians, bivalve speculum, expose the cervix, clean the cervix, normal saline. Don't brush the cervix roughly because the more you're going to stimulate the cervix, you are inducing more uterine contractions. Though it's a semen preparation, you will like to have more and more semen deposited in the uterine cavity. So a better cohort will swim towards the fallopian tube, towards the oocyte for fertilization. So minimum handling of the cervix is also needed. In general, you do any IVF procedure or any fertility procedure, you have to be patient and you have to have you have to do it very soft hands. That is very important. Anything rough will bring down your pregnancy rates. So after excess vaginal secretion are wiped out, then thin flexible catheter is passed into the uterine cavity and the sperm sample suspended in less than one ml. It's usually 0.2 to 0.3 only, not even 0.5. And uh, which is of course washed, is then gently expelled high into the uterine cavity. After the IUI um, is done, once it's pushed, you have to slowly withdraw the catheter because if you suddenly withdraw it, it'll create a negative suction and along with the catheter, your sample, major of sample may come out. So you have to do it very slowly, you have to come out and then just ask the patient to lie down for 10-15 minutes and after that she can carry on her routine activities. No restrictions whatsoever. Natural cycle versus COS, sometimes in older patients people do do natural cycles but in general for the vast majority of the patients it's always better you use COS that gives better results because more number of oocytes you have, more better sperms you have deposited at the same time of ovulation, you will have a better mathematical probability of getting pregnancy. So then about the luteal phase support, now IUS is done, then what next? 
So luteal phase support, is it really necessary in stimulated IUS cycles? Yes, progesterone is absolutely necessary for the establishment and maintenance of pregnancy. We have seen whenever in the absence of progesterone or when we give anti-progestin agents, the endometrium remains hostile to implantation and pregnancy cannot occur. The minimum amount of progesterone required for the maintenance of pregnancy is still unknown. Uh, so many studies have been done, widely used. We have using luteal phase. Everybody uses luteal phase, though we discuss everything on stage, but we have seen people using luteal phase. So the effects of LPS in IUS cycles are still unclear. Limited studies regarding the necessity of LPS treatment in stimulated IUS cycles. Based on the results of these studies, it appears to be beneficial to support the luteal phase in gonadotropin stimulated IUI cycles that yield more than one follicle. Maybe there may be some role, some role, especially when you have more number of follicles, especially when you are using gonadotropins. So there is still a need for further trials to evaluate the effectiveness of LPS exactly and which, whether it will reach a statistical significance or not. So of course you know all the various preparations which are used for luteal phase support. You can use injectable progesterones, you can use vaginal gels, you can use vaginal suppositories also. Then coming to the question of single versus double IUA, whether we should go for a single IUA or a double IUA. Again, there were a lot many studies, controversial studies, some saying benefits, some saying no benefits, some saying favoring single IUA, etc. So if we come uh, to the conclusion of this all, uh, of course this was a Cochrane library also, um, which we got a database. A single IUA is acceptable to couples when semen quality is adequate, especially if it is a normosospermic sample or if it is a donor insemination. On the one hand, there was no significant difference between double IO and single IO for these couples. The cost of double insemination is also high. You have more load on your andrology lab, etc. And when you don't have any evidence of doing a double IO, it will increase your pregnancy rate. Maybe there may be some role, especially in couples with a male factor fertility, which could benefit from double IO. Because it seems to trend towards a better pregnancy rate. It's not statistically significant, but it trends to a better pregnancy rate. However, more acidities are needed to prove it. Uh, then, of course, once we do all this, patient gets pregnant, not get pregnant, then we start evaluating ki what's actually going on. So whenever you say to the patients, we'll do about three IOS, okay, how many number of IOS to be done? Generally, three, maximum four IOS, three to four IOS, we shouldn't go beyond that because if at all a patient has to get pregnant with whatever indication she has, 95% of the patients who at all have to get pregnant will get pregnant in the first three cycles. 97 in 4 4 cycles. So, after 4th cycle, it will be only 2% chance. So, it is a waste of time, energy, money if you are going for more than 4 cycles. So, 3 cycles at the most, if the young patient is young, the duration of infertility less, all the parameters are good, you can go in for a 4 cycle of IUS. After that, I think you have to need to move on to the more um, higher ART treatments. So there are various variables influencing the success rate of IUS. I've enumerated. It's a very busy slide, actually. So, so of course, male and female factors we can categorize. Like semen analysis is very important. What we call it as the total motile sperm count. So whenever we assign any patients to IUIs or ovulation inductions or IVF, basically only on semen parameters. Generally, what I do is I, if the TMSC there is total motile sperm count more than 10 million per ejaculate, assign her for ovulation induction. Of course, if other factors are normal, between five to 10 is IUI and less than 5 is generally for IVF. Of course, we can also go by the in total inseminating motile sperm count at the end of the post-wash. It should be at least 1 million. If it is 5 million, the more the uh, to, um, inseminating sperm count at the end of the post-wash, the better will be the prognosis. But the absolute cutoff for IUI should be 1 million. You shouldn't go, you shouldn't do an IUI if the motile, inseminating motile sperm count is less than 1 million per ejaculate. Then of course sperm DNA, hypoosmotic test, anti-sperm, only looking at the sperm morphology like Dr. Amol said, sometimes morphology is not everything. Majority of the, it does correlate, but then sometimes it doesn't. And so when we have some certain patients who are not responding the way they should, or we are not getting pregnancies, then we should go for more detailed analysis of these tests. So in the female factors, we have maternal age, most important duration of infertility, and of course the associated other female fertility factors. So these are all the factors, I have already enumerated these all. So in the clinical management of a selected infertile couple should be performed in an expedited manner taking into consideration the age of the woman, 
duration, the etiology, and the motile fraction of the sperm. Of course, the, the etiological factor means it should be a non-tubal uh, factor. Then the pros and cons of IUI. What are the pros of IUIs? Less equipment is necessary, less easy method, less complex, less invasive, more physiological, less expensive, reduced psychological burden, good couple compliance as uh, dropout, low, uh, of course the dropout rate is low, low risk for OHSS, thromboembolism, low to moderate, multifetal pregnancy rates uh, with, um, if you use uh, milder stimulation. What are the cons? Success rate obviously is less. You have less uh, success rate, like I told you, if the inseminating motile sperm count is less than 1 million, success rate will be less if the morphology of sperm is less than 5%. And high, of course, 4% is what we take. If it is less than that, maybe 1%, 2%, or you have a global oligo zoospermia, like we call it as. So there, obviously, it will be less. And a high multiple pregnancy rate if gonadotropin have been used and more stimulation has occurred. And of course, the risk for uh, anti sperm antibodies. This, I think, is a very theoretical risk. Complications are very rare, but then do we should know what it is. So pelvic infection, vasovagal reaction, allergic, anti-sperm antibodies. Pregnancy-related, multiple pregnancies, of course, before pregnancy, OHS is also one of the complications. Of course, the complication of the COS, then multiple pregnancies, spontaneous abortion, and then ectopic pregnancy. So new dawn in IO as a first-line op uh, opinion, uh, as an uh, option. So there has been a lapse in the progress of IUF, particularly in improving clinical pregnancy rates as witnessed in IVF and ICSI practices. Now the Cochrane reviews dismiss multiple pregnancy rates in IUI if you are using a COS in a very proper controlled way. New evidence strongly supports the IUI procedure as a first line treatment option. IUI procedure increases chance that maximum number of healthy sperm reach the site of fertilization. Of course, there are some uh, contraindications, we all know, cervical stenosis, cervicitis, endometritis, moderate to severe en uh, uh, endometriosis, endometritis, then severe male factor. Uh, only consecutive ejaculate qual uh, qualities in subfertile males also support in-depth analysis for the subfertile males. So, in summary, uh, are you a, of course, I just missed one point. When we use the stimulations, we can categorize in, in low responders, normal responders, and PCO responders. You can use a combination of clomiphene, letrozor alone, or in combination with gonadotropins. You can start simultaneously. You can start on day three, day four of the oral ovulation, or you can end the oral ovulation and then start. Now, this all adjustment we do after seeing the patient. She's a high responder. Don't do it simultaneously. Start a little bit late. The earlier you start, the more chances are you're getting more number of follicles. Of course, then in chronic, uh, we use uh, in gross PCOs like 40 AFCs on each side, 40, 40, 50, 50. We can go for chronic low dose step up protocol where we start with the lowest minimum possible dose, maybe 37.5, 50. Give it for seven days. See the response. If it is go, if the follicle lead follicle goes beyond 10 mm, then you hold the dose, continue the dose. If it doesn't, then increase by half the dose. So 37.550, you can make it 112.5, 150, etc. But 225, I think, is the maximum dose where you can give it. So in these patients, you have to be very careful. You have to have patience. Don't increase the dose within less than seven days because that is the time which is required so that you'll have you have to target for a monofollicular development especially in these PCO patients. So summarizing IUI is a simple non-invasive and cheap uh, treatment modality which can be used as a first line treatment in most of the subfertility cases including mild male subfertility. It is a first line therapy for cervical factors, anovulatory infertility, moderate, it's not moderate, mild to moderate, uh, male factor, unexplained infertility, immunological infertility with clinical pregnancy rates between 10 to 20 percent, control over in hyperstimulation, of course, with close monitoring of folliculogenesis and ovulation to avoid adverse complications like OHSs, multiple pregnancy, may be used to obtain adequate number of follicles. The future of IUI is promising if every IUI cycle is optimized. The pregnancy rates can be higher if most cycles were performed with two cycles, with two follicles. We have to target for about two to three follicles using HMGs, which also allows for a greater thickness of endometrium compared to CC cycles. The use of consecutive ejaculate is a new concept in overcoming the male factor problems in IUI. For patient, the largest benefit is the least intrusive and least psychologically demanding procedure, and one which can benefit a much bigger subfertile global population. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milin. It was really elaborate. And uh, I have only two questions for you. Uh, one is, 
if the end what is the endometrium cutoff for IUI cycle that are you you are using in your clinic and what if there is a cervical stenosis when you take the patient for IUI do you dilate it at that time or when do you dilate in the next cycle uh, the first question is about the endometrial Endometri thickness Generally, it should be at least in, of course, IVF in FED cycle, we take it as 6.5, but for year, when it's not down-regulated, I think 7 mm should be good enough. But now many times we try to see that the endometrial thickness is 7 mm on the day of trigger. But I feel trigger is not the day of implantation. You're going, going to give the trigger. 36 hours, she's going to ovulate. After that, she goes to fertilize. So the blast will be implanting after so many days. So whenever you are measuring the endometrial thickness, I think sometimes even at 6 also, 5 also, I give the trigger. Because I know that it's not going to, I'm giving the trigger and the embryo is not going to implant that day. So we have to project it this way. So ovulation, fertilization, blastosis, coming into the cavity and then implanting. So at the time of implantation, if it is 7 mm, it is good. See, you can get pregnancies even less than 7 mm, then the statistical probability goes down a lot. So ideal will be 9.1 to 10 mm, but then at least 7 mm should be cut off on the day of the implantation. So we have to project it like that, that way. And the second question was? Uh, cervical stenosis. Cervical stenosis. I personally believe there is no such thing as a cervical stenosis unless cervical colonization has been done, unless some surgical injury has been induced. Naturally, you cannot have cervical stenosis. So what we define is actually it is an acute antiflexion of the cervical canal, retroflexion, etc. So we try to force it and try to negotiate it. But if you do a hysteroscopic guidance dilatation, sometimes I try to dilate, it doesn't go. Then I just put a hysteroscope, see where it is, define it. And if you accordingly put your dilators, the least possible first, you will be easily able to dilate it. So it is more of the shape which is more important. You, you can also uh, wait and take the patient after full bladder. The, the uterus exactly. becomes exactly. the canal and all exactly. that. And many a times changes. I uh, generally do laparoscopy, hysteroscopies before I used to document yeah, the yeah. patency of the tube. So in that, uh, generally I am not a much of uh, uh, ardent so of this of of hysteroscopy. Mm -hmm. I like to dilate it till Hikar's eight. So that I know, ki I know the dilator effect will not remain much, but at least we have that much so that the future I years or it is will be more easier for us that way. Yeah. Thank you, Milin. Everyone uh, here, I mean the previous chair persons have started uh, in terms of, I mean, giving uh, similes of cricket. Uh, one day, two day, I mean, uh, opening batsman. So, I am tempted to say, here is a Jadeja, who can uh, play in test cricket, who can uh, be in 2020, 50 over, he can take catches, he can take wickets, and everything. Thank Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Uh, my personal uh, opinion about IUI, I mean, for the, uh, for all those who are, who are not in IVF or something, IUI has become the most popular uh, uh, modality of treatment after ventral suspension. Once upon a time, everyone was doing ventral suspension and now everyone is doing IUI. IUI is both frustrating to the patient and to the uh, clinician. In my opinion, it is one of the most inefficient method of treating infertility. You can do IUI only one uh, to just know uh, before you take her for… I am not suggesting every patient you should take for IVF. But uh, you need not have uh, uh, clomiphen plus uh, timed intercourse or uh, uh, then, uh, no, it has not worked. So uh, two, three cycles of IUI and then if not possible or successful, then go to IVF. It's not like that. Even in first consultation, you can tell the patient that you need IVF. You should be bold enough to... Uh, say that and it all depends upon the age of the patient, the married life, the previous treatment, her parameters, semen parameters, endometrium and all that. So unfortunately uh, the patients after 
IUI with one uh, consultation, consultant, they go to another, same letrozol, same clomiphene, same SCG, keeps on going on and on and on and the, when the patient comes to uh, uh, ART clinic, they have exhausted both oocytes and money. So, this is a humble uh, suggestion to those. You must assess the patient and decide whether you are really going to give any extra benefit to the patient or refer her. Right. I mean, this is my opinion. I have been seeing uh, files, uh, thick files. I don't say that every IVF patient gives success, but IUI is, in my opinion, a very inefficient uh, method of treatment. There's one more thing to IUI as compared to IVF. IVF, I see, is, is like a diagnostic and a therapeutic DNC sometimes we perform. In IVF, you have nearly four times the success rate of IVF, IUI, and plus, you come to know whether she's at least getting fertilization. You're getting fertilized embryos. The embryos are growing day three, day five. And as you said, even with a good blastosis, you have about 20, 30, 40 percent chances of aneuploidy. So this at the cellular level, we'll never know in IUS. We just feel, ki, oh, the, oh, the follicle is there, it's rupturing, I'm doing IUS. Why is she not conceiving? The for, for counseling, I give a simile. I'm very fond of giving illustrations. So I say, it is like marrying a woman or a girl by just looking a photo. And in IVF, you marry a girl whom, or a boy whom you have seen. Right. It's the difference like that. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Milit. We are already late. And so... Thank you. Thank you. I request uh, Anjali Jamma, ma'am, and our chairpersons to please felicitate Milin Patil, sir. Hello, uh, can we start the next lecture which is on immunology in infertility? Dr. Mohan Raut is online. He is going to talk on immunotherapy in infertility and this is the most uh, less read topic and so we will be obliged to listen to you and take some tips and tricks as to how we can use immunotherapy in infertility. Thank you very much, uh, respected chairpersons, for the introduction and my dear friends. It is indeed my pleasure to speak here at this conference uh, on basics and nuances in infertility at Sholapur uh, Obstetric Gynec Society. In fact, in 2018, I was here invited by Dr. Milin Shah. Uh, for uh, his conference. After that, I missed one invitation by Dr. Monica, but this time I didn't want to miss, but I was not in, I was in, uh, I rather I am in Goa, and I'm thankful to the society for allowing me to speak like this online uh, to all of you, and it is indeed a pleasure for me. So uh, I will uh, start uh, sharing my presentation. Can you uh, see the presentation? Yes, sir.
So today I am going to speak on a little unusual topic, as uh, our chairperson said, uh, that is immunotherapy in infertility. Now, infertility is the basis basic of our basis of our practice uh, for generations. Our infertility is one of our major, you can say, uh, ailments which we treat in OPD and. There are various aspects to it. So today, the aspect which we are going to discuss is little unusual. And I will be dealing with different aspects of the immunological problem in uh, pregnancy. And with more focus on the alloimmune part, I will brush upon the other immunological problems. Before that, I'm thankful to my alma mater, KM Hospital and St. GS Medical College and our teacher, Dr. Usha Krishna, for her support. Now, this is the usual problem that we face. Treating a patient, a patient of infertility is always difficult, especially when the treatment fails. The uh, ovulation induction cycle fails, the IUI fails, or IVF fails. So the patient, and this is what we have to face every time. So before going into the details of infertility and immunology, I would like to just mention one important aspect that the current pregnancy loss and infertility are considered as two sides of a coin. And this has been elaborated by paper by Dr. Kumar in his article on in Austin Journal of Obstetric Gynecology. And why? Because the in both these conditions, many of the times the underlying etiologies, diagnosis, treatment are similar. And therefore, it is very important to discuss the entire aspects, all factors that are responsible for these problems and including the immunological aspects. And it is very important to consider this significant part of the infertility causation. So today my talk is going to be in three parts. Immunotherapy and infertility, why, when, and how. So let us see in the next 18 minutes uh, how we can do justice to this topic. Before going further, this is an interesting statistics from the uh, uh, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, which has given the total number of couples in the childbearing age group. And from that, we can derive the number of patients who have infertility and who have unexplained infertility, and the numbers are staggering. According to statistics, there are 213 million couples are in childbearing age group, of which if you consider 15% infertility, there are 32 million couples with infertility. Now, if you just consider 5% of these couples are doing IVF, it's a conservative number, still 1.6 million couples are doing IVF. And as you know, 10%, uh, almost 50% uh, 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 IVF and 50% of unexplained cases, cases can be uh, failures or unexplained. And then that comes, number comes to around close to 80 lakhs. So this is the number that we are tackling. And so we should have to consider different aspects of the uh, infertility etiology. Now, it has been shown that as much as 40% of unexplained infertility may be the result of immune problem and as high as 80% of unexplained pregnancy loss. So, the incidence is very high. The immune infertility in terms of reproductive failure has become a serious health issue and involves around one in five couples of reproductive age group. Now, there are different causes of immune infertility. I will just touch upon a few and then we will go to the alloimmune part on which we have been working for the last so many years. The immune factors, there are four types of causes. One is the role of seminal fluid, role of mucosal immunity in genital tract, role of autoimmune antibodies, and role of uh, alloimmune rejection. In case of seminal fluid, it has uh, seminal fluid has built-in mechanism preventing an immunological sensitization of the female against the sperm as well as the seminal structures. And this protective system is important and it exists due to the presence of immune inhibitors which originate in the male sex accessory organs like the prostate. Then there is role of mucosal immunity. It is influenced by the level of natural and specific antibodies, cytokines and hormones. The third is role of autoimmune antibodies the anti-sperm antibodies and anti-ovarian antibodies, and fourth is the role of alloimmune rejection. The autoimmune disease, the orchitis and oophoritis, occurs when the balance is tipped in favor of pathogenic self-reactive T cells, 
either by depletion of the T regulatory cells or activation of pathogenic self reactive T cells where the loss of self recognition is lost. The autoimmune disease related to testes is the two types, the two autoantigens, the testes specific, which induce orchitis, and aspermatogenic, that is the induced destruction of germ cells and decrease the sperm production. The autoimmune orchitis may lead ultimately to testicular atrophy and necrosis. But more important to us is the ovary. Development of autoantibodies to oocytes of developing follicles, zona pellucida, granulosa cells, thica cells, luteal cells, and receptors for HCG are known. Immune oophoritis is characterized by massive atresia of the follicles, followed by perivascular mononuclear cell infiltration, and this leads to premature ovarian failure. And the possible cause of uh, role of IVF in this, very important to note, that ovarian hyperstimulation before in vitro fertilization can have a role in inducing autoimmunity. And second, more important, repeated ovarian trauma for oocyte retrieval before IVF also leads to development of ovarian antibodies and can cause ovarian atresia or decrease sudden decrease in AMH. So now we come to the important part that is the alloimmune cause for infertility. So what is this alloimmunity? All of you know immunity, alloimmunity is the immune response against the antigens belonging to the same species. Now in pregnancy, fetus is always a, a, what is known as a semi-allograft or partial graft. The embryo and the gestational tissue have foreign antigens derived from the from father, they're different from maternal antigens. And as the fetus gets this 50% of MHC genes from a genetically non-identical father, the fetus is termed as semi-allograft or partial graft. So as per the transplantation theory, the foreign antigens expressed by the fetoplacental unit should be acted upon by the uh, uh, antibodies from the mother's side uh, because they are the transplantational antigens and they will stimulate graft rejection in the mother, but this doesn't happen normally. It's a very significant phenomenon, and this is also known as paradox of pregnancy, and pregnancy continues without any problem. And in IVF, we know the pregnancy is 100% different if you use donor egg or donor embryo. So this is a significant phenomenon which gets disturbed and leads to problems. So alloimmune rejection in early pregnancy, causing preclinical miscarriages, that leads to unexplained infertility. We don't know whether it was implantation failure or it's a preclinical miscarriage or a clinical miscarriage which leads to secondary infertility. Now you know that there is there are two parts of immune system. One is the activation part, uh, activating part, and the second is the part that leads to tolerance. And there is an intricate balance between the two. What is also known as the Th1, which is activation, Th2, which is uh, tolerance. Now, both these are important because the activation part is an important uh, response against pathogens that will save us and that saves us from uh, diseases, while the tolerance part protects us from uh, building response against ourselves, that is our, our own cell, that is the autoimmunity, and building responses against certain alloantigens like the pregnancy. Now, this immunological equilibrium is important for protection against autoimmune and alloimmune responses. And any disturbance in this equilibrium will lead to either autoimmune or alloimmune disorder. And now over the last 25, 30 years, it has been absolutely clear that a large percentage of unexplained reproductive failures, be it repeated miscarriages or implantation failure, may be due to alloimmune cause. And it has been seen that more the number of miscarriages, more the uh, duration of infertility, which is unexplained, more likely the cause is immunology. Uh, you, are, you can hear me, right? Okay. I hope you, are, you, you can hear me. Hello. Okay. Uh, the next uh, part is immunotherapy in infertility. Now, immunotherapy, when? The next part is when? The diagnosis of alloimmune factor uh, the first part is uh, you have to rule out all known causes. Now, diagnosis of alloimmune factor can be done using certain tests. What are these tests? These tests, these, sorry, these tests are lymphocyte cross match, 
or uh, LAD or APCA, that is anti paternal uh, antibodies, cytotoxic antibodies. Second is natural killer cells in the peripheral blood. Third is natural killer cells in the endometrial cavity. Fourth is T Rex cell estimation. Fifth is TNF alpha. And last is TH1 TH2 ratio. There is one more recent investigation to it about which I am going to elaborate a little bit, and that is immune profiling of the endometrium. The next is natural killer cells in the peripheral blood. We estimate CD3 and CD1656. A high CD3 and low CD1656 have been associated with recurrent miscarriages and recurrent implantation failures. The next is T regulatory cell estimation. As you know, T regulatory cells play an important part in the tolerance mechanism to prevent rejection of pregnancy. And their estimation can be done to know whether aluminum problem exists. Though we don't have these tests here in India, but estimating T regulatory cells before procedure and after procedure can tell us that uh, the problem is aluminum rejection of pregnancy. The more important test that we do is endometrial NK cells. Now, this is a very significant. Uh, investigation which can help us to select couples who really require immunotherapy in the patients who have infertility. Here, uh, the endometrial biopsy is done in the UTL phase. The uh, between the 19th to 23rd day of the cycle, endometrium is collected in formalin and is sent for immunohistochemistry for CD57 cells. These are a type of natural killer cells which are converted from CD56 cells, which are now normally present in endometrium. And presence of CD57 cells in the endometrium is indicative of immunological problem and the patient requires immunotherapy. A large meta-analysis of 22 studies done by Srividya Seshadri and Shankara have also shown that increased peripheral NK cell number in unexplained infertility and recurrent miscarriage patients and even their cell percentage is also high. One more important test that can help us to find out whether aluminum problem is there is estimation of a cytokine called as TNF alpha. Now, TNF alpha is a cytokine produced by natural killer cells, and high levels are detrimental to pregnancy. In women who have multiple IVF failures, it has been shown that the TNF alpha level, levels are invariably high, and that leads to uh, implantation failure and it inhibits the formation of placenta. The raised level of TNF alpha with history of unexplained recurrent implantation failure indicate aluminum problem and immunomodulated treatment, including lymphocyte immunization therapy, about which I'm going to tell you soon, will be beneficial. In the studies conducted by Daher and Kim, they also showed uh, high levels of TNF alpha in patients who have RPL or recurrent pregnancy loss. Now coming to the endometrial immune profiling. Now this is a very interesting investigation was put forward by Natalie Lady from France, and it helps in personalizing the immunotherapy treatment in patients who have either repeated pregnancy loss, infertility, or IVF failures. According to this uh, uh, immune profiling, the endometrium is profiled into four groups by estimating the in, uh, immunological pattern of the endometrium and divided into four groups. The first is there is no dysregulation, Second is there is low activation, third is uh, overactivation, and fourth is mixed profile. And accordingly, the uh, method of immunotherapy, that is endometrial scratching, uh, immuno lymphocyte immunization therapy, or other forms of immunotherapies are selected because it is very uh, logical that someone who, which, who has low immune activation, endometrial scratching will work, but if there is over immune activation and endometrial scratch is done, it will not be helpful and therefore it is labeled as endometrial scratch is not useful. So proper selection is important. Similarly, with low immune activation, uh, methods like lymphocyte immunization therapy or use of GC GCSF will be useful. So this immune profiling will help us to select the modality of immunotherapy so that we get the best results. Now, once we know whom to give immunomodulation, how will you give? So there are various ways of giving immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is basically the treatment which modulates the immunological response, and it is of two types, active immunotherapy and passive immunotherapy. Active immunotherapy is when, where you give uh, the uh, 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 immunomodulatory agent 
and which induces certain changes in the body, like it produces certain protective cells and antibodies and protects the pregnancy. While passive immunotherapy is you give some chemical or some medicine which directly acts on the pregnancy and prevents the immunological rejection. So this is a big list, uh, starting from lymphocyte immunization therapy to immunoglobulins, steroids, intralipids, heparin, aspirin, and various combinations. So I'm not going into the details of all, but we will focus on one of these treatment that is, this is the only one treatment which is active immunomodulation and that is lymphocyte immunization therapy. Now this is a treatment which was in practice for a long time and there are various ways people had been trying this or doing this and it induces immuno active immunomodulation. How let us see. This is a simple method, uh, a daycare procedure which is done, uh, the, the, it takes around three to four hours. That it can be done at any part of the cycle, not related to menstruation. And it basically it involves separation of lymphocytes from the husband's or donor's blood by a specific method and uh, with a specific concentration of lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes are injected intradermally in wife. This induces certain immunological responses and which leads to protection of pregnancy. How we'll see soon. The precautions are prior immunological testing, which I have told should be done. Prior infection profile is required, blood group and anti, uh, RH uh, is required because if wife is RH negative, husband is positive, anti D is given. The couple is asked to plan pregnancy four to six weeks after the therapy and preferably within one year. The effect lasts for almost 18 months. In certain centers abroad, booster doses are given during the first trimester of pregnancy, though we do not give. But we do give this first dose even in early pregnancy if the couple presents uh, in early in pregnancy with history of miscarriages, long-standing miscarriages. Now, how does this therapy act? Now, they, there are various mechanisms which are put forward. The most common mechanism is the development of certain type of protective antibodies called as blocking antibodies. It enhances the development of these blocking antibodies. They're also called as asymmetric antibodies in pregnancy by uh, uh, and these are produced because of the expo intentional exposure by, of the uh, lymphocytes to the maternal, allogenic lymphocytes to the maternal immune system. And this, these blocking antibodies, they compete with the symmetric antibodies, which are responsible for the rejection of pregnancy. They compete with the symmetric antibodies so that the pregnancy, there is no uh, destruction or no rejection of pregnancy. T regulatory cells play a very important role in this, the... Uh, what uh, happens is when the uh, lymphocytes are injected intradermally, they are picked up by dendritic cells and they are presented to the maternal immune system in lymph nodes and spleen, which leads to proliferation of lymphocytes, specific type of lymphocytes called as T-regulatory cells and certain B cells which produce the blocking antibodies. And when there is subsequent exposure with pregnancy, these blocking antibodies compete with the uh, uh, symmetric antibodies to prevent the uh, rejection of pregnancy along with T regulatory cells. Is this therapy safe? Because it appears invasive. You take out something from a blood and inject into the other person. The, there are minor allergic side effects, occasional malaise, but there is no serious allergic reaction, no graft versus host disease. Our experience is similar. Uh, more For more than 1,500, 1,600 that we have performed, there is not, none of these reactions have been seen. In fact, in a large study by Kling in 2005, of 4,500 cases, there were no case of anaphylaxis, autoimmune disease, or graft versus was disease reported in these patients. So if it is so good and it is useful, why it is not being used? So LIT has a very um, long past and why the law, many ups and downs and there are a lot of controversy. So I just touch upon a few so that we will know why this was not used and now why it is being used. So in 1999, there was a large multicentric study uh, called OVER study, which was published in the Lancet and which showed that lymphocyte immunization therapy is of no use in patients. This was for patients with repeated miscarriages. So uh, no use. The control group had better uh, success than the treatment group as shown here. So, but this study had a lot of flaws. This was the only study till date which has shown negative effect of LIT. But it had used stored lymphocytes, which reduces the immunomodulatory efficacy of lymphocytes. 
it did not exclude the uh, autoimmune disorder, disorder patients with autoimmune disorders. Therefore, the success rate was hampered. There was lack of standardization. The dose was not clear. The routes were not uniform. So there were a lot of flaws, but this was the basis for subsequent Cochrane reviews, which, uh, which said that immunomodulation or immunotherapy is of no use in infertility or miscarriage. And the Cochrane meta-analysis showed uh, an odds ratio of only 1.22 which was aptly saying that it is of no use. But when over study was removed, the odds ratio increased to 1.63. But what was more interesting was the newer meta-analysis which were done in 2016, 17, and now in 21. With newer studies, they have shown the odds ratio close to more than three. Like in 2016, it was 4.2. That is, success rate is four times more than control. In 2017, 3.1. So success rate is more than 3.1 per time. Uh, so these newer studies are pointing that lymphocyte immunization therapy has a role to play in these difficult to treat patients. There are many other studies, a few of them I would like to mention. Well, check uh, in 2003, treated uh, patients who had two failed IVFT cycles and the result showed a 70% success rate, pregnancy rate compared to 45% and a delivery rate of 51% compared to 16% and showed positive results after 80. Killing in 2014, in his study, uh, he followed up these patients uh, who were who had recurrent IV failures after LIT for two years, and he showed that 65% had women had achieved at least one pregnancy, 54% had delivered or were in late pregnancy. Of all pregnancies, 76% were after 80, 20% spontaneous, and 4% by ovulation induction. And those women within uh, 36 years, the success rate of LIT was elevated by almost a quarter, 25% in the first six months itself. And one more study by Motag. Uh, uh, in this study, uh, 100 patients with RPL and RIF were treated and it showed a pregnancy rate of 44% compared and a live birth, birth rate of 30%, indicating beneficial effect. But everything is not green. Uh, everything is not good. Actually, in a big meta-analysis in November 2018, he published in Fertility and Sterility, and it, there was a systematic review of 30 randomized controlled trials uh, satisfying the selection criteria, and the meta-analysis was carried out over these studies, and it showed no role of immunotherapy, including LIT, in improving the live birth rate of women who are undergoing IV. So yes, uh, still we require more uh, proof. What is our experience? Uh, in our center, which was established nine years back, uh, one of our uh, uh, papers we presented at the American Society of Reproductive Immunology Conference at Shanghai uh, with Chinese Society of Immunology. 65 cases of unexplained recurrent implantation failure were treated with LIT. All investigations were done to rule out the cause. Prior infection profile was done and husband's lymphocytes were used as a single sitting procedure. And at that time, at the time of presentation, 48 patients conceived within one year, 44 after ART, four spontaneously. The clinical pregnancy rate was 73.8%. And two pregnancies ended in miscarriage, one second trimester miscarriage, one ectopic. The live birth rate was 67.7%. So the take-home message here, friends, is in unexplained infertility or even recurrent IVF failures, always consider immunological causes, especially when it is uh, when all, all the tests are normal. Uh, do immunological tests to rule out autoimmune or autoimmune, autoimmune you must have already done, so alloimmune factors. Use immunomodulation treatment. Use of immunomodulation treatment during pregnancy to prevent miscarriage. The big list which I showed, once the patient conceives, the patient is put on passive immunomodulation using uh, uh, intralipids, uh, sometimes immunoglobulins, uh, hydroxychloroquine or steroids, as the case uh, may be, which can help in these patients. Before ending, I would, would like to give a word of caution that immunotherapy is not for everyone. Immunotherapy is only for a selected number of uh, patients who have this problem. And it is important to select these couples and give this uh, treatment. Otherwise, it becomes frustrating like any other treatment where, which we, where we don't get success. So we have to keep this thing in mind to uh, do the uh, investigation before end. And yes, there are still many things yet to come in the field of reproductive immunology. There are certain gray areas. Over the years, things will improve. But uh, according to me, we have to keep this factor in mind 
to help some of our patients who are so difficult to treat and we are not able to help them achieve their dream so before i end i would like to end with uh, the words of sir peter madaver who is considered as the father of reproductive immunology that the purpose of science is to change belief and if you believe that infertility implantation failure and recurrent miscarriages are god's will which are not treatable scientifically we will never try to find effective treatment and this sentence is very close to my heart and in every presentation i would like to say this so that it's not i'm i'm not here to change your uh, belief but yes i would want you to open up your minds to look at this problem in a different perspective so i am thankful to our uh, mentors dr kwak kim uh, dr manoj pande dr carolyn pulam and of course my wife dr mugda who is on the education committee of american society of reproductive immunology for her help and all these things we have condensed and put in our upcoming book which is coming next month about lymphocyte immunization therapy in reproductive failures uh, by springer nature publications and i am thankful to all the doctors patients who have put in trust in us and in lymphocyte immunization therapy to achieve their dream thank you so much thank you <coughs> uh, dr raut for making a very complicated subject very simple not more complicated uh i cannot uh, say it on <laughs> open the, the the subject itself is i mean uh, very difficult immunology itself usually we used to keep it for option but the recent advances which you have told are going to give uh, benefit to at least selected few and it is good to know what is happening in the field of immunology thank you so much thank you thank you sir i request to please accept this e trophy from solapur obijay society as it is a e felicitation thank you so much thank you sir thank you so much thank you there is a slight change in the uh, order uh, now dr madhuri patil is going to talk on managing resistance to oral ovulation in polycystic ovary uh, can i share my slides yeah please yeah i mean if they stop sharing i can share uh, because it's saying disabled uh so at the onset i would like to thank the solapur obijiva society for inviting me today to speak on uh, managing resistance to oral ovulations in pcos and i'm also very sorry to barge in between but uh, i have some commitments uh, and therefore i requested uh, dr anjali that uh, i could do my talk earlier so uh, all we know that uh, the three ovulogens uh, oral ovulogens which are used in pcos include letrozole which has a good evidence and it also uh, and it also has a good degree of recommendation and today it is considered as the first line of treatment for ovulation induction in women with pcos with anovulatory infertility and no other infertility factors to improve ovulation pregnancy rate as well as live birth rate clomiphene citrate has moderate grade of recommendation but very low quality evidence and could also be used in women with pcos with anovulatory infertility and no other infertility factors to improve ovulation and pregnancy rates and uh, use of tamoxifen is a clinical practice point which is a promising alternative to clomiphene citrate for ovarian stimulation in subgroup of patients who fail to develop an adequate endometrial uh, thickness so we need to change the treatment protocols with oral ovulations when six ovulatory cycles fail to in, uh, yield a pregnancy there's no ovulation with 
the maximum dose of clomiphene citrate, that is 150 milligrams, uh, letrozole 5 milligrams and tamoxifen 45 milligrams per day. And if the endometrial thickness is less than 7 millimeters at the time of ovulation, especially uh, in women who are being given clomiphene citrate. So the failure to ovulate uh, with oral ovulations may relate uh, may relate to several factors, and the competence and basically could be affected by high BMI, LH, free androgen index, and insulin levels. So you can see over here that persistent LH hypersecretion can result in altered activation of the meiotic process with meiot uh, with abnormalities in meiotic maturation. Uh, intra ovarian hypoandrogenism can result in uh, problems with epigenetic maturation, and they can also result in decreased calcium oscillations, uh, which can affect the cytoplasmic maturation and thus the oocyte quality. And hyperinsulinemia, which is a feature of polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome, can stimulate in excessive follicular recruitment, which can also affect the oocyte quality. And it has been observed that phenotype A and B are associated with resistance to ovulation induction and also lower the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate. Uh, it has been observed that CC resistance is also seen when there is FSH uh, SCR680 uh, polymorphism in PCOS. And uh, here you can see uh, the incidence uh, of, uh, uh, of SCR680 SCR, SCR is almost 28% when there is uh, resistance to clomiphene citrate as compared to ASN, ASN combination and ASN, SCR, uh, FSH receptor polymorph uh, polymorphism combination. Uh, so what do we do then when there is resistance? So if the woman is obese, lifestyle modification is the most important thing which we need to advise. If there is failure, that is, she's ovulating but not conceiving. We need to expand the diagnostic evaluation. And if it's already complete, then we can treat this patient with gonadotrophins. And if the patient is thin or has a very high androsinidion level and AMH level, probably laparoscopic ovarian drilling is the treatment. But if that fails, then one needs to go for IVF. In women who have resistance, we can suppress LH by using either oral contraceptive pills or progesterone. We could also use alternative protocols of clomiphene citrate and letrozole. Dexamethasone is used when the DHEs is high. If there is insulin resistance, impaired glucose tolerance, one could use insulin sensitizers like metformin and inositols, wherein inositols have very less of evidence. One could use gonadotrophins and laparoscopic ovarian drilling. And if all this fails, then one has to subject the patient to IVF. The treatment of choice basically will depend on the presence of other infertility factors, the available resources, as well as the risk tolerance of the patient. Coming to lifestyle factors that can affect the environment in which the gamete matures and the embryos implant, it had been observed that in the presence of obesity, the time to conception is increased by twofold. If the woman is underweight, that is low BMI, Again, the time to conception is increased fourfold. So you can see underweight increases the time to pregnancy much more than being obese. Uh, smoking and alcohol both increase the relative risk of infertility by 60%. Whereas use of illicit drugs and toxins increase the relative risk of infertility by 70 and 40% respectively. And that of use of caffeine of 250, more than 250, uh, milligrams per day decreases the fecundability by 45%. So what does lifestyle include? It does not only include diet, wherein you need to eat uh, healthy and avoid junk food. You have to include physical activity in daily routine at least five times a week for at least 30 minutes a day. We have to sleep adequately and at a proper schedule. And all, yeah, addiction is also one of the important a uh, weight loss of 5% of uh, can reduce the central fat up to 30% and improve the insulin sensitivity and also reduce the insulin resistance with restoration of ovulation and increase in fertility. Apart from the benefits for the metabolic disorders, pregnancy, miscarriage rate and uh, pregnancy related complications. Uh, in this study, which was published in 2011 in human reproduction, wherein they looked 
at uh, PCOS and obesity and what does the loss of intra-abdominal fat do? And it was seen that anovulatory women with PCOS and obesity who resume ovulation during a lifestyle program lose about 4 kgs more weight and 0.5 kgs more abdominal fat on DEXA than women who remain anovulatory. And this early and consistent loss of intra-abdominal fat is associated with resumption of ovulation. So it's not a peripheral fat, but it's basically the intra-abdominal uh, fat, which is basically related to hypoandrogenesemia that is very important because this in turn increases the insulin resistance as well as results in hyperinsulinemia. And according to the international guidelines, lifestyle uh, intervention is the first line of uh, treatment and it has uh, it has a moderate grade of like a recommendation with low grade of uh, evidence. Use of anti-obesity drugs are still considered uh, uh, experimental and uh, therefore should not be used. And uh, we uh, and pregnancy needs to be avoided if the anti-obesity drugs are used. Coming to extended clomiphene citrate treatment, which is given for two to ten days, uh, you can uh, see over here that. Uh, when you compare this group of patients with gonadotrophins, a uh, number of ovulating patients were much lower with extended gonadotrophin therapy. The number of follicles were also significantly lower. The dominant follicles were lower and the endometrial thickness was also significantly less when, as compared to gonadotrophin use. And if you look at the pregnancy rate, again, it was almost half that when you used gonadotrophins and therefore probably a gonadotrophin is much better option than giving clomiphene citrate for 10 days. There's another protocol which was, uh, uh, which was published in Reproductive uh, Medical Biology in 2018, which said that you can give intermittent clomiphene citrate treatment in PCOS women who are resistant to standard CC treatment, uh, wherein what they did is they gave uh, CC for five days then they did the scan and they waited for about almost seven days. And if they found that there was no follicular growth, they again started the clomiphene citrate, which was given for five days. And then again, they waited for five days and they found that there was no uh, response. They reinitiated the clomiphene citrate. And what they found that uh, uh, if uh, the, there was no response in, uh, in, the, in this uh, study in 26 patients after standard CC, they gave... Uh, uh, they gave first uh, repeated the clomiphene citrate and what they found that there was a response in three, but there was no response in the remaining 23. And when they gave the second CC, they found that there was a response in almost half of these 23, whereas the remaining 11 still remained unresponsive. And when they gave the third dose, again, they found that remaining half uh, responded, whereas the of almost five of the 23 did not respond. So it could be one of the options, but we know that CC remains in the system for a longer time. And therefore, probably uh, this type of uh, protocol should not be used. Uh, and the, this uh, study just looked at the response, but did not look at the clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rate, which should be the endpoint of any study. Then there was another, uh, another study, uh, which was published in Fertility Sterility 2019, which looked at combination of letrozole with clomiphene citrate, and they found that higher ovulation rate uh, was achieved as compared to letrozole uh, alone. And again, they did not look at the live birth rate, and therefore we need to evaluate the effect of live birth rate. And here you can see that the ovulation rate was more when it was combined. And if you look at the pregnancy rates, there was not much different. The, there was no significant increase in the pregnancy rate as well as the live birth rate. And therefore, uh, probably uh, it may not be very useful. And we, as a part of an international study committee, also studied uh, use of for combination of letrozole and clomiphene citrate. And we found that Though the ovulation rate uh, was my, uh, was higher as compared to letrozole alone, but the life, there was no difference in the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate. Then coming to addition of dexamethasone, 
uh, basically it is used to treat adrenal or mixed adrenal and ovarian hypoandrogenism. It is given in the dose of 0.25 milligrams at night from day 2 to 11 of the menstrual cycle and it suppresses basically the DHEs and preferably used when serum DHEs levels are more than 200 micrograms per DL and aim to reduce the concentration to less than 200 micrograms per DL. It is basically a off-label use for ovulation induction and has been proved to be effective as an adjuvant to CC in PCOS with CC resistance, high levels of DHEs and uh, in an RCT comparing CC with or without uh, dexamethasone. The ovulation rate after combined use was about 75% as compared to 15% alone with CC alone, which was statistically significant. And the pregnancy rate was also 40.5% after combined use as compared to 4.2 in a control. Uh, and this was also statistically significant. The Cochrane Review in 2009 also supports use of dexamethasone plus CC in CC resistant women. Coming to insulin sensitizers, we know that insulin uh, signaling is relevant to normal reproductive physiology and insulin resistance plays an important role in endocrinology and metabolic profile of PCOS. Insulin sensitizers target metabolic abnormalities to improve ovulation and fertility in women with PCOS. So what are these modes of action? So if you look at the metabolic, it decreases the lipid synthesis, gluconeogenesis, and glucose levels, and it increases the SHBG and LGL, LGDL levels. When it look at the endocrine effect, it has seen, uh, it has been shown that it decreases the insulin levels, the IGF-1 levels and androgen levels, because we know that hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistant decrease, uh, increase the IGF and IGBP-1, which in turn increase the androgen levels. It also has an anti-inflammatory effect with decrease in the TNF alpha and CRP levels and an anti-angiogenic effect with decrease in the VEGF levels. And that is how it prevents the occurrence of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It is also known to enhance the AMPK pathway and increase the IGF BP1 levels, which in turn decrease the hyperandrogenemia. And if you look at its effect on AMH, there were two study, uh, studies which were published. One was in Journal of uh, uh, Endo Endocrinology, Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism 2011, and they looked at the level uh, after six months and they found that uh, the decrease in the AMH levels were seen only in those women who were hyperinsulinemic, but not in those who had normal insulin levels. There was another article from the AIMS, which was published in uh, JHRS. And here they looked at not only at AMH, but also at uh, antral follicular count. Uh, and they looked at the values three months later after administration of metformin. And what they found that there was significant decrease both in the AMH levels as well as the antral follicular count. Uh, so the, it, uh, it is also known that probably it improved the mitochondrial function with improved oocyte and embryo quality uh, because it reduces the oxidative stress and also affects the DNA functioning in the cumulus oocyte complex. And according to the international guidelines, metformin could be used alone in women with PCOS with anovulatory infertility. But they should; these women should be informed that there are more effective ovulation induction agents. And this has a moderate rate of recommendation, but with a good quality of evidence. And they also said that if metformin is used for ovulation induction in women with PCOS for obese, uh, with anovulatory infertility, with no other infertility factors, CC could be added to improve the ovulation rate, clinical pregnancy rate, and live birth rate, which has moderate quality of recommendation with low quality of evidence. And uh, thus, it can be combined along with CC to improve both ovulation rate as well as the pregnancy rates. Coming to myoinositol, we know that it has several functions. And when we talk about PCOS, uh, it increases insulin sensitivity, decreases the total NLDL cholesterol, increases the HDL cholesterol and the serum and decreases the serum triglyceride levels. Whereas uh, when we talk about reproduction, it restores normal ovulatory activity, increases the oocyte and egg quality and the fertilization rate. And on the male factor, basically it has seen to have effect on the sperm motility as well. 
the it is important to know that we have to use the correct concentration as well as the correct dose for its effects to happen so the normal dose is about four grams per day and the myro um, myo inositol to dikyro inositol the ratio has to 440 is to 1 and uh, the tablets have lower uh, absorption and therefore basically it's used in sachets and uh, uh, and it has a good uh, it, uh, it has a good acceptability as well as compliance so this were, there were three papers which looked at the treatment of uh, inositol in an ovulatory woman as against placebo uh, or no treatment. And what they found that there was significant improvement in the ovulation rate. There was no, but there was no difference in the clinical pregnancy rate. And none of the studies uh, evaluated the live birth rate. And most of the studies had very low number of subjects and therefore the evidence cannot really be considered. They also found that there was significant decrease in the levels of androgens and increase in SHBG and decrease in the levels of fasting insulin, glucose, as well as HOMA, and they did not report any adverse reactions. And in this systemic review and meta-analysis, uh, they looked at the uh, effectiveness of myoinositol, and this was published in 2018 in the Endocrine Journal, and what they found that there is decrease in the testosterone and improvement in the insulin, uh, res uh, in the insulin resistance. Uh, there was another study in 2017 where they compared metformin versus myonacetol and what they concluded was that both treatments improved the glycoinsulinate features of obese PCOS patients, but only metformin seems to exert a beneficial effect on the endocrine and clinical features of the syndrome. So here you can clearly see that it did improve, both of them equally improved the fasting insulin levels, HOMA, uh, HOMA, as well as the testosterone levels. But if you look at the SHBG levels, only metformin was effective and metformin was also effective in decreasing the BMI of the patient. And according to the, uh, according to the international guidelines, inositol is still used as experimental therapy because the literature is limited and there are many key questions still that remain that remain unanswered. Then we could use ovulation induction protocols with gonadotropins where they could be used alone or in combination. And when used in combination, uh, the oral ovulation stimulate the recruitment of number of follicles and gonadotropins sustain the growth of the recruited follicles, wherein you can give these drugs from day two to six of the cycle and then add gonadotropins and then administer HCG at a follicular diameter of 18 millimeters. And when you're using gonadotropins, it's best to do an IUI because the pregnancy rate of gonadotropin and timed intercourse is just 8% as against 18 15 to 18% when we combine gonadotropins with IUI. We could also use a conventional step-up protocol, which has already been uh, discussed by uh, Dr. Milan Patil, and therefore I would not go into details and it's important for us to start a lower dose. And in a non-ART cycle, basically we start with a 37.5 to 75 IU, depending upon the BMI, and then the dose can be increased either by 50 or 100%. Uh, it is safer to use a low dose chronic protocol, uh, which will prevent OHSS as well as multiple pregnancies, wherein you the first change in the dose is done only after 14 days, wherein you increase the dose either by 50% or 37.5. And the next increase in the dose is done only after 21 days. Once there is occurrence of a dominant follicle, then, uh, then we do not increase the dose. But it's very important to counsel the patient. Both the patient as well as the doctor needs to have patience because the the, uh, the time taken for treatment can be as long as 28 to 35 days, but it definitely reduces the occurrence of multiple pregnancies and OHSs. The step-down protocol can again result in monofollicular development, which is like a norm, which is normally, uh, which is a normal physiology wherein the FSH increases and comes down, and therefore only the follicles with low threshold get selected and they grow. The aim of using gonadotropins is to achieve monoovulatory cycle to avoid multiple pregnancies and OHSs, and the patient should be counseled on these risk factors when we are using gonadotropins uh, prior to the start of the cycle. And they should be started, as I told you, in a low dose of 37.5 or 75 IU, and then we have to cautiously increase uh, uh, the dose to see that there's monofollicular development and no OHSs. 
and it's just like walking on a tight rope because if you just increase the dose when you feel that the follicles are not growing you can suddenly have explosion of follicles and the cycles should be cancelled if there are more than two follic dominant follicles uh, and uh, and or you can convert it into an ivf cycle uh, but one must remember that gonadotropin therapy requires specific and stringent uh, protocols and transvaginal uh, scan should be done for follicular growth and endometrial thickness and a serum e2 level should be done only in the presence of hypo or hyper response and you can see that uh, when we compare the low dose protocols that is the step up and step down the ovulation rate is much higher uh, with the step down protocol uh, but the monofollicular development is more with step up and you can see that uh, basically there's no much difference in the OSSS protocol but again uh, again the multiple pregnancy rates are also similar uh, so then should oral ovulations be skipped in PCOS and uh, in patients who really have a BMI, which is more than 30, age is 32, uh, AMH values are more than 10, and have this presence of hypoandrogenism, but there's no evidence as yet. But uh, you can see that though clomiphene citrate has uh, ease of administration and the cost is much less, though the monitoring is equally required for both the time to pregnancy and the chance of pregnancy and single life birth rate, which is much higher with gonadotrophin therapy and according to the international guidelines gonadotropins are used as second line pharmacological agents and could be considered as first line treatment in the presence of ultrasound monitoring but one needs to counsel them about the cost and potential of multiple pregnancies and when uh, where available and affordable should be used in preference to promethine citrate uh, combined with metformin in cc resistance uh, we have to uh, when they are prescribed we have to Look at the cost and availability as well as expertise to monitor such ovulation induction cycles. Ovarian drilling can be done either laparoscopically trans with transvaginal hydrolaparoscopy and transvaginal ultrasound guided drilling and uh, basically it destroys the ovarian androgen producing tissues uh, and the, it also has a local effect by fall in the CLH uh, levels of androgens, LH and inhibin, followed by increase in FSH levels. And it, and it has both local and systemic effects and promotes follicular recruitment, growth, maturation, and subsequent ovulation, and is also able to restore clomiphene sensitivity and prevent OHSs. Uh, so whether we go for laparoscopic ovarian drilling or gonadotrophin treatment, as both of them are second line of treatment, uh, let us compare the efficacy, cost, as well as the safety. And if you look over here, the ovulation rate is much higher with gonadotrophins. Pregnancy rate is also almost higher. Uh, the live birth rate is also higher. And if you look at the end of 12 months, basically, uh, with LOD, you have to add uh, clomiphene citrate or gonadotrophins to achieve a pregnancy rate. But the only advantage is that uh, the miscarriage rate is also almost similar. But uh, the advantage of LOD is that it, uh, it can result in monofollicular ovulation. It has a very low micro pregnancy and OHSS, uh, OHSS rate, uh, but it can be associated with risk related to surgery like addition formation and premature ovarian, uh, failure, especially when overdone. Uh, there's no difference in the quality of life and uh, the duration of beneficial effect lasts for years, but this is only for that particular cycle. And the cost is one time, whereas with gonadotrophin, the cost is for every cycle. And in this recent uh, uh, meta-analysis, you can see that there is no difference in the ovulation rate, uh, pregnancy rate, and live birth rate when letrozole was compared with LOD in CC-resistant uh, women. And therefore, probably letrozole is the first line of treatment. And you can see that, again, there was no difference in the abortion rate and uh, the endometrial uh, thickness was much better in the electrosol group as compared uh, to the uh, LOD group. And according to the international guidelines, it can be used as a second line uh, therapy uh, and can be offered as a first line therapy if laparoscopy is indicated for any other reason and the risk and cost needed to be uh, should be explained to the patient. So either gonadotrophins or laparoscopic ovarian drilling could be used in PCOS women with anovulatory infertility who are CC resistant and with no other infertility factor following counseling on benefits and risk of each 
therapy. Ultrasound guided uh, transvaginal ovarian drilling uh, can be used uh, in patients with PCOS. And it, is, it has been as effective as laparoscopic ovarian drilling, but is less invasive and less uh, expensive as compared to laparoscopy. And uh, if we look at the various uh, parameters in ART before and after, uh, we can clearly see that number of cancellation of cycles was much less, the fertilization and cleavage rate was much better, and the live birth rate was also improved after transvaginal ovarian drilling. Coming to the AMH levels, uh, it was observed that the transvaginal uh, ovarian drilling is comparable to laparoscopic ovarian drilling in terms of reduction of AMH, and therefore it supports the use of transvaginal uh, laparoscopic uh, ovarian drilling in the treatment of patients with CC-resistant uh, PCOS. Coming to indications for in fertilization, infertility in treatment-resistant PCOS or when PCOS is seen in combination with tubal factor or male factor infertility, IVF may be a preferred treatment option. And uh, in patients with PCOS, it produces good results, but the risk of developing OHSS is significantly increased, even with the use of GNRH antagonist protocol. And according to the uh, international guidelines, in the absence of an absolute, uh, absolute indication for uh, IVFXC, it is basically the third line of treatment when the first and second line have failed. And in women with anomalatory PCOS, the use of IVF is effective, and when elective ACT is used, multiple pregnancies can be minimized, and women with PCOS undergoing IVF PC therapy need to be counseled prior to starting treatment on the availability, cost, and convenience, and on the increased risk of OHSS and options to reduce the risk of OHSS. We could also suppress LH uh, by using uh, combined oral contraceptive pills and progesterone, uh, and it is the estrogen compound which increases the SHB and decreases the free androgen, whereas the progesterone compound decreases the frequency of GNRH pulse, and thus suppression of LH and inhibition of LH surge is seen. It also decreases, there's decrease in the ovarian androgen and estrogen secretion with increase in the SHBG with the progesterone, com uh, uh, progesterone component. And most of the studies uh, are on ERT cycles, and therefore we cannot extrapolate them for non-ERT cycles. And in this study, which was published in 2020, uh, we can see that with the study, the ovulation, the ovulation rate, the pregnancy rate uh, has significantly increased. And the abortion rate, uh, the, uh, you can see that there was no difference with the use of pre-treatment oral contraceptive pills. The other non-pharmacological -pharm interventions include nutritional supplements like an acetylcysteine, omega-3 fatty acids, and vitamin D and alternative medical therapies like Chinese herbal medicine and acupuncture, but the strength of evidence is very low for all the outcomes and further studies are required to use them in your armamentarium. So my take home message is that lifestyle intervention are inexpensive and effective. Metformin may increase the live, rate, live birth rate among women undergoing ovulation induction with gonadotrophins. Combined therapy of metformin and clomiphene citrate resulted in improved ovulation rate and clinical pregnancy rate, but not known whether this translates into an increased live birth rate. Inositols are a promising molecule for the treatment of PCOS with insulin resistance, but it uses presently should be carefully selected patients till more data is available. Recent randomized uh, evidence suggests that gonadotropin therapy may be more effective than CC in NAVE PCOS women. Laparoscopic ovarian drilling versus other medical treatments have shown to have similar clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rates as well as miscarriage rates. However, there are ongoing concerns about the long-term effects of laparoscopic ovarian drilling on ovarian function as well as reserve. IVF is a reasonable option and multiple pregnancies can be kept to a minimum by doing a, a single embryo transfer. Adjuvant therapies used have conflicting uh, or unconvincing results and addressing studies to subgroup of patients may find benefit for some add-on interventions. Treatment possibilities for anovulatory infertility in women with PCOS who are resistant to oral ovulations are based on the success rate, complicity, as well as adverse effects of different treatment options. Order in which various treatment options should be offered is lifestyle intervention and weight reduction in obese, insulin sensitizers uh, like uh, metformin, 
laparoscopic ovarian drilling or low dose gonadotrophins, IVF in case of combined factors or resistant to other treatments, and other adjuvants basically have a very low quality evidence and should be used only in certain subgroup of patients. Therefore, one needs to balance the benefit with the evidence when using alternative treatments. And I thank you all for a patient hearing. Thank you, uh, Madam. It was a great balancing act, as your last slide showed. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Good. Since you are, you have uh, some other very important function. I'll restrict only couple of uh, questions. About LH, do you uh, do LH estimation uh, in each cycle to no. know the LH is low then? No, normally uh, it is not done. Only if you uh, basically when you know that uh, when you are done your baseline LH and it is very high and you find that uh, the patient is not ovulating with your oral ovulations, uh, then probably you could uh, you could uh, do I mean I don't do it but you can probably use the treatment protocols which I said but the recent studies have shown that having a high LH really does not make a difference and today we no longer use either oral contraceptives or any other medication for decreasing the LH level though there is some evidence on uh, using estrogen and progesterone but they should not also again be used for more than eight to 10 days, the estrogen just before your ovulation induction. And this is special. And most of these studies were done only in ART cycles and they were not done in non-ART cycles. So we really do not know whether they are beneficial in the non-ART cycles because most recent evidence has shown that even in the ART cycles, it doesn't make a difference. But one must not use oral contraceptive pills because they decrease the gonadotrophins to a larger extent and therefore, the RT outcome is much hampered. And therefore, uh, uh, estrogen and progesterone are more used and not for more than 8 to 10 days. Do you do uh, home IR for, uh, if you suspect? No, I don't do any insulin levels or home IR. Uh, what I do is just an impaired glucose tolerance. I do an oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, and that is going to tell us about uh, the insulin resistance. Because insulin should not be done. Uh, mainly because uh, it can be affected by many things like uh, at what time it is done, by your sleep, by your eating. And uh, even the essay which is available is uh, not uh, standardized. And therefore, insulin should not be done in any case. And just doing an oral glucose tolerance test is enough. I have a personal uh, opinion about drilling. Uh, what I find, there is more inadvertent uh, ovarian drilling, which is actually harmful. And uh, most of the patients which I have seen have <clears throat> given a history of ovarian drilling just because the patient was obese and having irregular cycles and they literally land up into premature ovarian, ovarian uh, reserve. Yeah, so I also don't believe in laparoscopic ovarian drilling as a treatment modality. And therefore, it has also taken a backseat uh, over the years. Uh, and uh, a gonadotrophin therapy is preferred to laparoscopic ovarian uh, drilling. Uh, yeah. And uh, it gives much better results. Yeah, because even if the gonadotrophin therapy is costly, the patient at least has her own oocytes in her ovary. Yes. I mean, they are not lost which happens in over and drilling. Okay. Hello. Uh, yeah. Very good uh, and elaborate explanation and uh, treatment of PCOS. Uh, one question I had, if there is resistance to CC, can we switch off in the next cycle to letros or extended letros protocol? Uh, so, as I, so as I said to you that uh, today letrozole is considered to be the first line of treatment. And only if the patient is resistant to letrozole uh, should we use clomiphene citrate. 
though there are a few studies which talk about extended clomiphene citrate treatment, uh, it has really not uh, uh, seemed to be beneficial. And even uh, there are people, there are I, uh, there are a few papers, but that again does not have much evidence on extended letrozole uh, therapy. So one should either use letrozole if the, she is resistant, then you then only you go to clomiphene citrate. But if there is failure with letrozole, it's best to go for gonadotropins and not again try with uh, clomiphene citrate because one must remember that clomiphene citrate uh, has an anti-estrogenic effect both on the cervical mucus as well as on the endometrium. And therefore, uh, letrozole is uh, the choice of treatment, in, especially in PCOS women, because it has been seen that cytokines and interleukins are more affected. But if you take a non-PCOS woman today, still clomiphene citrate is the first drug of choice and not letrozole. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Please accept this trophy, e-trophy from Solapur OBGY Society as it is a e felicitation yeah. thank you very much for inviting me and having me here thank you i request uh, anjali jamma madam to please felicitate our chairpersons And I have, thank you, Dhawal, for allowing me to present before you <laughs> because I had some commitment. Thank you very much. Welcome, ma'am. Always, uh, ma'am, I uh, had uh, some guests over and and it was late and I was free in the hospital. So I was like, it's okay. Thank ma'am. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> We are moving to session uh, third. For this, I request Dr. Milin Shah, sir, and Dr. Neetu Jaikar, madam, to chair this session. Dr. Milin Shah, sir, he, he don't need actually any formal introduction. He is a renowned gynecologist and obstetrician, ART specialist at Naval Hospital. He's a very good teacher also, ever enthusiastic and always ready to help. Dr. Neetu Jaikar, madam, she is a, a pra she practicing at Niramai Hospital since 15 years. She is an assistant professor at VM Medical College. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much once again, friends, uh, joining back after the first session. I'm really so happy to receive Dhawal you as a speaker. It goes so many years back, I think must be seven or eight years before I went to Manipal University. And Dhawal was there as a PG student, received me as a you know, guest and we had a wonderful introduction. And I realized that spark and today I'm seeing you as a speaker. It's definitely a pleasure and friends, you must be knowing he's the son of Dr. Asha Bakshi, a very efficient consultant in the city of Indore, doing wonderful work in the endoscopy. He has done his MCH after his uh, DNB course. He has trained at the Eva Hospital Ahmedabad with Dr. Deepak Limbachia, joint treasurer for the MP chapter of IG, managing committee member of MP ISAR. Winner of the best paper awards at the MP ISR conference, UFOXI West Zone conference, ISR 2019 champion of ISR award, and so many awards on his credit. He's also winner of uh, Dr. Siuli Rudra Sinha award at AICOG 2022. All of you must be knowing, which is given for the best work in the endoscopy. So, with this introduction, the world we are ready to listen to you, and it's definitely a proud moment for all of us to uh, listen to your lecture. Huh? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Milin, sir. You remember quite accurately, it was 2011 when I had received you in Manipal. 
and almost 11 years now since that has been so and it was wonderful interacting with you and uh, always after that and now uh, milin sir has a special connection with indore also because his daughter is now my neighbor in indore so she lives four or five houses down my row only now so now uh, uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for uh, patiently waiting and listening and uh, still being there with us. And uh, I'll just take another one minute to share my screen. I'd like to thank uh, Anjali Jamma, Madam, and uh, Anuradha Khare, Madam, for inviting me. Archana Khare, Madam, sorry, for inviting me. And uh, I hope my screen is visible now uh, once I've shared. The sharing is on. Yeah. So once again, greetings from Indore and uh, greetings from Motherhood Hospital. This is where I practice. So, uh, so basically the talk that I want to give is uh, fertility enhancing surgeries. Fertility enhancing surgeries, we can have a whole conference on fertility enhancing surgeries and still the controversies will keep on raging on and the topics are endless. So what I am planning to present today are maybe some newer concepts of that of the same topics that have been there and try to, you know, uh, clear some controversies. So I think polyps are one of the most common things that we all encounter in our practice. Up to 32% of prevalence is there in women with infertility. And uh, so a lot of studies have come that whether removing a polyp is necessary or whether it is just a waste of time and it doesn't hamper the implantation. So there are studies that uh, have reported that uh, uh, women who are undergoing a hysteroscopic polypectomy are twice as likely to conceive after IUI compared to the controls. There have also been studies uh, regarding the endometrial receptivity in patients with polyps, and they have seen increased levels of glycodelin, um, uh, aromatase, and inflammatory markers, which are detrimental to the implantation. And there are reduced levels of HOXA-10 and HOXA-11 messenger RNA, which promote the endometrial receptivity. So all of these are pointing into uh, facts that maybe polyps really do hamper infertility and they ought to be uh, removed. So now the next thing is how to remove the polyps. So uh, there are many ways to remove the polyps. I think most of us are using scissors. One thing which is an absolute no-no is any use of resectoscopes for removing polyps, you don't have to. This video is one of a hysteroscopic intrauterine shaver, which has come out, which is a slightly newer technology. So this has a rotating blade, which keeps on cutting and uh, evacuating the uh, polyp fragments uh, together. So you can see that this is a unedited video and within a few seconds, all of this polyp has now been removed without any damage to the basal layer and the whole cavity is clear. So this is the latest way of how to remove a polyp. And uh, although the machine is a little uh, cumbersome to use and you have to assemble the scope and everything, but it is really, really very easy to use once you've inserted the scope in. And it is a very uh, atraumatic way of removing the polyp. So most of us, uh, most of the infertility specialists and the IVF specialists also have this dilemma in their mind that when to perform an embryo transfer after polypectomy. So there have been uh, there has been a very nice study which has seen that uh, the pregnancy rates after one cycle, two cycles, or three cycles after uh, a hysteroscopic polypectomy, and they have seen that there is absolutely no difference in whenever you put this, uh, whenever you transfer the embryo, whether it is after the first cycle, second cycle, or third cycle. So. Uh, you might as well not delay too much and transfer in the subsequent cycle. The next problem that we all have coming across nowadays is Asherman syndrome. Asherman's earlier used to be a lot because of uh, genital tuberculosis. A lot of it is now due to the postpartum uh, curettage. And a lot of it is due to uh, increasingly difficult procedures that are being done like adenomyomectomies as well as laparoscopic uh, myomectomies. So all of these things are now precipitating Asherman syndrome. And so the first thing that we should understand when we are seeing a patient with Asherman syndrome is that we have to do the scoring. So this is the AFS 
scoring and this scoring is nothing new it's been there since 1988 or 1998 i think 98 sorry and uh, it has a particular scoring system depending upon the extent of cavity involved what are the type of the adhesions and the menstrual pattern and depending on that it is stage 1 stage 2 or stage 3 so, yeah so this is another small video about how you want to do a uh, hysteroscopic adhesiolysis so the most important thing is that most of the time there will be adhesions at the level of the internal os so rather than you know forcing your scope in it is always better to go in with the scissors see the flimsy adhesions at the level of the internal os using a 2.9 mm scope in these patients does wonders and uh, once you're there just assess the cavity see whether you can see any osteo or not you can see that this is a severely uh, contracted cavity with a uh, dense obliteration of everything this patient had been operated twice outside and the biggest risk factor is that she was the wife of an mla so uh, we still managed to convince them uh, with you know sword on our throat that madam let's go ahead once more let's see what we can help you and do the adhesiolysis so now the most important thing is to remain very superficial also we have to have an orientation of which side we are going towards and how much depth we are going into so that orientation can be given by the direction of our scope externally so we have to have that orientation slowly and steadily we just have to make small nicks and keep on uh, you know uh, making these cuts so what i have done first is on the left side i had made a few cuts and enlarged the cavity and then subsequently now on the right side and here now what we can see is the most uh, most uh, comforting picture is that of the ostea that has been seen so now there are just a few more flimsy adhesions which we've released from the ostea and now we are confident that we've identified the ostea on one side so the remaining cavity is on the other <laughs> side so now what we're doing is just we're going and gradually cutting we're just using cold scissors nothing else no no other instrument uh, some people believe in uh, using ultrasound guidance but i feel that it is it doesn't help very much you still have to be uh, justified in where you are going uh, i have also heard to some people jokingly saying ki till when to stop doing this adhesiolysis uh, so jokingly a lot of people have said till you go ahead and perforate the uterus but i feel that once you have a satisfactory cavity you can see that uh, the cavity has been beautifully restored and now the mla will not trouble us any more and uh, restore the cavity uh, one more important thing is now that you've done it but how do you avoid the, the recurrence of the adhesions so there is a lovely meta analysis which is recently published uh, in 2000 april 2022 so they've seen quite a lot of things so uh, the the intervention that proved most likely to reduce uh, to have the give the highest pregnancy rates was the use of hyaluronic acid gel intrauterine it is just inserted through the hysteroscope uh, once you are done the adhesiolysis uh, the highest incidence uh, the highest uh, thing that worked uh, was hyaluronic acid plus intrauterine device for uh, just for the addition prevention for the recurrence but when you look at the menstrual pattern involvement there was a uh, use of a dried amnion graft and the uterine balloon so basically the uterine balloon there are two types of balloons one balloon is can be your simple pediatric foley's catheter eight number catheter uh, you just insert that and inflate it up till 3 ml the uterine cavity is anywhere between 2.5 to 3.5 ml it will prevent the cavity from uh, the raw areas from approximating towards each other and uh, preventing the reformation in the meanwhile we are all supposed to give high dose cyclical estrogen and progesterone to these patients to promote uh, the growth of the endometrium so what we personally give is we give estradiol valerate till day, uh, thrice 2 uh, mg thrice daily till uh, the 25th day of the period and uh, follow it up with cyclical progesterone also we just give metroxy progesterone acetate 10 mg from day 16 to 25 what i like to do is i like to give it for 2 to 3 cycles in the meanwhile if there were severe adhesions if uh, on 
the uh, we call these patients around day to uh, day 21 day 22 of the subsequent cycle look at the endometrial thickness that we're getting if we think we are getting a good endometrial thickness if we are getting a good cavity on a 3d ultrasound then maybe we don't do a second look but if we have any doubts so then we will go ahead and do a second look what is another strategy that has now come up uh, to manage such patients to prevent the adhesion recurrence as well as to um, also tackle patients with thin endometrium with iv uh, in ivr is the use of uh, sub endometrial prp so the platelet rich plasma is created from the patient's own blood it is autologous so that is why no special permissions have to be taken only the patient has to be counseled that we're doing this and take the consent but otherwise you don't have to talk to the transplant uh, transplant authority or anything this patient is a patient who had undergone who we had done a hysteroscopic adhesiolysis initially and then we were still not happy with the endometrium that was coming up so we did a second look we saw that there was some form of flimsy adhesion slightly narrow cavity on one side so we planned her for prp injection so what we do is we take around uh, 4 ml of this prp solution and inject it all on the four walls of the uterus the most important thing is the anterior and posterior wall somewhat near the zone of maximal implantation so at that spot you go in ahead when using a normal uh, uh, number 17 oocyte pickup needle single lumen needle and injecting around 1 ml of prp on each of the uh, each of the uterine walls in the subendometrial region one thing that you have to make sure is that when you put it in you have to put it beneath the endometrial beyond the endometrial junction if you put it there that is the right place and how will you know accurately you don't have to put an ultrasound guidance usually when you just inject it uh, you will find some amount of resistance when you are pushing the needle another important thing is that what happens is that when you withdraw the needle after injecting it sometimes the saline gets refilled into your syringe so you have to have you, uh, so what we do is we you just use something to block the uh, the tubing that is attached on the uh, oocyte pickup retrieval needle so that prevents the backflow from coming in so we only have prp and you're not injecting saline into the subendometrial space so this is another study uh, i like to quote indian studies as much as possible because these studies are done on our patients and our patients genetics are pretty much similar although we have a huge country with uh, variation but still it correlates more when we correlate indian patients with indian patients rather than caucasian patients to indian patients so this was a study quoted by uh, doctor uh, by published by dr sunita tandulwarkar in which she used uh, autologous intrauterine prp uh, for uh, thin endometrium in fet cycles and they saw that there was a significant increase in the mean uh, endometrial thickness after prp they also saw that there was a significant increase in the vascularity um, reaching zones 3 and 4 of the endometrium and it was followed up by a high uh, hcg rate that was almost 60% and a good clinical pregnancy rate of 45% which is one of uh, which is really really good so now following up with the endometrial prp is now the ovarian prp so ovarian prp we usually do it in patients who have low ovarian reserve and we're planning to stimulate them for ivf so we can do it either hysteroscopically or laparoscopically this patient also had a retroverted uterus and some form of adhesions so we had posted her for a laparoscopy as well as a uh, 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 ovarian prp therapy so she did have uh, this patient although her amh was not very very low we operated her at an amh of 1.1 but she had a previous poor response to ovarian stimulation also so here what we do is we do the same thing we inject prp here what i'm using is a spinal needle there is also a special needle that has now been launched in the market by pb which is a specific prp installation needle here what we're doing is we're putting around 2 and 1/2 ml in each ovary you can see that the ovary is gradually increasing in volume which indicates that you are putting it in the right place uh, here again you have to avoid putting it into a follicle and you want to put it into the stroma of the ovary and avoid the follicles so here again 
it will go you will find some resistance also i think most of you have must have all, uh, had an experience with prp so when you inject a trans vaginally uh, with a pickup needle through ultrasound guidance how do you know that it is in the right place or whether it is gone or not so if you do scan later on after injecting prp you will find that there are hyperechoic areas that are seen in the ovary uh, sub after you instill the prp so there are uh, encouraging results with prp and uh, and uh, i but it is still experimental it's not in the books so you have to tell the patients that uh, this is a new therapy that has come up we are not sure how much it will work or not and the best results are seen usually when um, when you do the stimulation in the subsequent or uh, the second cycle after injecting prp one problem that i have uh, heard other people is uh, saying and is happened with the patient of ours also is that since this prp works on an inflammatory response and leads to the increased number of follicles available at that time so some patients might have an actual depletion of the ovarian uh, antral follicles that are available at that time so you have to be very careful and you know um, counsel the patients appropriately that this might work and this might not work it is not magic but it is a newer and experimental therapy so maybe there might be a leukocyte free fraction of prp that might come out but whether that will be as effective as it is because the prp is all about causing inflammation and activating the follicles so that is there another new method of uh, enhancing fertility was the follicular activation uh, by ovarian fragmentation so uh, in this what has happened is uh, uh, so basically in women with poor ovarian reserve a lot of the oocytes are do dormant so these dormant oocytes are there because something called a hippo pathway which is leading to all these um, Uh, oocytes not being recruited for further mitosis, uh, mitosis or meiosis. So uh, there was a study uh, in which they saw that fragmentation of the ovarian cortex leads to deactivation of this hippo pathway and reactivation of the ovarian tissue. And in some cases, this might lead to a uh, more positive response. I am talking about all of these things because now the new ART bill is making it more and more difficult. to you know get donors and everything and uh, things are being difficult so now we have to learn about how to improve the response in uh, self stimulated cycles and how to get better results there so but this again is a very experimental therapy we have done one case but unfortunately uh, unfortunately i can't show the video because uh, it was in my old hard disk and the old computer and it all crashed uh, last year so that was there but i can tell you the story so this patient had come to us from australia she had undergone seven or eight cycles husband was a doctor uh, the uh, not even a single embryo perform was uh, uh, was formed she came to us uh, so we gave her this idea ki we'll do this experimental therapy and uh, if you're ready for it then we can go ahead so we did the procedure everything and we told her that we'll just monitor her for you know uh, whatever cycle we see that there are good antral follicles we'll take her up for stimulation unfortunately the month after this procedure was done husband and wife had a divorce and we could not go ahead with the stimulation or seeing that but what positive uh, feedback that we got from the patient is that earlier she used to have um, scanty menses but now her menstrual flow has improved so maybe that is a <coughs> surrogate marker that her uh, maybe some follicles have been activated so how to rejuvenate it so the, uh, you can use prp or you can also use the autologous bone marrow derived stem cells this again is another uh, uh, another uh, publication by dr sunita tandulwarkar and they have seen that uh, there is was a statistically significant improvement in the antral follicles and two sites and in the quality of embryos so now the next topic that is very common and is increasingly being diagnosed and encountered in clinic is endometriosis so whenever you do a scopy so nowadays there is a lot of controversy regarding whether you want to do a scopy for endometriosis or not 
So I'd like to clear the guidelines. The guidelines say that you don't have to do a scopy to diagnose endometriosis. You should have a strong clinical suspicion in, uh, in front of you. And you should not do it for an asymptomatic patient. You just to say that she has endometriosis. But definitely if the symptoms are there, so you are justified in doing a, a laparoscopy for endometriosis. So now since we're talking about fertility enhancing surgeries, so what to see additional from the lesions uh, when you're doing a scopy for an endometriosis, uh, a patient with endometriosis. So you have to calculate the endometriosis fertility index. So this will uh, have two parts. It will have a surgical form and it will have a, a historical form. So what you have to do is you have to see something called least function score at the time of surgery, at the time when you complete your radiciolysis and at the end of the surgery, at the final image of surgery. And then you see whether there is mild dysfunction, moderate dysfunction, or it is ab absolutely normal. So you have to see that and give the score accordingly. Apart from that, you have to also consider the age of the patient, uh, previous years of infertility, whether she is conceived or not initially, and as well as the uh, AFS or the ASRM sc uh, scoring system for uh, this thing. Now, once you combine all these factors, you will get a EFI score from uh, 0 to 10. Uh, so in this score, what will happen is this will predict the chance of the patient getting pregnant, uh, conceiving spontaneously within the next uh, up till three years. So usually we don't have to wait up till three years. If you look at the graph carefully, you can see that most of these patients will have a plateau at 18 months. So in case the score is very good, it is above maybe six, then you or maybe above uh, seven. So then you can look at considering to allow them for spontaneous conception or you give them some mild form of ovarian stimulation, timed intercourse, IUI, etc. Uh, although I heard the previous uh, chairperson saying that he does not like IUI, but sometimes IUI does work. And it also helps as a bridging uh, gap between, you know, surgery and, uh, uh, and uh, IVF. So, but in case that uh, there is a severe involvement, the is really poor, these patients are better to be taken directly up for IVF as the chances of them conceiving, even up to after 10 year, uh, three years is really bleak. It's not more than 10%. So now a newer dilemma that has come up is what do we do when we see these small uh, lesions? Do we go ahead and incise, uh, just ablate the incisions as always? Or do we go ahead and excise them? Because nowadays everybody is saying that we have to excise all the lesions. So from a fertility uh, point of view, uh, there is no advantage of uh, excision over ablation. Uh, but uh, you should uh, you can consider all of that when the patient has endometriosis associated pain. So for the management of pain, if she is symptomatic, so then you should go ahead and excise the lesions. But uh, this will also prevent the recurrence, which, but uh, that is also very controversial. Some studies say that it doesn't make any difference when it comes to this. Dr. Sanjay Patel has now uh, come up with a butterfly peritonectomy technique in which he strips off all the peritoneum in case there are multiple implants all over. But uh, the data is still yet to be uh, is awaited from that. And once the paper comes out, then we'll have a more clear idea. So this is exactly what I just said, that uh, even uh, if you ablate it or excise it, it doesn't make any difference. But do treat it and don't leave it behind, because that is also what Ashri says, that in stage 1, stage 2 endometriosis, uh, excision or ablation of the lesions improves the pregnancy outcomes compared to uh, uh, placebo, uh, compared to diagnostic alone. So now, this is also another very common picture. Uh, that is seen. So this is a bilateral ovarian uh, endometriomas. So uh, one shortcut of the AFS scoring is that a single ovarian endometrioma will give you a score of 20. Two and bilateral endometriomas will be a score of 40. So whenever you see bilateral endometriomas, it is stage 4 endometriosis. Whenever the pouch of Douglas is obliterated, it is stage 4 endometriosis. So now what do we do in these patients? So this is uh, so in this patient, uh, what we are going to do is, since we also look for fertility, we want to restore the tuber ovarian anatomy and the relationship uh, 
and which is very important to us especially or if we are uh, looking for a uh, spontaneous pregnancy and even if uh, you are uh, you know just planning to take this patient for ivf afterwards restoration of the anatomy is important because if there will be kinking of the tubes that will also lead to more inflammation and higher chances of hydrosalpins formation so now this is this technique of uh, 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 cystectomy which i have kind of uh, been inspired from by somebody but devised some of it myself so what i do is i like to try to evert the cyst whenever possible and make a nice uh, incision using very good scissors in the midline once we make the scissors you can see that the cyst wall that is coming out is really thin you can see that there is a, a proper layer that is there between the cyst wall and the ovarian tissue and by this method what happens is that since you are dissecting from the center the least amount of adhesions are at the center of an endometrioma and the most are from the periphery so rather than struggling from the periphery and coming to the midline might as well always go from the normal towards abnormal anatomy because that is what we have always been taught of in uh, difficult situations that always dissect from the normal to the abnormal area so you can see that we're slowly and steadily stripping it off i'm just using a scissors and even despite using the scissors there is hardly any bleeding there has not been a drop of vasopressin that has been instilled into this patient and despite that you can see that there is hardly any bleeding so where does the ovarian loss occur usually in an endometrioma surgery one is when you are uh, going in a layer in a wrong plane and you're taking out a very thick cyst wall the second is the second is that when you're uh, performing a lot of bipolar or any form of coagulation on the normal ovarian tissue to achieve hemostasis so our aim should be to minimize those events and how do we do that by being in the right plane i am a big fan of using all these addition uh, prevention barriers because i feel that we have to do whatever is there available with us to prevent these addition formation in these patients so uh, a lot of people now are advocating that if there is an endometrioma uh, do we really need to do the surgery or not and uh, so you want to look at the current indications for surgery before ivf so it is basically only when there are inaccessible ovaries due to adhesions but if the endometrioma is anticipated to be in the path of the needle during uterine retrieval if there is anticipated difficulty in transport due to the position of the uterus sometimes the uterus is extremely retroverted so in the first patient which i uh, showed you that had the retroverted uterus when we did the hysteroscopy you could not see the ostea only because it was acutely retroflexed on its own it uh, if you look at the ultrasound picture it was a question mark sign so when we did that adhesiosis and flattened the uterus out and tried to release the adhesions from uh, the torus so that is when we could actually do the hysteroscopy and visualize the ostea so in these severely retroverted uteri uh, there might be a difficulty in the embryo transfer and we all know that if the embryo transfer is difficult then the pregnancy rates go down also there are studies in which they have said that if the patient has had recurrent ivf failures it is better to go ahead do the surgery take out all the inflammatory tissue and then maybe try again once more so this is the latest ashri 2022 guideline so which says that operative laparoscopy could be offered as a treatment option in asrm stage 1 or 2 clinicians may consider operative laparoscopy for the treatment of endometrioma associated infertility as it may increase the chances of natural pregnancy although no data from comparative studies increase exist uh, there is no compelling evidence exists that operative laparoscopy for deep infiltrating endometriosis improves fertility but operative laparoscopy may represent a treatment option in symptomatic patients wishing to conceive so basically it says that if there is pain then go ahead and you suspect di otherwise if you feel that you can you know if the patient is asymptomatic which almost 10 to 20% patients with di are so you might as well just go ahead do an ivf do the transfer and let uh, let them make them pregnant first because any surgery might lead to destruction of the ovarian tissue and which you always want to conserve otherwise uh, the ivf specialists uh, will start fuming upon the uh, reproductive surgeons 
So, uh, so what the recommendation is, the good practice point is that they recommend that the decision to perform surgery should be guided by the presence or absence of pain symptoms, patient age, preferences, history of previous surgery, presence of other infertility factors, ovarian reserve, and estimated endometriosis fertility index. So once again, they're reaffirming that try to calculate the EFI using the historical factors first, and then try to predict the surgical factors using the help of your ultrasound, whether you feel that you know this, all of this is going to be there. If you feel and if you predict that the endometriosis fertility index is going to be low, maybe just go ahead and take the patient for IVF. If you think you're going to get a good chance with the endometriosis infertility index, then you might as well uh, be beneficial. Uh, you might benefit in performing the surgery and getting good results. Another enigmatic uh, disease is adenomyosis and infertility. So there is a lot of controversy regarding whether adenomyosis makes a difference, it doesn't make a difference. But the problem with adenomyosis is that the spectrum is huge. You might just have some subtle adenomyosis, nothing uh, which is age associated with the patient. And uh, there is no problem whatsoever. Patients are asymptomatic, everything. You go ahead, give some uh, fertility treatment and they conceive. But some patients you might see there are huge uteri with diffuse adenomyosis or you might see that there is a focal adenomyoma. And so what all of this does is that uh, because of this adenomyotic tissue, there is local hypoestrogenism, which leads to increased uterine peristalsis and which precipitates this tissue injury and repair. And this all forms a vicious cycle and it keeps on recurring, recurring, recurring. And the adenomyosis also concurrently uh, increases. What all of this leads to, it leads to an increase in factors like beta catenin, CD68, IL6, macrophages, MCP and natural killer cells, which are anti, uh, which, which are uh, negative for the endometrial receptivity. And they decrease the pro-receptivity factors like the HOX10, HOXA10, HOXA11, Integrin, and all these L-selected ligand, HOXO1A, etc., etc., etc. So now, this is uh, one surgery that, I, you know, this is one of the most difficult surgeries that we've performed. So this was a patient with previous two failed cycles of IVF, previously twice operated for endometriosis. Uh, on an MRI, she had a huge adenomyoma. Uh, per abdomen, the uterus is almost uh, 20 weeks size. So on her MRI, she had bilateral pyosalpinges. You could see the pus coming out from the tubes when we did the adesolysis. So the first biggest challenge was to restore the normal anatomy in this patient. This patient had poor ovarian reserve also, or AMH is hardly 0 0.1. So, but uh, even she had underwent an, uh, a donor uh, cycle and that had also failed with her. So the only option was that uh, to do, go ahead and perform surgery again for her and try to reduce the bulk of the disease. So what I like to do is I like to do a double flap or technique for an adenomyomectomy. You can see all of this adenomyom uh, 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 the adenomyoma tissue that we're cutting with the monopolar needle. Monopolar needle works fantastically here because it is, works just like a pencil and you can draw uh, your incision and uh, excise all the tissue. What I want like to do first is I like to open the endometrium, identify where the endometrium is. So that gives us a guide because whenever you excise an adenomyoma, you have to keep in uh, mind a few things. One is that you want to uh, leave at least one centimeter of thickness uh, beneath the uh, endomyometrial junction. So that is there because otherwise that is where all the vascularity, uh, etc., etc., comes from. You also want to leave at least one centimeter of the uh, tissue beneath the serosa. So what we've done here is we've made nice two big flaps and... Now what we're doing is we're suturing the flaps. So here, just like the bony's hood operation, uh, we're going to suture the flaps from one end to the other. Here again, while suturing the flaps, you have to make sure that the uh, suture needle does not pass inside the endometrium. And you just have to stay superficial and close one flap over the other. So here you can see that the first layer flap we had anchored now we're going ahead and going ahead and anchoring the second flap to the first, uh, 
to the first one so this technique it might be a little cumbersome but what this technique has what the evidence is about these techniques are that it creates a larger amount of posterior myometrial wall thickness so because uh, people are not worried about ruptures after a myomectomies but one uh, the biggest nightmare of a gynecologist is in a patient who's had an adenomyomectomy and the high chances of rupture after the adenomyomectomy so now we've just gone and anchored the completely the first layer now the second layer is also being overlapped over the first one so here you can see that the reconstruction is almost done the use of barb suture here makes our life very easy because this retains the tissue strength so that one of our assistants is always free so there is the convenience factor definitely but what i like the most about it is that the tension over the tissue line is very uniform so there is no inadvertent uh, areas of extreme tension where there might be tissue ischemia and necrosis and therefore you get a nice good closure so this is the final picture and once again i don't want to find further surgeries when i do her cesarean section where i don't do it but whether uh when my wife does the cesarean section i'm more worried about that otherwise when i come home she'll uh, when she comes home she'll blast me so i don't want there to be more adhesions so that's why i always use the adhesion barrier on top post operative therapy we do definitely give lupride depot in these cases we'll give it up till 6 months i like to use the 11.25 mg uh formulation to prevent that flare up and uh so because in the flare up phase patients will become non compliant so if you give the 3 months so then the compliance increases so this is another study this is the study by osada et al in which they've come out with a triple uh, triple flap technique and uh, when they've seen that the reconstruction done and uh, they've had very good results at the time of pregnancy and uh, no cases of uterine rupture in their series so but what is the biggest predicting factor whether the patient will become pregnant or not it is definitely the amh level the amh level if it is normal the patient has a higher chance to conceive on her own if she is a young patient she less than 38 so now this 38 is again data from the west or data from maybe china our patients if you look at many presentations have uh, quoted the study by dr nalini mahajan where our patients age faster when it comes to the uh, compared to the caucasians or the hispanics so we have to consider this age more than 38 to be at least more than 32 or 35 and i think that is somewhere where the correlation will occur the women with focal adenomyosis were more likely to conceive and where there was no distortion of the endometrium so these are the uh, places where you know you will find more success after doing an adenomyomectomy so now coming to fibroids fibroid everybody knows that submucous fibroids are the ones that you have to remove subserous fibroid more than 7 cm and intramural fibroids more than 4 cm but what we should do is now we have to abandon this habit of ours of saying intramural subserous submucous and give it a number because different types of submucous fibroids behave differently they have to be approached differently a type 0 or type 1 submucous fibroid will be approached hysteroscopically type 2 uh submucous fibroid where more than 50% is in the myometrium has to be approached laparoscopically so this is how we have to do it and that is why i am reiterating the figo classification system so now we have to even encourage all of our radiologist friends who do our reportings for us that in case you are reporting please report it as one of these numbers so uh, you know making a decision for us is uh, becomes easier when it especially when it comes to fertility so how does the fibroid affect the um, pregnancy we all know about the distortion we all know about the uh, blood flow alterations at the endometrial level but this is a new article which i also uh, read about it affecting the endometrial receptivity so they saw that when it is there is a submucous component or whether it is intramural touching the endometrium so maybe type 0 to type 3 so that is when the hox10a hoxa 
10 mRNA was decreased. And uh, but when it was not touching the endometrium, all of this other MRA was normal. Sorry so this inter- again, Sorry. hello, Sorry yeah. To inter- uh, can you summarize with, uh, within? Yeah, I'm minutes? done. This is the last two slides That's now. We are yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So this is just a, a, a video which shows a huge type two submucous fibroid. Uh, but if you can see that most of it is intramural. So this is what I just wanted to reiterate that we should go in and remove these fibroids. Laparoscopically, I'll just fast forward to the point where you can see that the endometrium is bulging out. Can you see the endometrium bulging out here? So this is where it is. So this can all be removed without hampering the uh, endometrium. And you would want to go ahead and repair it in multiple layers. Uh, another important thing when it comes to myomectomy is the use of in bag morselation to prevent the seeding and the uh, dissemination of the tissue uh, in different places. And uh, also, in case it is occult leomyosarcoma, there might be an upstaging if you morselate it uh, normally. So, if you want to continue to use the morselator, you would do much better to remove it in a bag, especially in case of degenerated fibroids and when there is a large fibroid and patient is more than 35 years old. Tubal recanalization is another procedure that many of us have abandoned uh, with the advent of IVF. So, but I still like to do this procedure, especially when the patients are young. Uh, patients are from the periphery and uh, they have good ovarian reserve, partner has good uh, semen count. And, when, and I, what I do is I don't do an HSG before this, I do a diagnostic scopy. I tell them the patient that I'll see the determine the residual tubal length, whatever it is, if the tubal length is good. So we'll go ahead and perform the surgery. Even, uh, and we found very good results when it's done properly. So here, 3D system really benefits. What we're doing, the steps of the surgery are the same as it is in traditional open surgery. But what I do, don't do, which is different from open surgery, is that we don't use any intratubal guide wire or any catheter because the visualization that we get um, through laparoscopy is fantastic. What I have seen is that in the cases that I've used the guide wire, the patients did not become pregnant. So maybe it is a personal experience also. But I also feel that uh, using the guide wire uh, hampers our movements and the vision. So that is why also I am not in favor of using the guide wire. So I use 6-0 proline and uh, once this stitch is taken, I like to take the uh, stitches in the uh, uh, in the submucous region. So take the muscle and the submucous region and avoid going through the uh, lumen because you're using proline. So this gives us a good uh, approximation and a good watertight anastomosis. Uh, when it comes to this. I'll just fast forward to the final picture uh, that we will show the final result. So we've done it on the other side also. Uh, On the left side, there was a short distal segment. And on the right side, you can see that we've got a good long segment without any leak of the dye. And this patient really conceived, was a young patient and did really well. And she conceived just three months after surgery. So just to conclude, because this topic will keep on going on and on and on, and I'm sure everybody's hungry for lunch already. And uh, just to be ju- do justice with the crowd, I have also not had my lunch. So uh, to conclude, fertility enhancing surgeries are rewarding procedures. As the reproductive surgeon and the infertility specialist should work together in decision making. You know, the surgeon should, uh, they can all discuss what is best for the patient, for how much the surgeon can contribute and how much the infertility specialist can contribute, and also what does the patient want. So each plan has to be individualized. Accurate preoperative diagnosis and patient selection is key to successful outcome as it is with any surgery. And uh, special post-surgical care and planning are essential. So you want to know how to prevent the disease from reoccurring, when to uh, allow the patient to conceive, when to perform the next procedure, etc. And minimal invasive approach is the way forward as it is. Us gynecologists have done a tremendous job by introducing the field of minimal invasive surgery and laparoscopy to the world. It is us gynecologists who have invented this modality. 
and not the surgeon. So we should always be proud and adopt this as much as we can. Thank you very much. A very nice presentation. Uh, we had very clear idea about few topics which were we were unaware of. That is endometrial shaving, then uh, endometrial shaver, and then uh, subendometrial PRP injection, ovarian fragmentation, which was very new to me. Uh, that was really very nice and uh, very innovative ideas you taught us. Endometrial scoring system, fertility index, that was also very interesting. Um, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Well done, Dhawal. Wonderful presentation. Good. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, thank you, sir. Please accept the E trophy from Solapur OBGY Society. Yeah. Thank you. It got displayed? No, just Displays one. Touch. Okay. We are displaying. Yeah. I don't Anyone? mind getting Madhuri Ma'am's trophy also because that was uh, <laughs> then she uh, is such a senior person. <laughs> don't worry, I'll definitely bring it to Indore now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it's for sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much. Yes. And thank you, sir. Uh, we'll move on to our next session, that is ovulation induction protocol. And I invite Dr. Nalini Bagul, madam, from Nasik uh, for, this, for this talk. Uh, she's a director of Dr. Bagul Hospital, Nasik Fertility Center, bachelor in endoscopy, master in endoscopy, organizing chairperson amongst 2022-23. Over to you, madam. It said that host has disabled participant screen sharing. Just uh, give me uh, this screen sharing op option. Option. Is there anybody from the computer? No, I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, I think they are they are working on it. Uh, try now. Uh, some, uh, yes, yes. Okay. I have enabled it. You can try now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Neetu, for a kind in introduction. It is always a pleasure to come to the Solapur, basically, and then uh, visit uh, uh, Solapur Kals. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, now, because of uh, my uh, ovum pickup and uh, embryo transfer, I could not come over here. So sorry for that. Can I share now? Yes. Yeah, I think you can try now. Yes. yes. Is it visible? Am uh, I yeah, audible it's... also? No. Audible, yeah. audible also, yeah. Clearly audible, yeah. Only you put it on the uh, what do you say the uh, slideshow, slideshow. Yeah, right, right, right. I'll yes. So I'll be telling you about the ovulation induction protocols. Basically, uh, everything has been uh, uh, sh uh, shown to you by. Uh, Dr. Milian Patil and uh, Madhuri Madam. It is just an overview and uh, in detail uh, all the protocols will be di discussed. So it will be a revision only. So it is the ovulation induction. What is ovulation induction? It is the triggering of oocyte release from relatively mature ovarian follicle by drug. For ovulation induction, only one uh, follicle is expected, but for the ovarian stimulation, one can induce uh, two or three follicles. So the physiology of ovulation, everybody knows that uh, it is the uh, from the hypothalamus, GnRH is secreted. It acts on anterior pituitary to secrete FSH and LH. And this FSH will increase the growth of the follicle and it secrete, uh, and then it secretes estrogen, which negatively uh, affect the negative uh, by negative mechanism affects the uh, hypothalamus and uh, again the GnRH release will be stopped. In the luteal phase, in, on the other hand, the LH is secreted, with it, which will increase the corpus, which will stimulate the corpus luteum to produce the progesterone, and then the negative feedback mechanism again started. So this is the physiology, and in the PCOD. 
you will be seeing that there are abnormal GnRH pulsations are there. Because of that, there is abnormal gonadotrophin levels are there. So there will be increase of LH rather than the FSH. So increased LH-FSH ratio is there. Secondly, the culprit is insulin. Insulin resistance is there, which uh, this insulin resistance causes the hyperinsulinemia, which uh, will again cause the ovulatory dysfunction. This uh, ovulatory dysfunction will be in the two form, that is the, that is hyperestrogenemia and the follicular arrest. The follicle will not grow. And if uh, follicle grows, then it will stop between 13 to six, uh, 15, 16 millimeter only. So this is the problem of uh, the PCOS. So the hormones which are increased during in the PCOS is uh, it is the LH is increased, increase insulin, increase AMH and increase androgens. Because of that, there is so stromal hypervascularity, there is subfertility, an ovulation, and OHSS is there. So the uh, management of PCOS, first line of management is letrozole, clomiphen, clomiphen citrate plus metformin. Alone, metformin can be used and uh, gonadotrophin to some extent. But the second line of treatment is gonadotrophin and laparoscopic uh, ovarian surgery. Third line of management could be IVF. So the goal of ovulation induction is the single healthy life, life pregnancy. There should not be OHS, there should not be multiple pregnancies and the cycle should not be cancelled. So for that, you need to see, you, you need to do sonography by yourself, measure uh, antral, uh, antral follicle count, and see if it is normal or it is increased or reduced. If it is reduced, then you have to do the AMH level. Even in PCOS patients, you need to do the AMH level. Why? Because if it is more than four, then there are high chances of OHSs, even if you give clomiphene citrate. So AMH uh, is to be done. For AMH, you can do it at any time. Clomy, about the clomiphen citrate, there are the mechanism is you know it is centrally acting. It acts on the hypothalamus pituitary. It binds with the estrogen receptors and depletes the receptor counts concentration. And because of that, FSH is stimulated. More follicles are uh, more smaller follicles are rescued, and multiple follicles will develop. There is estrogen negative feedback is also there. It acts on the cervical mucus and uh, uh, it acts on the cervical mucus. It uh, reduces the endometrial thickness and it reduces the glandular density, decreases the uterine blood flow during luteal phase and there is change in the quality and quantity of the mucus. So it, is, it acts on the peripheral level also. These are the anti-estrogenic effect which makes uh, patient, though the ovulation is 73% over here, the miscarriage rate is 26%, but pregnancies are hardly 36% or less than that. But the multiple pregnancy rates are 10% and the single life pregnancy rate is only 25%. The reason being, it is because of the anti-estrogenic effect on the endometrium as well as the cervical mucus. Then free androgen uh, index is also uh, increased. It is the BMI, LH, and insulin is increased. Because of that, there is resistance to this clomiphen citrate. Then this, uh, what about the clomiphen citrate? The starting dose, you can start on the second day, third day, fourth day. Uh, it will not affect the results. Less than 50% respond to 50 milligram. So ideal dose is uh, 100. More than 150 is not needed. When to stop this uh, clomiphen citrate? If there is no pregnancy after six ovulatory cycle, no ovulation with the 150 milligram, 75% of the pregnancy will be achieved with the uh, clomiphene citrate within first three months only. And if it is if the ET is less than six mm, then it is better to shift to another ovulation. That is second uh, second protocol. That is the luteal phase uh, clomiphene citrate start. 
here uh, they have seen the uh, they have started with the 100 mg of uh, clomiphene citrate after finishing 5 days of medroxyprogesterone they have not waited for the withdrawal to occur and this results in the increased number of follicles but and the increased number of increased endometrial thickness and slight increase in the pregnancy rate so one can start with the luteal phase clomiphene citrate but only thing is that one has to rule out the pregnancy about the, uh, this is another one that is the ultra short uh, term clomiphene citrate in high responder women, wherein they have started with the 50 to 100 milligram from day three for only two days only. Okay. And the number of follic mature follicles was between 1, uh, 1 to 2. And the duration of follicular phase was 11.9 days, ovulation rate was 80%, and the pregnancy rate per cycle was 26.6%. So, if there is clomiphene resistance, what is to be done? You can extend the clomiphene, add HCG, adding uh, uh, add <coughs> dexamethasone. Adding bromocryptin if uh, uh, prolactin is increased and the pretreatment suppression with the ossicles can be tried. Then the various insulin sensitizing agents can be tried, gonadotrophin can be started and the other protocols can be started. <coughs> Sorry. About the tamoxifen, there is no significant benefit of tamoxifen over clomiphene citrate. It is only to be used whenever the endometrial thickness is very less, one can try the ovulation induction with the tamoxifen. About the letrozole, it is the first line of treatment in PCOD. Uh, patients. This letrozole will not act on the hypothalamus or pituitary. It will act on the receptor on the ovaries and it is basically aromatase inhibitor. And uh, it inhibits aromatase in the ovaries and peripheral tissues, reducing estrogen. So because of that, there is a positive feedback and FSH will be uh, secreted. This FSH will, produce, will, uh, will increase the, uh, will produce the follicles and um, uh, this follicle again will start producing the estrogen and negative feedback will be there. So this is the mode of action. It acts only on the receptors on the, um, uh, est uh, on the ovaries only, not on the hypothalamus. So anti-estrogenic effect will not be, is not there. So the doses. Casper et al. has uh, 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 seen in 2008 for induct. It is, uh, he has used it for the ovulation induction without anovulatory inf uh, with anovulatory infertility. 2.5 to 10 milligram of uh, letrozole uh, is used once daily for five days, and he has used it from day three to five uh, of uh, the menstrual cycle for three consecutive cycles or till occurrence of pregnancy. So the results are here, the ovulation rate has increased to 86.9% as compared to 61.5% in clomiphene cited. And the, see the pregnancy rate has been also increased. That is 28.9% as opposed to this 17.9%. Uh, uh, and the pre, uh, uh, this uh, it is said that uh, the CC group has more abortion rate than the uh, this uh, uh, letrozole group. So there are another protocols that is the extended protocol. Sometimes there is a letrozole resistant is also there. So in that case, you can increase the dose of uh, 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 letrozole or extend the. Uh, 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 extended days. That is the uh, 2.5 mg uh, letrozole daily starting from the first day of the cycle and it is to be given for 10 days. This results in continuous production of FSH, maintains FSH level above the uh, threshold and it increases the FSH window. This will increase the uh, more increase in the number of follicles and the pregnancy rate will be more means uh, here they it results in the multiple follicular development, uh, three uh, follicles or more can be uh, there. If there are uh, uh, follicles are more than 18 millimeter or 18 to 20 millimeter, one can give trigger. So 
it has expected a higher pregnancy rate 17.4 percent than the clomiphene uh, resistant cases and the second one is five milligram daily fixed dose protocol for the super ovulation and iui five milligram letrozole daily from the day three to seven of the menstrual cycle has been started and uh, they have seen the pregnancy rate was higher as compared to 2.5 milligram uh, they have compared it with the 2.5 milligram lectose only and they have seen that 5 milligram dose will increase the pregnancy success rate and the addition and they have seen that addition of lectosol to the gonadotrophins for superovulation decreases the gonadotrophin dose increases the number of pre ovulatory follicles and results in the pregnancy similar to gonadotrophins so we'll see that protocol again so that this is my uh, uh, favorite protocol that is the uh, step up protocol so here um, we have to give uh, increase uh, increase the letrozole dose by 2.5 mg so first day 2.5 mg go on increasing by 2.5 that is second day 5 mg third 7.5 and uh, fourth day 10 mg tablet can be given and this will result in the uh, uh, in the monofollicular or multifollicular uh, development will be there and um, uh, with the mean of 2.2 and a higher pregnancy rate were observed in cases of uh, resistant uh, cc or uh, letrozol group about the gonadotrophins you, you all know the you can use urinary gonadotrophin as uh, or uh, recombinant uh, gonadotrophin it will not make the difference but the gonadotrophins is the second line of agent and uh, it is used in the resistant cases of clomiphen citrate or letrozole or if it is in responsive to clomiphen citrate unexplained infertility mild and minimal endometriosis one can use and iui cycles Gonadotrophins, uh, here the drawbacks are, uh, it is costly, cold chain is uh, required, and there is no, uh, uh, you should not give trigger if there are more than four follicles. And uh, if you are giving the trigger, tell the patient or counsel the patient for the IVF. UAG monitoring is must and uh, always watch for OHSs. How much dose is to be used? This is a very good normogram. You can use this. this there, is, there are anterior follicles and the weight. Suppose the anterior follicles are uh, 15 and the weight is uh, around 65, then one can use the 75 international unit of uh, gonadotrophin. So this is the uh, dose um, dosage normogram for ovulatory IUI patients. So the gonadotrophin protocols, there are uh, same dose protocol. That is, one can start with the 75, 100 or 150, depending upon the BMI and the age of the patient and the number of follicles. So, uh, and the second one is the step up protocol. We can start, one can start with the 75, go on increasing by 25, that is 100, 150, that you can increase. And that's another one is the step down protocol. You, what you have seen, uh, you are seeing that though the pregnancy rate has been in, uh, is increasing in the step up or step down protocol, the multiple gestations uh, and the OHSS is increasing in that case. So there is another one that is the chronic step. The step up protocol. It is used in the PCOS patient wherein very low dose, that is 37.5 to 75 international unit per day, is to be given uh, ideally for 10, seven days. And then afterwards, then you have to see whether the follicle has been increased or not. And then accordingly, you can increase the dose, maximum dose, week, uh, increase the dose weekly till the follicle size is 14 millimeter. And then you can continue the same dose till maximum doses on two to five international unit till the follicle is 14 millim 18 millimeter and then trigger that uh, uh, follicle and you will be getting monofollicular growth with a 30% clinical pregnancy rate. But this is the best protocol for the PCOS, but it requires patients sometimes 28 to 35 days of uh, injections will be there. 
So this is about a chronic stepper protocol. Uh, that is, uh, though there are uh, pure gonadotropin protocols are there, but uh, uh, according uh, uh, because of the cost and the same success rate, one can add clomiphene citrate or retrozole. It is said that the letrozole with gonadotropin will give more uh, results than the clomiphene citrate. There are two more protocol regimes. That is the sequential regime. One has to start the clomiphene citrate or letrozole between third to seventh, and then add uh, on the seventh day FSH, seventh, eight, ninth day, or till the follicle becomes 18 millimeter, and then give the trigger. And second one is the um, conjunctional regime, wherein you can overlap the clomiphene citrate and start the um, gonadotropins that is you can start with the third uh, third to seven day or second to sixth day cl clomiphene citrate and you can add fsh on the fifth day of the uh, periods and go on uh, giving the fsh till the follicle becomes 18 18 to 20 millimeter there is another protocol that is the single dose gonadotropin it is it can be given on the seventh or eighth or ninth day and uh, start with the clomiphene citrate first and then give only one injection of hmg 150 on the eighth or ninth day and do the sonography and then you will be seeing that uh, uh, the follicle will increase and uh, it will go uh, after it becomes 18 millimeter then one can give trigger so where, where uh, is it, uh, is there any role of clomiphene citrate in this era or only letrozole is useful? It is not like that. Letrozole is the first line of treatment in PCOS, but in normal responders, it is the clomiphene citrate, which is the first line of treatment, as well as in the uh, endometriosis, it is the clomiphene citrate with gonadotropin is the best line of treatment. Thirdly, in unexplained infertility, one can use the clomiphene citrate, which is the first line of treatment. So here you can see the, in unexplained infertility, clomiphene citrate is more effective than letrozole for achieving pregnancy. About the metformin with uh, clomiphene citrate and letrozole, metro, metformin is to be added in the incremental doses, that is 500 in the first week, then in, in the second week, uh, you add 500 milligram. And in the third week, you can add again 500. Means 500, 1000, and 1500 in the third week, you can add. There is one uh, good protocol that is the ultra short metformin pre treatment for clomiphene citrate resistant post PCOD patient protocol is there, wherein they have given the clomiphene citrate 150 milligram daily for five days along with the metformin. And that is also only for five days they have given. And uh, you will be seeing that 42% uh, ovulated. And in the, uh, in the metformin group, 42.5% uh, ovulated. But in the control group, only 125 So one can try this protocol also. About the antagonist in IUI, it is said that 24% PCOS patients have premature relapses. So whether we should use antagonist or not. So Cetrolex can be added 0.25 given when the follicle is uh, between 14 millimeter. Uh, this can be added, but meta-analysis says that there is no significant role in the IUI, but it reduces the pregnancy losses. That is the abortion rate it reduces. And one can use for the use it for the timing of IUI. Say suppose the IUI is on the sun, on Sunday, and if andrologist or embryologist is not there, then in in that case you can give cetrolytic to the uh, patient and uh, call her on the uh, next day or Saturday, and then give the trigger so that the IUI will fall on uh, Monday. So the take home message is proper planning and patience is needed for ovulation induction. PCOS is difficult not to crack, might be some, sometimes persistent, sometimes no follicle, you, you, will not, you will not be seeing the follicle is growing, but or sometimes luteinized and ruptured follicle might be there. Trigger in time and adequate luteal support to be given so that the successful pregnancy will be there. Yes, 
it is the uh, ovulation induction is the art one has to um, develop that thank you very much uh, solapur obgy society and uh, dr anjali jamma madam and uh, monica for giving me opportunity thank you uh, dr milin and dr uh, uh, nitu for uh, chairing this session uh, thank you very much, Nalini. It was really a wonderful, comprehensive talk because ovulation induction itself is a, such a huge topic. Can you know speak for 24 hours and still it is inadequate? But you you were very very uh, good in your presentation to show us all those uh, uh, the uh, tips and tricks in the induction protocol. Uh, any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I think everyone is now quite tired with the academic phase since morning. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you, SOBG, uh, on behalf of me and Dr. Neetu for giving us, giving us this opportunity to chair this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, please accept the e-trophy from Solapur OBGY Society. Thank you very much. Thank you. I request Dr. Anjali Jamma, ma'am, please felicitate our chairpersons. Thank <laughs> you.